This portion of today's hearing runs six hours. Rules Committee will come to order. Uh, let me at the uh, outset announce that the uh, chair would like to uh, call a um, meeting after consulting with the uh, ranking uh, Democrat member uh, that the committee will suspend this hearing at 2 p.m. for an emergency meeting of the to grant a rule on the conference report on H.R. 831, permanently extending the health insurance deductibility for the self-employed. And I note that Mr. Archer and Mr. Gibbons are both here, and we appreciate your fast work on that, uh, that bill. So we'll give you a rule on it as fast as we can this afternoon. Uh, the Rules Committee uh, is meeting today to consider a total of seven different bills before the committee uh, from five different committees. The bills are H.R. 1215, Contract with America Tax Relief Act, H.R. 1134, the Medicare Presidential Budget <coughs> Savings Extension Act. H.R. 1217, the Medicare Part B and C Administration Budget Savings Extension Act. H.R. 1216, the U.S. Enrichment Corporation a Privatization Act. H.R. 1218, the Competitive Bidding and Granting Licenses and Permits. H.R. Uh, 1219, the Discretionary Spending Reduction and Control Act and H.R. 1185, the Federal Retirement Reform Act. Yesterday, the chairman of the committees on budget, on ways and means, and commerce introduced a new bill which packages all these separate components into one comprehensive piece of uh, legislation. The new bill is H.R. 1327. Uh, it is the Tax Fairness and Deficit Reduction Act, and we'll refer to that uh, from here on out. Before beginning this hearing on one of the most important parts of this contract with America, I have a brief opening statement after which I'd be uh, pleased to yield to uh, Mr. Moakley if he arrives, if not to any other member of the minority, uh, for any statement they might care to make. Let me just say that in trying to implement earlier parts of the contract with America, we have been criticized for making changes which the opposition likes to call mean-spirited or lacking in compassion, and uh, I uh, take great exception to that, personally. Uh, but what is really mean-spirited is to keep piling more and more debt on the children of this nation of ours. And likewise, there is no compassion in taxing families to support a bloated bureaucracy. And the more money we take out of their pockets, the more apt we are to spend that money. If the liberals want to make themselves feel good by giving away large amounts of the taxpayers' money, then they should have had the courage to figure out a way to pay the bill during the years when they control this place. It is true that in the last Congress, when both the legislative and executive branches of the government were controlled by the Democrats, they did implement the largest tax increase in American history, but they still plan to continue adding $200 billion a year to the debt, as we see in the President's budget. Where is that uh, chart? We've destroyed it, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd just like to vividly describe it, because it, uh, it is such a serious matter. But um, if, you, uh, if you take a look at this chart, in other words, this was the President's uh, uh, budget last year, his five-year projections. And of course, as we've said time and again, these are the deficits that it projects over the five years, ranging from 165 billion up to 191 billion, and accumulating 894 billion dollars in debt. That was his budget last year. This year, he has given us a new budget, and just take a look at the deficits for each of the five years, for the next five years, and it uh, accumulates an additional 996 billion dollars in accumulated debt. And of course, what that means is that uh, today uh, we're paying a, a large slice of the, of the pie and revenues coming into this government is going out to pay the interest on the accumulated debt just thus far of four and a half trillion dollars. And if we don't do something about it, it means that we're going to uh, add another trillion dollars and that $250 billion in debt service that we now have to pay is going to widen that slice of the pie to 360 billion or, or larger. So uh, 
I think it's important to keep that in mind as we as we debate this bill that's going on the floor uh, tomorrow, uh, or I should say next uh, week from Wednesday. Uh, my point in saying this is that yet when we Republicans uh, try to slow the rate of increases in the growth of the federal government spending, uh, those that criticize us try to make it sound as if we lack compassion. And that's the part that I really, really take exception with. I would say to you, what is compassionate about being big spenders now and then leaving these kind of debts to our children and our grandchildren? I mean, we are going to live to regret this if we allow this to happen. So even if this package before us today is fully implemented, the federal government will still be spending more each year than the year before. Let's take a look at that chart. They'll be spending more every single year than they spent the year before. The rate of increase in spending will just not be as rapid. And a large group of us um, uh, that belong to a task force uh, called the Balanced Budget Task Force, many of them uh, on the committee here, are going to do everything in our power to, uh, to try to see that, those, uh, that the growth in spending is reduced even further. There is also a tax reduction component to this bill. And the largest single item in it is a $500 child tax credit for families with children. Under the existing tax code, what we do now is penalizing our kids whose parents work, but through our welfare system, subsidize those whose parents don't work. And in my opinion, we are encouraging the wrong kind of behavior. And that's really, I think, what this, uh, what this bill gets to. Another way in which our current tax code encourages the wrong kind of behavior is by a tax penalty on marriage. We say that we want stable two-parent families, and yet we penalize those who do the right thing. And that's wrong. This bill includes a reduction in the marriage tax penalty. Then we recognize that there is a problem in this country because too few people save and invest for the future. And it's very difficult to save and invest for the future when the government is taking so much money out of your pockets. Yet we have a tax code which penalizes savings and investment, but gives a tax break for borrowing. Now just think about that. We penalize tax spend uh, savings, and yet we, we give a tax break to borrowing. If we want more savings and investment, then we should stop penalizing people who do the right thing. The capital gains tax cut provision in this bill deals directly with that problem. People who save and invest their savings to produce jobs for others would not be penalized so much for their efforts. And that's what this bill does. I could go on, but the bottom line is that the package reduces the deficit and promotes tax fairness. I personally have a problem with the effective date of these, uh, of these tax cuts. Um, but um, hopefully, uh, in the next three months, uh, this Congress is going to have the guts to bite the bullet and to make those spending cuts that are going to truly reduce that deficit and allow us uh, these tax cuts that we're proposing here today. So having said all that, I uh, thank the uh, committee for bearing with me. And I see Mr. Moakley, the ranking member, has arrived. And uh, if uh, Joe, if you have an opening statement, we'd be glad to entertain it at this time. <clears throat> thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members. <clears throat> uh, Speaker Gingrich uh, calls us the bill the crown jewel of the contract. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing the crown jewels because I don't think the other crown jewels that I've seen can pass the test once you bring them to the jury. So I think that uh, your creative excuses as to why you take the food out of the mouths of children and the money from the poor uh, to pay for tax cuts uh, for your privileged friends Looks to me like you're giving the crown jewels to those very privileged friends and all you're giving to the average American is a lump of coal. Uh, let me show you graphically who gets the lump of coal in the Republican tax bill. According to CBO, 35% of Americans' children... We can put it over here. I hope it doesn't affect you, David. <laughs> Okay. According to CBO, 35% of Americans' children would not qualify for child tax credit. As the chart shows, 34% lose out because they earn too little. Only 1% are denied because their families earn more than the $200,000 cap. So I just want you to see that uh, and uh, because there are many ways of explaining the uh, 
the tax bill. And in fact, I even saw an explanation of how you've been <laughs> determining the rules. And I've been telling you you've been wrong all along. Now it's in the now it's in the editorial column of the roll call. Did you believe that? They said if Mr. Solomon were counting the rules and Mr. Moakley, it'd probably be a dead heat now. But you were supposed to improve upon my action, Jerry. Continue, and I'll have a little rebuttal in a minute. All right. <laughs> so uh, I'm looking forward to uh, go on with this. Would you say it's going to take three months now to get this tax bill through? No, the spending cuts. Oh, the spending cuts. How long is it going to get the term limit to go through? Well, I hope we're going to do it uh, this afternoon. I'm all for it. How about you? I'll tell you what. I've campaigned against it, but I'll vote right now to make it retroactive, if you will. <laughs> go right ahead. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Is the gentleman through? Well, I don't know what else I can say. Sure. But, Joe, you know, I tried to, in my opening remarks, not to have any, any sarcasm or... Uh, yeah, you know, but you're in charge. Rhetoric. I know, but... <laughs> but uh, <laughs> So I have to be more responsible, is That's that it? That's right. That's exactly. Cool. And being more responsible brings me to this chart, and I would like to uh, uh, have this for the without objection for the record. But, Joe, you know, we've heard this same kind of rhetoric, and it does get a little sarcastic at times, and uh, that's too bad. But uh, when push comes to shove, and when we have been gagged for so many years, uh, we've taken this contract for America to the floor after listening to this kind of rhetoric and then listening to the same kind of rhetoric on the floor, but then look what happens. We have strong bipartisan support for every one of these issues. Now let me just point to this. The balanced budget amendment. 72 Democrats crossed party lines and voted with us. That's a large amount, number. That's bipartisan. The uh, line item veto. 71 Democrats crossed party lines and voted with us. Unfunded mandates reform. How many do you think crossed party lines? 168 Democrats voted with all of us Republicans. The product liability, something that we have fought for for the last 20 years and could never have a vote on the floor. What do you think happened after all the rhetoric and criticism of that bill? 45 Democrats voted with us. The Regulatory Reform and Relief Act, something we have fought for as we've watched the, uh, uh, the, the, the regulations grow and proliferate. And what do you think happened? 186 Democrats crossed party lines, and it was almost unanimous after listening to all this rhetoric of how bad that regulatory reform bill was. And I could go on, uh, prison construction, death penalty, but that's bipartisan What's support. What prison construction? 59 Democrats voted with, with the Republicans, and the death penalty, 71 Democrats. Those were good Democrats who crossed party lines. So I just wanted to point out that we can have well, rhetoric. You're a good Democrat that crossed party lines a long time ago. I sure was, and uh, I'm very proud that Ronald Reagan and I saw the light when we did. And uh, wasn't he a great president? Now we're, we've got the, the second coming of the Reagan Revolution. Let's get on with the hearing and bring uh, two of the most respected members of this body to the, uh, to the table. The uh, well, let me have them come up and then you can speak. The chairman of the, uh, the Ways and Means Committee, Mr. Archer, who is doing an outstanding job, along with um, Mr. Gibbons, why don't you come on up and uh, uh, we'll have a bipartisan presentation here. It may differ a little bit, but uh, while we're doing that, I think Mr. Frost was trying to be recognized. Yes. Mr. Frost of Texas. Thank you. You indicated that uh, you would recognize uh, other members for yes, some brief opening is, remarks. Right. I, I just had a couple of questions. Um, I've got a letter, a uh, text of a letter, to, uh, to you, signed by 102 members, including yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very interesting letter. Um, that's and what you call a reminder. That's right. And, it, uh, <laughs> and, and the letter from Solomon to Solomon. Uh, <laughs> that's called the wisdom of Solomon. If you talks will. about uh, making, uh, making a change in the uh, $500 per year tax credit. Uh, specifically, the, uh, asking that the rule providing for consideration should make in order a floor amendment to lower the caps on family income uh, for the child credit from 200000 to 95000 As I said, this is signed by you to yourself, mm -hmm. along with a number of other members. And I just wonder, uh, uh, have you convinced yourself? Uh, are we going to have the opportunity? <laughs> is the House going to have the opportunity to vote on this amendment that you've asked uh, yourself as chairman to make in order? 
Well, I would say to my, my good friend, Mr. Frost, that uh, uh, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, I have some, uh, some reservations about the, uh, the magnitude of the tax uh, cuts that are, uh, and the effective date that they might go through, and I have some concerns about this as well. We're going to take that into consideration. As the gentleman knows, uh, when he and the Democrats were, uh, were in power, uh, they always closed down uh, ways and means measures that went to the tax floor, went to the floor. And uh, we Republicans supported that because it's a very, very uh, important issue when you start fooling around with, just yeah. with the tax code. And um, I would hope that if, um, if we don't make a specific amendment in order that it might be included in perhaps um, uh, in, an alternative substitute, which might be offered by uh, the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. I don't know yet. We haven't made that determination. That's why we want to hear the testimony from these two gentlemen, as well as about 50 other members on both sides of the aisle. The, the gentleman may recall, of course, this was before the gentleman was a member of the Rules Committee, that, uh, that I, as one Democratic member, engaged in a protracted struggle with the then chairman of the Ways and Means Committee on this very issue and advocated not closing the rule down uh, on an issue involving uh, industrial development bonds. And uh, it was a very interesting discussion. Mm -hmm. But uh, I seem as, to recall as that. one member, I have not been for closing uh, ways in, uh, the rule down on tax legislation. The other, only other question I wanted to ask you is that uh, you and I had a co colloquy uh, when, uh, a week or two ago when the welfare uh, bill was up. And uh, at that time, dealt with the question of uh, uh, taking the savings and applying them to the deficit rather than applying them to uh, to finance a tax cut. And you indicated s sympathy for that. Uh, and um, I just wonder, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to offer an amendment on that very subject, on uh, taking the uh, uh, using, uh, waiting until the budget is balanced uh, before we have a big tax cut. And I know that there's a bipartisan amendment, a variation of that, uh, offered by Mr. Castle and Mr. Browder, which will also be offered. And I, I would hope that uh, one of those amendments would be made in order, Mr. Chairman, so that the House could express its view on the issue of balancing the budget and of using savings from, that we have uh, voted for uh, for that purpose, for reducing the deficit before we uh, uh, apply them to uh, financing a tax cut. Well, I'll just say the gentleman's points are, are well taken. But, uh, you know, the truth is that unless the Congress has the guts to vote to cut spending, it doesn't really matter whether the money, you know, where it's going. You can say it's going to reduce the deficit, but if you if you apply that money to reduce the deficit here, and you allow the caps to stay up over here, uh, you're going to increase the deficit, even though this money went to lower the deficit. So it's um, it doesn't really solve what we want. The real key is is to, will the members have the guts to vote for those spending cuts, and that's what this fight's going to be about over the next three well, months. Mr. Chairman, of course, the House did vote for very substantial cuts last week, and a lot of us wanted that uh, on the welfare reform bill, and a lot of us wanted that money dedicated to reducing the deficit. And there will be, as I said, there's a member on your side, Mr. Castle, uh, mm -hmm. along with a member on our side, Mr. Browder, who will offer an amendment on that exact point, and I would hope that we would permit the House to vote on that. Very good. Any, uh, any further statements from any of the members? If not, uh, gentlemen, thank you for being so patient. And uh, Mr. Archer, uh, again, commend you for just an outstanding job that you've been doing as chairman of that committee. It's one of the most difficult jobs in the Congress. Feel free to uh, summarize uh, without objection your entire statement. Right, we'll well, always appear the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for your comments that you made preliminarily. And if I may also, before I speak to the rule of this bill, uh, state that the statistics that you mentioned on the issues that have come up under the contract with America uh, not only represent a change in direction substantively that the American people, I believe, have been wanting for a long time, but they also represent something else that the American people want to see out of this body, and that is bipartisanship, right. where people can cross over the party lines and do what's right for the country. And, and, and I'm proud that under your leadership and others that uh, we've been able to bring more of that about than we have seen in the House of Representatives, uh, perhaps in the entire time that I've been here. So I, I think that's a great accomplishment. Um, Mr. Chairman, I, I'm pleased to have the opportunity to come and appear before you on the rule for H.R. 1215, the Tax Fairness and Deficit Reduction Act. And 
Uh, you've briefly alluded to it. Uh, the chairman of the Budget Committee on March of 28th introduced H.R. 1327, which consolidates the tax reductions in H.R. 1215 with offset, offsetting spending reductions in keeping with our commitment to pay fully for any tax cuts. Uh, specifically, H.R. 1327 contains provisions from uh, the tax bill out of our committee, H.R. 1215, and H.R. 1134 out of our committee, the Medicare Presidential Budget Savings Ex Extension Act. It's previously, um, both of these bills have been reported out of our committee. It also contains offsetting spending reductions which include provisions from other committees, which is uh, sort of a new thing for us in the way that we handle the interleaving of the spending reductions uh, and the tax reductions. I've said repeatedly since the day after the election that I would not support any tax cuts that were not fully offset by spending reductions. And this bill will do that. In fact, it more than meets that promise and actually brings about significant overall deficit reduction, uh, which much more so than the President's proposals. And if I might say so, the chart that you showed is very interesting to me, too, that uh, the TV camera did not turn around and focus on your chart, but it did turn around and focus on Mr. Mokley's chart. Um, well, that um, was because mine and, is much smaller. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it had fewer lines on it. Mr. Chairman, if, if you would yield, oh, there is a TV but, camera behind your but, back, which um, I believe. Mr. Archer, and I will check that out. But, and, uh, but, it, but, but in, in, in any Archer, event, he checks all the TV. I, I, I believe the numbers on your chart were the OMB numbers and not the CBO numbers. It, it, and the right. official numbers that the president said we should always rely on are the CBO numbers because they're the ones that are the most accurate, and they show those deficits going up much. much more dramatically than were shown on your chart, which were the OMB numbers. So the increase in the debt based on CBO projections is far more than a trillion dollars over the next five years, which will generate a burden on future generations of interest of perhaps up to $100 billion a year of extra interest charges that, that will have to be paid. In contrast, this bill, with its deficit reduction, will reduce that number. And I think we should be proud of that. Uh, I'm sure Congressman Kasich will talk about that uh, to a greater degree. But when we stood on the steps of the Capitol last year and signed our contract with America, uh, we pledged that if we were elected as a majority party, we would bring long overdue tax relief to working people in this country and to their families concentrated on middle-income Americans. And under this tax bill, 75% uh, of the tax relief goes to middle-income Americans. Uh, this tax bill reported by the Ways and Means Committee meets that pledge by doing two things. It brings tax relief aimed at helping strengthen families and lift some of the economic burden on the rearing of children for taxpaying families. In addition, out of the entire tax bill, 76 percent goes to families, including all of the many facets of, of tax relief. And 24 percent goes to businesses and job creation, the engine that pulls the train of cars that enables American <coughs> workers to have an opportunity for better paying jobs. It promises tax relief that will help where it is needed for most, to our families so that they can grow at home, and to our businesses so they can help families be successful building better homes based on better jobs. Mr. Chairman, with respect to the Medicare provisions, which have been called by some in the media as, as Medicare, Republican Medicare cuts, they actually are lifted directly from the President's uh, budget recommendations. And they are merely extensions of current law. They are not new cuts of Medicare. In fact, uh, the Department of HHS has stated officially, and I quote, and this is President Clinton's administration, these are not new Medicare cuts. Rather, these are policies that are currently part of the Medicare program, unquote. 
Mr. Chairman, for consideration of H.R. 1215 on the floor, I would respectfully request that you provide a closed rule for the ways and means provisions of the bill, which makes the text of H.R. 1230 of, of I'm sorry, of H.R. 1327 the base text for the purpose of amendment, provides for two hours of debate on the ways and means provisions to be equally divided. Now, it's only on the ways and means provisions that we believe you should give two hours of debate provides whatever additional debate time the committee deems appropriate for the remainder of the bill and makes in order one substitute to be offered by the minority leader or his designee and one motion to recommit with or without instructions. I further request that all Budget Act points of order be waived with respect to the Ways and Means portion of the bill. And there are a couple of very technical uh, Budget Act waivers that need to be granted. Uh, thank you again for letting me come and uh, make my pitch to you this morning. Well, Bill, we thank you very much. Before I get to Sam, let me just uh, uh, say that um, should we make in order a, um, a uh, substitute uh, by the minority leader, Mr. Gephardt, uh, we would waive the same points of order that we would be waiving for you so that it would be a fair, uh, fair substitute. Mr. Gibbons. Well, you know, I come without a prepared statement. And it's all right. As the uh, debate you, went you on, you can speak here, as extemporaneously as, as anybody I know. You're as the debate went on here, I got to thinking back. Uh, in 1965, I came here and spent a whole day uh, before the Rules Committee uh, all by myself with Judge Smith. Uh, and so I got to know him real well. Uh, and then the next year, in 1966, I came here and spent a whole week with this committee with Judge Smith and the other members uh, going over some legislation. <clears throat> and I remember the little uh, rhubarb that arose when you tried to hang Judge Smith's picture in here. Uh, uh, it just recalled a lot of interesting things to me. And sometimes when you and I got some time, I'll tell you about them. But we don't need to bore all the rest of the people about it here now. Uh, I'd love but to Judge, that, Judge Smith had one thing about him that really marked him and probably made him your hero. He did what he, in his own opinion, consciously thought was right. And, you know, we can all argue about his service here. And, I, and, and, and you know, I'm sorry that the Rules Committee doesn't have that kind of independence anymore. I'm sorry that it, it is so leadership driven now that the Rules Committee can't really do what's right. Because if you were going to do what's right about this bill, you'd send it back to committee. And say, when you all get it straightened out, bring it out here. Now there are times to cut taxes and there are times not to cut taxes. And the Democrats on the rule of the Ways and Means Committee came to the conclusion that this was not a time to cut taxes. Why? We're at full employment in the United States. We're at full factory capacity utilization in the United States. We've got a slightly unstable dollar because the people that uh, work in that area don't believe we have enough guts to bring the budget deficit down now and that we're going to do the wrong thing and this tax cut is the wrong thing at this time and further drive up the budget deficit here in the United States and further have to depend upon foreign capital to support our borrowing habits and so they're betting against us so with full employment with full factory utilization Alan Greenspan and every economist in the United States will tell you don't cut taxes now, cut the deficit. And that's what you believe, Jerry Solomon. I listen to you closely. And you're right. We don't want to put the burden of this extra borrowing that will be required because of this tax cut on the shoulders, the backs of our children. You're right. That's cruel. I, I, I brought some charts along with me, and I saw some of you pawing through them up there. And, and let me kind of go through them with you, if you don't mind. Without objection, Sam, uh, you can submit it for the yeah, record. Yeah, you've got them. You've got them on, in front of you there. Uh, some of you are looking at them. I want to show you what's happened to America. 
over the last 20 years, the <clears throat> show you what's happened to America. Over the last 20 years, the <clears throat> middle income, family income was stagnant. Look what happened to it. On the left, you'll see that the lowest quintile of people, the lowest fifth of the people, lost in family income 14 and 6 tenths percent of their family income. The next lost 6 percent. The middle income about stood still, and the upper income people have done real well. Now, that's not all because of taxes, but a large part of it is because of taxes, but a large part of it is because of the budget deficit. The budget deficit increases the interest rates. The interest rates are now twice as high as they normally should be in the United States. And the people at the lower income who use borrowed money to buy their house, to buy their car, to pay for the kids' college education, and really sometimes to even pay for current <coughs> expenses, <laughs> they've lost ground. They're mad. I don't blame them for being mad. Next, you're, you're going to say, uh, oh, taxes are too high in the United States. Turn the next page, if you will, please, and this bar graph that we got here. This shows you the actual tax that every class of Americans pay, the lowest fifth, the second lowest fifth, the middle fifth, and the upper fifth. And it shows you that over from 1977 to 1994. <coughs> Democratic administration, Republican administration, all of that. You'll notice one thing from this group of charts, that the, the taxes, burdens of American people are relatively the same over those long period of time. That $4 trillion deficit that we built up occurred around 1985 because we dropped the tax rates just a little during the Reagan administration. Not a whole lot, but enough to create $4 trillion worth of additional deficit when, 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 when we followed all the rest of it. And uh, so, and then there's a, there's a long table there, you don't need to go into it now, that shows who is in what quintile. And then I prepared a little table chart for you here that's a little more complicated than yours, Mr. Chairman. It, I'm sorry yours is just in single color, but mm -hmm. I, I, I didn't buy a copying machine for the Ways and Means Committee that copied in colors before I got relieved of that responsibility. And <clears throat> I didn't have a color copy machine. This shows you, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, that with this tax cut, you've got to pick up $370 billion dollars more of <coughs> budget reduction than you would normally have to pick out without this tax cut. $370 billion by the year 2002. This tax cut will make this Congress have to pick up, in addition to the $1 trillion, $200 billion worth of spending cuts that the contract calls for, an additional $370 billion. It's going to be tough to do. I put this next chart in here for you all because I thought it was real good, and I think I got it in color. Have you all got it in color? Here you go. No. I'm sorry. It's black and white. white. I'm sorry. We, we, maybe Bill will buy us a new copying machine over there. Anyway. I don't have any money. Maybe you can borrow it, Sam. All right. Well, we'll, we'll try. We'll see if somebody can, won't lend us one. Uh, can you find foreign aid in there? Look at it real hard. Can you find foreign aid in it? Foreign aid is in that little thing called other there, that 1%. So after you cut off all the foreign aid, you've, <laughs> you haven't really done anything as far as reducing the deficit. At this point in this hearing, we lost our audio signal. We now pick up the hearing seven minutes later when the audio returned. I think if uh, many of the people that are viewing this, uh, this meeting here today uh, might disagree with you because you, you like to say that those people over $200,000 or with a million dollar income, they would take advantage of a capital gains tax cut, and you're, you're right. But there are a lot of people watching this, uh, this meeting right now, and that will read about it, and they have incomes of $30,000, 
60000 and those people are saying to themselves, well, you know, it helps me too. It helps me too. And those are the kind of people that really do need the help. And I don't know how many people I have gone to. Uh, I like to say I go to a hockey game every Saturday night or every Friday night in my little hometown where there's 6,000 people. And between the periods, you know, there are two periods in between the three, uh, two uh, rest periods in between. And I get up and I walk around and how many people I talk to every weekend that uh, say, Jerry, well, when are you going to do with this capital gains tax cut? You know, we've, we've held our property all these years. We paid those taxes on it. And Sam, these aren't people with 200,000. I don't have 50 people in my 600,000 congressional district who make 200,000 or more. I don't even have 50. Well, well, the gentleman, you're right wait a minute. Let point. me finish because I'm the chairman. I'm the chairman I, I, of the no, committee. I don't want to interrupt you. I want uh, you to know. I don't want to be interrupted. To exact I'll yield making. back to you in a minute, Sam. Okay. But, but my point is that, uh, you know, we don't need to get into this business of, uh, you know, of who gets help. Uh, we want to do what's right for the country. And I could go on and talk about you know, the, the real need to, to cut this budget and how we're going to do it, because you showed this, this pie here, and it's, uh, that's very informative. But how do you do it? How do, how do you really make those cuts that are going to be so difficult over the next three months? You know, you've got to eliminate programs. You've got to do it like the Interstate Commerce Commission, which is, I think you agree, is a wasteful program. You've got to privatize government agencies like the Federal Aviation Administration. Uh, you've got to uh, defund over 300 of these 410 entitlement programs. And I was shocked when I started accumulating these and reading down. You were one of them. You, uh, you helped me see those. Uh, but it was unbelievable. It, what is an entitlement program today? And then you've really got to start restructuring this government, like abolishing the Department of Education, uh, the Department of Energy, the Department of Housing, all of these things we're going to have to do. And it's going to be interesting to see who's got the guts to make those cuts that are going to be necessary. Now, uh, let me, let me, I, I'd be glad to uh, yield to you. I, I just want to respond to the capital gains thing. Sure. Let me say, first of all, there are times for tax cuts and there are times not to. And my yeah. principal argument that this is the wrong time because of the economic situation in the United States. Let's go back to your capital gains argument. Uh, you, you see, I've got this one in yellow and you all got it in black and white up there, but uh, these, these, who gets the benefit of capital gains tax cuts? And you're talking about those low income people. And I went back and researched what kind of capital gains tax cuts do they normally get? Most of these people are people who sold their home. You know, you, you sell it once or maybe twice in a lifetime and you get a little capital gains cut. That's right. Uh, that's fine. I, in 1977, I put the Gibbons Amendment in the tax code and it's still there. It says, you know, I, I put it, it was much more generous when I put it in, but the Senate chopped it down to where it is now. It says if, if you get to be 55, and you've lived in your house for at least four years, you can sell your house and you take the first $125,000 worth of gain, not, not of the sale, but of the gain, and you just put it in your pocket and you wave it, Uncle Sam. It's your money. You don't pay any taxes on it. It's not even, you don't even have to report it. And it's your money. That ought to, that ought to be indexed. It should have been indexed long ago, but I've never been able to do, get it done. And so I've been trying to help those people down here who get these little tax, capital gains tax cuts since 1977. But, you know, we've been stuck there. We ought to, we, frankly, I think Bill and I will get together someday when we get all this over, and we'll take care of that cap, these, these capital gains people down here and give them, a, you know, you only get it once in a lifetime under the, the legislation we have. It. We ought to do something. That ought to be liberalized. Well, Sam, you know, that's, uh, it's interesting, that chart that you, uh, that, that you showed there, because uh, when, when, you, when you analyze that, you know, if you only gave the capital gains tax cut to just those few people, mm -hmm. it wouldn't do anything to really stimulate jobs. Uh, for instance, I've got a, uh, a company named Mallincroft Medical, and they just packed up and they're going to Mexico. Mm -hmm. And here we've got about 400 people out of work. And, you know, we need something that's going to generate jobs for those people. So if you only help these people on the lower end here, it doesn't really get to it. 
But if you give those that are more wealthy, if you give them that same capital gains tax cut, that's going to create investment, that's going to create jobs, and let me tell you, those people then have a chance for a job. That's what this is all about. That's Mr. Archer's philosophy. I thought I'd just repeat it. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. You know, there is, there is need for a capital gains tax cut in the tax system. I, I don't argue with that. Right. I think we could. I think we could we could construct one that works more fairly than than the one that is in this bill. But you know, do you remember what the Dow Jones Industrial Average was in 1986 when we, in effect, did away with capital gains? I remember when it was as low as 1040. <laughs> well, in 19. 86, when we, in effect, did away with capital gains, the Dow Jones Industrial Average was about a little over 1,000. What is it today? 2,200. No, it was 41. No, no, it wasn't. It was, it 4150 was, is where it is today, sir. Yeah, 4150 today, it was around, was between 1,000 and 1,500 uh, in 86. Yes, it was. I wrote it down and remember it very clearly. Despite the fact that we really haven't had any capital gains tax breaks for, for all these years, the Dow Jones has increased, what, threefold? Can you have them bring them into threefold the in, in nine back. years? Let me know when they're there. Okay. There is no evidence oh. that capital gains does much to the economy, but it does a lot the way we've got it crafted here in this legislation to the unfairness of the tax system. That's my argument. I don't argue that there's not any need for capital gains because I think assets that are held for a long time, we unfairly tax them now. Uh, the trouble is trying to, uh, trying to uh, uh, index those things is, is we, we really haven't figured out a way to do it that's just not a, night, a bookkeeping nightmare. All the, all the CPAs at his hearing came in and said, don't don't try to index capital gains. We'll never get it figured. We will employ a hell of a lot of CPAs, but we'll never figure it out. Uh, it's, it's very complicated to index that. So the simple thing to do is to do the thing like I did in, in the homeowner thing. Just, you know, make a rough decision and, and, and say, you know, if you've owned your home and you've lived in it and you, and you get ready to sell it, you, you take so much money, put it in your pocket and wave at the government. That's the way to do Mr. it. Mr. Uh, Gibbons, I feel guilty that you and I have hogged all this time. I feel with our guilty about it too. I want to yield to Mr. Archer yeah, and then go on to the next witness. You know, I, I intended just to speak about the rule, but obviously we've gotten into a lot more than that here. And, and there's take, some things that feel I free to uh, need elaborate. to be addressed. Uh, I listen to Sam Gibbons and, and Turn, put the mic over by you, please. When I when I listen to Sam Gibbons and and uh, many of his colleagues on his side of the aisle, what I hear them saying is if uh, the Democrats have their way and they can find somebody who's got enough money to create a job, they want to take it away from him. Uh, a person should never have the accumulation of funds to create jobs like a Ross Perot and many others. Um, Let's take it away from them. Uh, we want to we want to be fair, and we want to see that they don't get to keep any of this capital that creates jobs. And what we should be looking for is the protection of savings wherever they are. And the economists that have appeared before our committee, both liberal, moderates, and conservatives, have said that the shortfall in the U.S. Uh, and Sam knows this is in savings, not in consumption. Uh, we are not developing enough savings. And when you tax capital gains, you're taxing savings that have already been placed there at a sacrifice, having paid the income tax and left to appreciate, to create jobs. And every time there's a transaction that relates to that capital asset, Sam wants to step in with that giant federal vacuum cleaner and suck up those capital savings and spend them through the Treasury on consumption. And what, and what is the result of this, Mr. Chairman? The result is that the Japanese and the British and the Dutch are coming in and owning businesses in this country. Uh, I had a constituent of mine several years ago who had one of the finest ideas for an efficient electric motor. Let's have a little quiet in the back there. We could take your seats, please. That would save energy by one-third. And he was convinced that it would work.
He went all over the country. There was not enough capital savings, and particularly where people are going to take the risk long term and then have to pay a large capital gains tax uh, of domestic savings. So what happened? Toshiba came in. They put the money in. Today, that factory in my district has the largest inventory of electric motors in the United States of America, owned by the Japanese, because Sam doesn't want somebody to be able to retain enough money in the U.S. to provide those jobs with domestic ownership. And uh, I think that's very sad. Even Paul Zongas, uh, a, a very strong Democrat, when he ran for the presidency, he said, you cannot help employees by taking away from employers that the engine that pulls the train must continue to be fueled. And that's what we want to do here. We want Americans to own businesses to create better jobs for other Americans. And the only way we can do that is to retain the nucleus of capital savings to the greatest degree <coughs> possible and create incentives for additional savings. Uh, and it, I, I'd say one final thing. These statistics can be used in many different ways. It's interesting to me that he says that the rich are the ones who really benefit, and yet the burden table issued by the Joint Committee on Taxation shows that the actual taxes that will be paid under this tax bill will increase for those that he calls the wealthy. The tax burden will increase. They will pay a bigger percentage of the revenues that come to, to uh, fund the federal government. Uh, some, something's wrong in these statistics. But these burden tables have been issued specifically and precisely by the Joint Committee, unlike the chart that was submitted by the minority leader, Mr. Gebhardt, which distorts all of the information to his own advantage and then labels it source Joint Committee on Taxation. Um, one last thing. The statistics that he refers to show people as being rich when they have built a small business from nothing. I know because my father lost his job in 1932 and didn't have the money to even pay groceries. But he was able to borrow some money and built his own business. And he worked very, very hard. And he was successful. Many people like that exist in the United States today. But what Sam wants to do is call them rich if they have that one-time life sale of the business that they built over 40 or 50 years and that is a capital gain one time in their life, and that thrusts them up into a category above $200,000 for that one year. It doesn't average it out over the years where that appreciation was occurring. It says the one year you sold it, you were rich. You sacrificed all the rest of your life, and you were not rich. But by golly, we call you rich in our charts. So we've got to be very careful when we look at these uh, charts and these statistics, but mainly we want to provide jobs for Americans, better paying jobs to compete with those like the Japanese and the Germans and the others who have virtually a zero capital gains tax because they understand the need for savings. Mr. Uh, George, I wish that every member of Congress could uh, hear exactly what you have just said. You just uh, articulated it so well. And, uh, Mr. Quillen, the Tennessee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think we're arguing the bill here in the Rules Committee, but I agree with you, Mr. Archer, wholeheartedly. And Sam, you know that engine on the track has been fueled with federal dollar, creating that massive national debt that you talked about and created the uh, deficit that we now have. It wasn't President Reagan. It's the system and the belief of the party that was thrown out of power last November the 8th. And we must correct that track and we must fuel the engine with ingenuity and ability to go forward in America as the uh, father of Bill Archer did. And as I did growing up, nothing ever handed to me. It was brought about by sweat of, of the brow. But we shouldn't penalize those people. I've never voted for a tax increase, to my knowledge, in the 33 years that I've been here. And I feel that the engine can be fueled 
with tax incentives and tax reduction give an opportunity for more jobs, which bring about, brings about more income to the federal government. The federal government is far too big. I remember in 62 when I was elected, the federal government didn't do all the things for the people that we do now. And I think what this bill offers is a tax cut with an incentive to go forward in America to greater heights. I don't argue with you, Sam. I know you believe in what you say, but that belief is going far too far to federal control. I feel that anything that we can do to stimulate the desire of Americans to uh, uh, grow on their own, without federal help, we should do it. And this bill is a giant step forward, and I support it. And I'm not being critical to anybody. I commend both of you. You're dedicated Americans, dedicated members of the uh, Ways and Means Committee. Both of you have good ideas. I just don't happen to follow your philosophy because I've seen your philosophy put us into the bind that we're in today. And I hope that we can grant a rule on this bill, bring it to the floor next week whenever it's up, and then pass it. I hope the Senate goes along. Jimmy. I'm not going to speak long, uh, Mr. Chairman. I feel strongly about the remarks I've made. Uh, I don't criticize anyone for their belief. Mr. Uh, Bielinson. Could, could I? Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. Uh, Mr. Mr. Gibbons. You and I are tied for being the two most senior members other than Mr. Dingle in this Congress, and so I have a great respect oh, for you and love for you, Jim. I, I don't care. I, I don't My don't argument care. against this bill is principally that it's the wrong time. We shouldn't be cutting taxes now. We should be cutting the deficit now. I believe in cutting the deficit. You, all of you believe in cutting the deficit. Now is the time to cut the deficit. We have maximum employment now. We have, we're, we're up to capacity in the utilization of, of our productive plant in America. And we ought, this is a time when the Congress all together, Democrats and Republicans, should be cutting the deficit. There has never been a better time in our lifetimes to do it than now. There are times for tax cuts. Now, my friend Bill uh, took a little liberty with my position a while ago. He knows, because he and I have talked about it, as soon as this rhubarb's over on, around here on this side, we're going to sit down friend to friend and man to man and talk about the taxes for the American future. I have written about, and I would be glad to provide any of you with copies of my writing <coughs> on this, I advocate doing away with the personal income tax. I advocate doing away with the corporate income tax. I advocate doing away with all of the payroll taxes and substituting in lieu thereof a flat rate consumption tax that does not tax savings, doesn't tax savings, Bill. Doesn't tax capital gains either. Doesn't tax capital gains, no, it doesn't How tax soon savings. can we get that bill up here to the Rules Committee? <laughs> well, uh, I've been ready for years, but I really needed an ally, and I'm hoping that Bill can you join got, me. You've got, you've got I've one. got that all, i got it all figured out, folks. And, and I hope that I'll be here, and you all will be here, and we can start talking about it seriously. And I, if you want to read, uh, I've even got the tax form in there. It's so simple. You can put the tax form on a piece of paper this size. Uh, and it's a flat tax. It's a, you know, we reduce the number of tax collectors. You know, we got 130 million tax collectors. You're a tax collector. You're a tax All of you are tax collectors in this country. We can there are 130 million of us that do that. We can reduce that down to 10 million people who will file tax returns. And the rest of us won't need to file any tax return. It's so simple. It's so easy to do. And it will work. 
I apologize. Can we have a vote on that right now, Mr. Yeah. <laughs> All those in favor, say aye. aye. Hey, Mr. Chair Chairman, let me add one thing that I meant to mention earlier. I would be very careful in your rule about changing the effective date for capital gains because it will disrupt the market transactions. And we know from previous experience that we have to be exceedingly careful about that. Uh, no one knows for sure what we will ultimately do on capital gains. But whatever we do, we should assure the investing public that it will be retroactive to the 1st of January this year. Otherwise, people will hold off selling their assets and it will be very disruptive in the marketplace. What, what is the provision, uh, Bill, in the, uh, in the bill as in far the as the In the contract with America, the effective to... date is January the 1st, 1995. Right. And we have been assuring the marketplace that whatever we do will be effective January the 1st, 1995. Very good. Mr. Balenson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be brief because we have been going on for an hour and a quarter already. Um, let me just, uh, I'm, I feel constrained to say one thing, if I may. We're all, all entitled to express our opinions about things, but I do not think that we're entitled uh, to put words in the mouth of someone else. And I, I myself was, was st strongly disturbed, as I can only assume my friend Mr. Gibbons was, at having his, his beliefs characterized in a totally, I believe, inappropriate way by a couple of other people who have been speaking here today. I just, I do not think that's fair. I think you can argue your own point of view, but I do not think you can say, Sam believes this, Sam believes that, when it was perfectly clear to me and I think to others around that uh, our friend Mr. Gibbons did not believe what those two particular people were saying about his, uh, his beliefs. I also want to say something else, and I don't want to re-argue all this, but we keep getting these arguments and I don't want to, I'm not going to let them go. Uh, one of our friends, one of our colleagues on the committee said, and I quote him, that it was your philosophy that put us into the bind we're in today, talking about the sizable deficits. Uh, we can argue about whether or not we were wise to do certain things or not in the past 15 years or so. But there are a great many of us on this side of the aisle who voted against the large tax cuts of 1981, who voted against doubling the size of defense spending in the early 1980s. As I said, you can argue whether or not that was a wise thing or not a wise thing to do. But it is clear that those two particular actions were, were, were what were largely responsible for the large accumulation of debt in the last dozen years or so. And uh, it is simply incorrect and unfair to characterize those of us on the other side of the aisle from the, from the current majority as being responsible for having created that situation. Nobody's blaming Mr. Reagan, but the Congress and the presidents together over the past dozen, 15 years or so uh, have been responsible for that accumulation of debt. Some of us, in my opinion, were not responsible or shared much less responsibility than others because we did not vote to cut the taxes. We did not vote to increase the spending in some of those areas that led to that accumulation of debt. The, the, the only thing I want to comment on, Mr. Chairman, is, is something which I know is of concern to many of our, of our colleagues on, on the other side of the aisle, and that is our concern about, about cutting taxes at, the, at, at this particular time. It just makes, I think Mr. Gibbons was correct, and please correct me if I'm miscorrect, mischaracterizing what you were saying, Sam, but we do have an opportunity here, which uh, I give all the credit in the world to our Republican colleagues for seizing on because you're serious about it in a, in a way that many of us, I think, or many of our colleagues have not been in, in recent years to, to cut the deficit. And obviously, we make that job that much more difficult by cutting taxes by a couple of hundred billion dollars more or less in the next five years or so, an additional $500 billion or so in the next five years after that. Uh, obviously, we're going to have to cut spending by an additional $700 billion more or less over a 10-year period than if we were not cutting taxes. And it is the hope of many of us on both sides of the aisle that we somehow slow down this tax cut engine or this train <coughs> so that we can get, we can concentrate on the huge amount of work that needs to be done, absent even cutting taxes, to, to bring our deficits under control in the, in the foreseeable future. And I hope, as, a, as my friend Mr. Frost said, an hour or so ago, Mr. Chairman, that we were, were able to do that in the context of this bill, that there are some amendments perhaps that will be made in order so that those of us Republicans and Democrats alike who believe so strongly that we've got to cut deficits, but that going in this direction of cutting taxes at the same time is going to make, it, make cutting the deficits that much more difficult, have an opportunity to express that, that point of view. And I thank you very much. Mr. Dreyer of California, another California. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me congratulate both of you for your fine work. Over the next five years, 
uh, federal spending will total somewhere around $8 trillion. And while Sam argues that now is not the time to have a tax cut, it seems to me that if we look at this $189 billion figure uh, that is out there, and I happen to believe that the capital gains tax rate reduction is going to go a long way towards increasing revenues to the federal treasury, but looking at that $189 billion figure, it seems to me that we need to realize that we're talking about a total of 2% of that, which is going to be able to stay in the pockets of working Americans. And while many people say we shouldn't do it now, I think that they have the right to keep some of their own money as they look towards uh, the next five years and the kinds of, of uh, changes that we're going to make in the whole direction that the government is going to take. Sam, when you talk about the issue of uh, maximum employment, I've got to say that out in my state of California, we still are suffering because of defense and aerospace cuts. Yes. It's been very, very difficult there. And I happen to think that the capital gains tax rate reduction is one of the most important things that we can do towards expanding plant and uh, encouraging investment there. And I'd like to pose one question to both of you, which I actually raised with Bill earlier this morning when we were talking. And that is the issue of the research and development tax credit, which if we're going to realize that we're in a global economy today and, going to, and we're going to remain on the cutting edge uh, uh, to compete internationally, uh, it seems to me that we need to do everything that we possibly can to continue to further encourage research and development. And that's why I hope very much that as you all sit down and talk about elimination of the capital gains tax, elimination of the personal income tax, and a wide range of other things that we can look at a way in which we can encourage research and development. And uh, I, I think that that's one of the things that, that I would like to, uh, to see and is very important, not only for my state, but I believe for the competitive nature of, uh, of our country as we deal with a global economy. Do you all have any thoughts as to where we would stand on the prospect of making permanent the research and development tax credit? Well, I, I personally would hope that we could extend it beyond just a temporary uh, year or two. As to permanence, uh, I'm not so sure that we shouldn't sunset an awful lot of provisions in the uh -huh. tax code so we can look at them at least every five years. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Because conditions change, times change, and uh, we should be able to be in that sort of a position. But I would hope that whatever we do would be like a five-year uh -huh. extension. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to have to raise the money to offset right. that so that we don't increase the deficit. Uh, but we will be looking at the expiring provisions this year, mm -hmm. uh, and um, hopefully we will definitely do something on the research and development or research and exploration mm -hmm. uh, credit, depending on how you want to characterize it. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have any argument with Bill on research and development tax credits and things of that sort. But let me tell you what I think is the principal impediment that people in our country are carrying, and it is the current tax system. We have to compete in an international environment, and our tax system is very unfair and is penalizing the dickens out of us right now. It is acting to export our jobs from the United States and to subsidize the imports into this country that re de de displace our jobs. Let me give you an illustration. First, I ought to give you a little background. In 1947, the United States kind of forced on the rest of the world the General Agreement on Tariff and Trade. Mm -hmm. We said in the General Agreement on Tariff and Trade under the rules that you couldn't adjust a income tax at the border but you could adjust a sales tax or a consumption tax at uh -huh. the border. Everybody else has swung their tax system away from an income tax and toward a consumption tax. Uh -huh. Let me take these two glasses. If you manufactured this glass in the United States and tried to sell it overseas, when you sold it overseas, it would carry with it the full cost of the United States government. Uh -huh. All of the payroll taxes, all of the income taxes that we pay would be in this glass. But if you manufactured this same glass in a foreign country and sent it into the United States, 
when it got to their border, they'd cut out the cost of this glass that was there. <laughs> How can you compete when, a, when, when what you import in the United States it comes without any cost of government in it, and you've got to compete with exports that go out that carry the full cost of government? Uh -huh. Now, we impose that rule on the world. But we don't have the unilateral power now to change that rule so that we can adjust our income tax. One of the things, one of the reasons I am advocating a abolishment of the income tax is not just because it's costing us about $400 billion a year just to enforce the stupid thing, but it is penalizing us. It's taking our jobs and sending them overseas. It's taking all of our job opportunities and saying, our biggest export are our, our jobs. And we're doing it because we stupidly stick to this income tax. We ought to go to a consumption tax. We ought to go to a flat tax. We ought to get rid of all of the payroll taxes in the United States and, and substitute a consumption tax. Then we could adjust it at the border. Then the jobs would begin to stay here. And this huge imbalance of trade that we duck at every month uh, would go away. <coughs> we can't do it, ladies and gentlemen, with, with the income tax system. I don't want to fix this thing anymore. I want to abolish it. I don't want to tax savings. I don't want to tax jobs out of the United States. Please don't accuse me of that. But, uh, you know, if you'd like to read more about it, I've got it all written out. Uh, Congressman Dreyer, let, let, me, uh, let me say one thing as a caveat. Uh, there are now a number of people who are writing articles and speaking of such things as the R&D tax credit as corporate welfare. Mm -hmm. And we must carry the message to the American people uh, that this is giving us the opportunity to develop new technology, to solve problems, mm -hmm. to create more jobs, and to create a better way of life for all Americans. And competitively uh, internationally, too. Exactly. Mm -hmm. but, but, but we've got to understand that there will be those out right. there who will say, well, here's an example of corporate welfare, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is now getting to be a term that's thrown around, I think, entirely too mm -hmm. loosely. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, let, me, let me say that uh, obviously I, I concur and, uh, and enjoyed working very closely with both of you last year on the Uruguay Round of the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, and I hope that that will go away towards uh, helping on that. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I, I, I'm sorry, Mr. but I'm going to have to leave if that's uh, with your indulgence and permission. Could I ask a brief question? Well, uh, if you could wait just for Mr. Frost and then by all means, unless there's objection from the other members. Uh, Mr. Frost. Mr. Chairman, I'll be very brief. Um, do you support the request made by 112 of your the Republican colleagues uh, to make an order, an amendment to lower the cap down to 95% $95,000 on the family tax? Mr. Frost, I, I support the bill that came out of our committee. Uh, it, it, it's a bill that um, implements a contract with America, which is what we promised to do in the election cycle last year, uh, and, and I support it. So you do in not addition, think we should make an order? In addition, uh, I know that you've said that you would be pleased to make amendments to tax bills. Uh, I respectfully disagree with that and believe that as tradition and the pattern that's been true in the past, uh, it should be repeated, and that is that this come out under a closed roof. So you think we should reject the request of the 112 members of your conference to make this amendment in order? I, I think I'm, I made my position clear. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Archer, uh, you're excused, uh, and thank you so much for coming. Uh, we really appreciate it. Sam, uh, one of your colleagues from Florida had a question for you, but uh, if you'd like to go ahead, Bill, you're okay. welcome to. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Porter, good to see you. Thank you. And not only a question, but I wanted to make some uh, applause, both hands, uh, uh, on the subject of the uh, tax system in this country. I served on the Kerry Commission, and anybody who has spent any time looking into it has to come to the type of conclusion that you have. And I hope we can uh, get on with that shortly. The 100 days is about over, and perhaps that's exactly the kind of thing well, we... Bill and I got a date to talk about it and work on it uh, when we get this behind us. Well, I, I suspect you'll get a lot of attention and should. Uh, it's something that needs it. One of the things that I, I did want to ask, uh, it's going to be an unusual question because it has to do with the rule. Sure. Uh, but since this is the <laughs> Rules Committee, I thought maybe we'd talk about that. There have been a number of suggestions, uh, There is, uh, and uh, what the... Uh, minority substitute might be. There is the President's uh, package, there is Gebhardt 1, there is, I'm told, Gebhardt 2. Uh, 
Uh, do you have any any uh, any package for us that uh, you su suspect you'd like to offer in this testimony? Is, is, the ranking Democrat on the Ways and Means Committee, <laughs> I think speaking for the Ways and Means Democrats, we do not have a substitute. Okay. We believe that this is just the wrong time to do this. And that's, that's our primary objective and our primary message. I do understand that uh, Mr. Gephardt will appear before you this afternoon. He yes, I has a, a, a proposed substitute that he is sponsoring, uh, but we Democrats have no position on a, on a substitute. Thank you. I, I just uh, I, I wanted to get the opportunity well, before. You. And the, the other point, I, very simply, I, I think you speak from the heart and very, very well on this. And I, I would be the first to say that this is a big package and it has an awful lot of bits and pieces in it. Perhaps some are better than others. But certainly from where I come from, where you come from too, I think we've got a lot of senior citizens who are looking for a little relief on the earnings tax limitation and uh, earnings test limitation. And I think that's a, a positive step. I think, frankly think rolling back to Social Security super tax is a positive step. So I, I think that there, there may be some bits we can talk about, but I also think there's some definite benefits in here uh, that are clearly good. And as for whether this is the time to cut taxes or not, I know that I have probably, like most Americans, uh, once a year I think it's a good time to cut taxes, <laughs> and that's usually about now, right, between now and April 15th. Uh, and, and I think out there if there's a way we can do it, we should do it, but I agree we want to be careful how we do it. And I appreciate your comments, sir. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman and uh, Mr. Uh, Paul. Mr. Chairman, I, I'd like to uh, ask Mr. Givens a, a question that shouldn't take too long. I, I appreciate uh, your charge and your history. It was, it was uh, exciting to listen to you because I think you took something, uh, not being on the tax committee, trying to understand this very complicated bill, you, you took something and you were able to explain it in uh, fairly easy terms for all of us. And uh, I want to thank you for your history. You're a great, as far as I'm concerned, you're a great example of why we should not uh, vote for term limits because your history and your concern and your knowledge of tax law is, is tremendous. You used a lot of charts, and uh, here's a chart that, that, that we have right here, which says that uh, has to do with the children's tax credit. And that, it, as I read the contract with America, and I'm sorry Mr. Archer's not here, but it's, and maybe some of the other members as they come up can address this issue, that in the contract with America, and maybe I didn't read it and study it very well, but the whole f part of the tax cut, as far as I was concerned, was sold on the fact that it was a children's tax credit. And it is true in, in the first couple years, 62% of the tax cut goes for the children's tax cut. But as you go to the year 2005, as you showed that, uh, there's the chart right there, that, mm -hmm. that only 24% in the long run really only goes for the children's tax credit and all the rest goes for uh, the reduction in corporation taxes, uh, uh, wealthier people in the country, and it's an amazing chart. Uh, I guess my question is, is that, and I wish Mr. Archer was here, but Mr. Hyde was quoted recently as saying that when he, he went on a letter with these 102 other congressmen, Republican congressmen, he said he wanted something that defangs Democrats' charges that we are the party of the rich, yet the Republican letter talks about reducing the $500 for child tax credit, not the corporate business tax breaks, which make up over a third of the tax costs. But when you look at this chart, in fact, it's just the other way around. And uh, is there any kind of an amendment that you know that is going to be offered here to try to reduce this fact and really get at, if, if we're really talking about the contract in America, as I read it, it had to do with the children's tax credit, but really this is more of a corporation tax credit than anything. Well, you've presented an interesting chart there, and I hadn't really thought about it from that point of view. Uh, principally, my motivation of opposing what we're doing here is, is because it is the wrong time in the economic cycle to be cutting taxes. We ought to be cutting the deficit. That will do more people more good and will do the American economy more good over a long period of time. Than, than just than these tax cuts. 
when Mr. Archer originally introduced his bill that came really from the contract, the children's tax credit applied to all children living in families uh, where the family income was less than $200,000. Somewhere out of my sight and hearing, they changed that bill. They knocked off all of the low-income kids they, uh, and families from low income. So I said in my statement here that uh, if your family earns uh, $25,000 or less, you don't get any children's tax credit. But if your family earns anywhere from about 25000 to uh, 200000 you you get the tax credit. That saved them $13 billion, and they took the $13 billion and distributed it to the upper income people. I regret to make that charge, but it's correct. I don't know why in the heck they did it. They never told us why they did it. Uh, it, it doesn't make sense. It, doesn't, it got no justice to it at all. And that's a good chart. Yeah, they start off real quick. They chill, the child tax credit is a large part of it, but as you go on down, if you got out to the year uh, 2000, what it, what it, whatever it is, 10 years from now, 2005, yes, that's the one you've got there. That children's tax credit is just a minor part of this bill, just a minor part. It's all it's eaten up by... Uh, depreciation changes that are made and tax, capital gains, tax cuts, and by the dream account. That's, that's where the money goes. I appreciate your statement. Thank you, Mr. Gibbons. I uh, shouldn't get, uh, get further involved in this, but, you know, when I hear some of, the, some of these statements, you know, like uh, you're helping the corporations, I just, you know, I always have to reflect back on my district. And I've got so many corporations in my district, there are thousands of them. And you know what? Most of the owners of those corporations have incomes of under $50,000. And we talk about we're, we're helping these wealthy corporations. It gets under my skin. I didn't say but, that. Uh, no, I know, but some, every time I hear this rhetoric, you know, we're helping business and companies. <laughs> yeah, you know, small business creates 75,000, 75% uh, of all the new jobs in America every year. And we're concerned about helping them. Let me. Uh, any further questions of the uh, of the witness, Mr. Linder? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to make over here, sir. a point that Sam, that the, the high for the market in 1986 was 1955 dollars and 57 cents. In, in 86. Yeah. 86. Yeah, um, but when we when we passed the when we, when we abolished capital gains, it was around less than 1500. Uh, it never got below 1500 in 1986. That was a low for the year, 1502-29. But let me make a point about capital gains in general. In 1977, when Jimmy Carter signed the capital gains tax preference bill, there were $50 million in venture capital pools in America. In 1986, when you change the capital gains law, there was $5 billion in venture capital pools. And those increases in risks capital capital that American citizens were willing to put out fueled the jobs that created 19 million net new jobs during the next decade and expanded the economy from two and a half trillion to five trillion and doubled the revenues to the Treasury, 19 million new taxpayers. That was during a time when all major corporations were downsizing. So the question on capital gains isn't who gets helped. The question on capital gains is to build venture capital pools, get risk capital put into jobs and create jobs for the average working man. The average working man gets a job, pays taxes, and raises a family. Um, I think it's Phil Graham who says, I've had a lot of jobs in my life, but I've never been hired by a poor person. Rich people, fortunately, invest their money, and invested money creates jobs. Uh, I think this is the most important thing we have to do in this contract. I think it's still too high, because, because the lack of the lack of capital formation in this country is, in my judgment, the principal economic sin of our time. I, I don't have a real argument with you. You know, uh, I, I want to go even further than you do. I don't want to tax capital. I don't want to tax savings. 
And the quicker we can get to that, the happier I'll be, and I think the better off America will be. I just think that considering the full employment that we have now, considering the maximum utilization of our, our facilities, this is the wrong time to cut taxes. This is the right time to cut the budget. That's, that's my principal argument. Well, an argument can also be made by that tax cuts increase revenues. Between 1984 and 1995, countries in Latin America dramatically reduced their marginal tax rates and dramatically increased their revenues. The states in this country, like California and New York, that chose to deal with deficits by increasing taxes got higher deficits. A state like Massachusetts that reduced taxes, reduced spending, balanced their budgets. It is arguable that increasing taxes reduces revenues and reducing taxes increases revenues. In 1990, the tax increase on the top 1% of America, $157 billion tax increase signed by President Bush, actually reduced the revenues from the top 1% of America by $6 billion in the following year. Because rich people are very often smart people, and they change the way they earn their income. Uh, lowering taxes has in the past increased the size of the economy and increased the revenues to the Treasury. And between 1977, after the capital gains tax was cut, revenues from the capital gains category increased in every succeeding year until 1987, the year after the 86 tax increase on capital gains, when tax revenues declined dramatically from the capital gains category. So the argument that we are reducing taxes can also be an argument that we're growing the economy, creating jobs, and perhaps increasing revenues. I, I bought that argument in 1981. Mm -hmm. I think if you check the record, I voted for the Reagan tax cut. It, uh, it didn't work. Uh, we won't go into all of that. It, it, Sam, it doubled the revenues. Revenues to the Treasury in 1980 were 516 billion. Revenues to the Treasury in 1990 were 1 trillion 30 billion. It doubled revenues. I don't know how doubling revenues adds to the deficit, unless, unless you don't restrain spending and you spend that and more. And that's precisely what happened. I think Ronald Reagan should have vetoed every budget that he saw that spent more than the previous year. But he didn't, unfortunately. And this Congress had an appetite for spending. But telling me that doubling the revenues to the Treasury creates deficits is simply not mathematically precise. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, Mr. Gibbons. I'll be very brief. We have so many members waiting to testify. But uh, I just want to comment on uh, the nature of the debate, as we've heard it so far uh, today. And we're really not here to debate the issues, but we're here to consider the bill. But I think any kind of dramatic about face, uh, the likes of which we're seeing here, after years and years of uh, going in one direction, is never easy. And you've made so many fine points, and I appreciate uh, hearing this dialogue. Uh, but, but I have one question for you. Um, we heard Mr. Or Chairman Archer indicate that he is in favor of a, a strictly closed rule on this issue. Uh, I wonder if, if you feel the same, and if you supported uh, your chairman last time around when um, he came asking for closed rules on, on, on tax initiatives. Um, I don't I not only support a closed rule, I would support you all sending this back to the Ways and Means Committee to tell us to keep it over there. We got it right. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's our job. Uh, no, I, I support Chairman Archer in a closed rule. Okay. Well, great. I appreciate that. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Walthall. Thank you. I, I'll be brief. I, I simply... Uh, I want to commend you for your statements on how we need to change the entire tax structure. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of agreement in this room that the current tax structure doesn't work, and I am looking forward, as you are, to having a discussion on how we fundamentally change it from the ground up. Uh, but I also think that we are in a situation now where we are having to tell the people in our country uh, either they are going to have to, to just live with the sins of this Congress right now because we're going to refuse to correct some inequities that currently exist because we don't feel that we can find the additional spending cuts to pay for it. And that's something that I disagree with. Uh, first, I want to say I agree completely with Mr. Linder's comments about capital gains. Uh, I think the, the mathematical record based on Treasury studies done by this administration are very clear that whenever we have reduced capital gains, the revenues to the Treasury have increased. It's just that Congress kept spending more than the increase. But I want to talk for just a moment about the individuals, because we haven't talked as much about them in this debate. We have seniors 
who, as a result of the last Clinton tax bill, are now penalized for working in a way that they were not if their incomes are now between $11,600 and $30,000 a year. That has increased the penalty on those seniors. We have families who have perhaps carried the burden more than any other group of taxpayers in our country because Congress did not keep the value of the dependent deduction equal with inflation, not even close to it. It would be three times what it is today if we had kept pace with inflation. And so now I think the question is, are we going to tell these people, these families, these seniors, that they have to continue to pay for the sins of this Congress because we don't have the courage to find enough spending cuts to not only balance the budget but correct these tax inequities before we expect them to sign on to this austerity program with us? And I think that the committee has, has risen to the challenge of finding those tax cuts. I won't support any tax cuts that aren't paid for with spending cuts, but I think this bill does that. I think we've met that, and I don't think it's fair to tell those seniors and those families that this Congress is going to make them live with this Congress's failings for at least five more years while we balance the budget. I think we owe them more than that. And, and I just wanted to make those comments. You made some good, good points there, Mr. Uh, if you go to this chart, and I'm sorry you've got it just in black and white, you'll see that this tax cut exacerbates the budget deficit by $370 billion. I fundamentally oppose this tax cut because it's just the wrong time in our American economy to do it. We ought to be reducing the deficit. There are times for tax cuts. Higher unemployment. Capacity idle in our, in our economy. Uh, a, a very stable and appreciating dollar. Uh, all of, when those things come into play, we ought to be cutting taxes. But not when you've got the kind of conditions that we've got now. A falling dollar, a uh, full employment, full capacity utilization. <laughs> there is not an economist that's, that will tell you that this is the time to cut taxes. We as America, you know, that's why I say, send it back. This is just the wrong time. And while you got it back there, you folks are always need to come in and work on it a little more. Uh, but, but, no, I, I, you know, what you say makes a lot of sense, but uh, this is just the wrong time. Well, I, I just admit, Mr. Chairman, in closing, that, that I think we also need to take considerations of fairness into account. And I think families and seniors have been treated unfairly under our current tax system. And I think with a little bit more application on the part of this Congress to find those spending cuts, we can correct some unfairness as we ask them to join with us in balancing the budget. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Speaking for the seniors, Mr. Quillian and I will appreciate uh, what you're doing there. <laughs> I think we're the only two in this room. There. I'm getting close, Sam. I'm right on the edge. You're a long way from that. <laughs> okay, thank you. I want to thank you very much for the extensive time you've given us this morning. I think this is indicative of the uh, amount of interest there is in this subject. For the benefit of members here, I want to finish with the witnesses from the Ways and Means Committee. It would be Mr. Bunning uh, and then Mr. Collins. Uh, those are the ones I know present. Then we'll go on to other committees as long as we don't have any other for testimony. Mr. Chairman, I promise not to take near Mr. the Bunning. time that the uh, prior two gentlemen took. I assure you that it, uh, I appreciate uh, my colleagues uh, being here. Uh, First of all, I appreciate the opportunity to come before this committee. I have tried to stay away from this committee. It's, well, I have been humiliated here before, and, and, I, and I don't, uh, I've tried this new rules committee, so we'll see what happens this time around. Uh, I want to make a pitch for a floor amendment to the contract with America, the tax bill particularly. As a member of the Ways and Means Committee, I know that traditional tax bills are considered under closed rules. But if the Rules Committee decides to make in order any amendments to this bill, I have one. I the $5,000 adoption tax credit provision in this bill. Under the legislation as now written, an individual can claim up to this amount in credit against their tax liability in any taxable year during which they incur expenses in trying to adopt a child. 
My amendment would allow the unused portion of that credit to be carried forward to future taxable years. Let me explain how it would work. Under the contract with America proposal, if a family spent a lot of money trying to adopt a child, at the end of the year only had $100 in tax liability, the family could only claim $100 in credit. Under my proposal, the family would be able to carry forward the unused $4,900 in credit and claim it against their tax liability in future taxable years. In the last couple of years, several of my children have adopted and my family has had some experience with the cost associated with adoption. Unfortunately, they can become pretty steep pretty fast. Mr. Chairman, the Contract with America aims to make it easier to adopt a child. But under the bill before this committee now, an individual can run up thousands of dollars in expenses of an, in a given year and if they don't have any tax liability, they don't get any benefits from this provision. There is nothing wrong with this, Mr. Chairman. It's how tax credit usually works. But if we want to put our money where our mouths are and really give people more incentive to adopt, we should give them the opportunity to recoup the dawning expenses they run up when trying to bring a child and to their family. Under my amendment, if a family had a, any leftover credit, they would have an opportunity to recoup some of this cost in the future. I am still waiting for the Joint Tax Committee to give me an official revenue estimate for my proposal, but I expect they will come later today or tomorrow. Informally, I've been told that this amendment will cost around $150 million over the five-year period. I will have a hard figure for you very soon. Mr. Chairman, I do not have a formal offset for this amendment, but under my amendment, I can't imagine we would not come out ahead in the long run. Families that want to adopt would have a lower, lot lower financial wall to climb, and kids would get out of foster care an awful lot faster. The number of children waiting to be adopted would drop and the decreased pressure on the adoption system would only produce savings on the back end. Most importantly, a lot of kids would be moved more quickly into loving homes. This would be the biggest difference of all. Mr. Chairman, again, I appreciate the opportunity to come here today. This is an amendment that would make a huge difference in the long run for the price of a small down payment now. I thank the committee for the consideration. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Mr. Bunning, thank you. You've uh, offered a very, uh, I think, compassionate and thoughtful and probably productive amendment at the same time. Um, one of the questions I need to ask is, have you run this by the parliamentarian? Does this need any type of protection? Uh, no, I have not run it by them. Thank you. And with regard to the CBO, you'll provide us those numbers. Uh, a joint tax gave me the previous uh, estimate, and we have. That's where the 150 of CB. came from. 150 came from joint tax. Thank you very much. Questions for Mr. Bunning, Mr. Linder, Judge Price. Oh, I do, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. Bunning. I think this is a, a very, very good amendment. As you know, I have a keen interest in adoption myself, um, and so I have a couple questions. First of all, um, was this offered in committee? Was this offered in committee? It was not. It was not. Okay. It, it, was, it came up on the discussion on the floor when we were discussing the rule. Well, I think it, it's an excellent Our, amendment. Um, is it capped off, or, or does this go on and on? I mean, does it, it is, go just into it the is next, uncapped, and it goes in into words, the next year, and it can accumulate. It can accumulate like any uh, any additional credit. In okay. other words, you can carry forward it till till it's expired, till you use it up. Till you use it up. Uh, and there's no 10,000, 20,000 limit on it anywhere uh, if 
uh, other expenses are that great. That's correct. Okay. In other words, if you adopt more than one, you're speaking about more than one child. Or or have uh, failures in adoption attempts and that type of thing. Does it have to Does it have to result it, in a, in an actual placement and adoption, or uh, can no, you? No, it, it does not have to. Okay. Because a lot of people spend more than five thousand dollars and don't succeed. That's correct. I'm personally aware of that. <laughs> Uh, well, I, I just think it, it's great. Um, there's nothing worse than the system that we have now, which uh, really uh, gives incentives for the foster care system, which is wonderful. But there's nothing better than a permanent home. I mean, the foster care system is just permanent impermanence. Uh, and these children are bounced around from one family to the next. And it's so sad to see them uh, never finding the home that they want. And this would go so far in helping that happen. And so. Um, you can expect some support here. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Mr. Bunning. Ms. Walholtz? Yes, Mr. Bunning, I, I just want to applaud you for the work that you've done on adoption. Uh, as an adopted child myself, I have a particular interest in these issues, and I appreciate what you've been doing. Uh, let me just ask you, what expenses would be eligible for the tax credit? All those that you incur in trying to adopt, all of, all of them. So if there were medical expenses for the birth, mother, legal expenses yes, for adoption, everything all those included. would be eligible. Well, I, I think this is a very important amendment, and you also have a sympathetic ear here as well. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks, John. Gentleman from Georgia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, my fellow Georgian. I want to take just a few minutes to, to speak to the Rules Committee in support of Chairman Archer's position on closed rule, and I was pleased to hear that uh, Mr. Gibbons also supports Mr. Archer's position on closed rule. I want to reflect back just a moment on the 1993 and the tax uh, increase in 1993. It was, there was a clear message coming to all of us from our districts at that time to cut spending first cut spending first. I mean, it rang like uh, bells from uh, the 3rd District of Georgia. However, the majority members of Congress, the majority numbers in Congress, by two votes, I believe it was, instead of cutting spending, decided to increase taxation by some $242 billion over a five-year period with the claim that those taxes were going to only be imposed on the top uh, one and a half, two percent of the wage earners in this country and on business. Uh, I don't think that was exactly correct. Families received uh, an increase in taxation from that same bill through the area of increased fuel tax. They also uh, felt uh, an increase in consumer goods based on transportation of uh, consumer goods due to the increased fuel tax. Our seniors experienced uh, increase in taxation as well as many businesses. But let's look at that uh, 93 tax increase as compared to this 95 proposal that uh, we have with the contract with America. The 93 tax was $242 billion increase in taxation. The 95 is $189 billion reduction in taxation, which is equivalent to about 80% of the 93 increase. In other words, we're not even carrying it back to the level playing field that was there in 1993. Now, the 95 uh, reduction pertains to families, in fact, uh, the figures show in the report from the uh, Ways and Means Committee that 74% of the funds will actually go to families with uh, less than $75,000 annual wages. 89% uh, will actually go to earnings of 100 families with earnings of uh, $100,000 and less. So a lot of this money is going back into families. Seniors are getting relief from it. We're encouraging savings with the IRA. And then we're also looking at capital gains and uh, the alternative minimum tax repeal. I uh, wish Mr. Dry was still here. I'd like to refer to the alternative minimum tax in his region of the country. He mentioned the aerospace industry out there. In 1993, I had the pleasure of touring the uh, engine plant of GE in Cincinnati and then going on out to Seattle to the Boeing plant. In each one of those stops, the CEOs of both of those companies 
uh, mentioned the alternative minimum tax and how it had actually affected their business through the cancellation of the aircraft by many of the airlines across the country. And one of the reasons that they had canceled those aircraft was not so much from the standpoint that the airline industry was having a terrible cash flow problem, but to purchase new aircraft also increased their tax liability due to the depreciation schedule and having to recoup that depreciation and figuring the alternative minimum tax. So any company who is going to increase their tax liability by increasing or by purchasing equipment is going to look very hard at purchasing equipment, and that's what a lot of the airline industry did, and it's a lot of what of other businesses who have heavy capital outlay also looked at. So I think uh, the alternative minimum tax is a very important portion of the contract with America. And uh, I look forward to his repeal because I think it's going to also create a lot of jobs, better paying jobs around this country. But let's take a look at the capital gains. There's a lot of talk about the capital gains and how it's only going to go to higher income people in this country. I'll never forget in 1992 when I was campaigning for the Congress, I stopped in a little town called Barnesville, Georgia. I stopped in a TV rental shop that wasn't as large as the whole display wasn't as large as this uh, room here. And as I walked in the door, the lady just kind of pounced on me, and she said, uh, I want to talk to you about uh, taxes. Uh, I said, okay, be glad to do that. And she said, you know, I've got this little piece of property out here at the edge of town that I could have sold three times, but I haven't sold it. And the reason I don't want to sell it is because I'll have to pay so much of the funds that I get for it in tax. She was referring to capital gains tax. Well, what actually happened when she didn't sell that piece of property? Nothing happened. She received no cash because she didn't sell it. She paid no gain. She had no gain. She paid no tax. Who else didn't receive any funds from the fact there was no tax paid? The state of Georgia and the U.S. government. If you put forth the incentives for people to transfer titles to properties, you will see an increase in revenues to this government. The very first day that I uh, had the opportunity to ask a question in the Ways and Means Committee was to uh, Mr. Gephardt. And he had referred to the fact that he would like to see a lower tax rate for all taxpayers in this country. I took that and I commented to this effect that all taxpayers meant all income levels, which he agreed. He would like to see a lower tax rate, lower taxation for all wage earners in this country. I also then asked him a question, the only question I really had an opportunity to ask, and I asked him about the alternative minimum tax. Would he be in favor of repealing the alternative minimum tax because it had cost a large number of assembly line jobs in this country due to the lack of purchasing of capital equipment? And his answer was yes. You know, it, there's a lot been said about this particular bill and about uh, the fact that we need to cut spending, we need to cut the deficit. But we're going to have an opportunity to do both. Not only are we going to reduce the taxation, but we're also doing what the people said do in 1993, and that's cut spending, and we're going to cut spending right along with this tax bill, farther really than what the tax bill itself will leave back into the pockets of the people. I just regret that we have a large number of members of Congress who are looking at portions of this tax bill and they're trying to divide people by class, people by income levels. They say those who have and those who have not, and they should all be treated differently. I disagree. I really regret that we ever put any type of figure as any type of cap within the bill. That only gave a target for some people to shoot at. They should have been opened in. All children in this country are of equal status. All families have to pertain and protect and provide for their families, and I think all do the same respect. I regret that we have members of Congress who want to divide people by their income and by the have and by have not situation. I also want to comment on the fact that there was a lot of good comments and a lot of talk about amendments here to, prior to, to my uh, opportunity to speak to you. There were a lot of good things that I uh, heard Mr. Gibbons say. And I hope that in other tax bills that we'll have coming for the Ways and Means later this year that he will bring some of those measures forward. But when it came down to the last day and the final vote in the committee for the markup, which was all done within a six-hour period, the only amendment that was offered was an amendment by the minority side to sunset the tax bill after five years. No amendment to change it whatsoever, no amendment to try to perfect it in any sort of way, only to sunset it in five years. 
Well, if when you agree with it for the first five years, that's the only amendment you'll offer is one to sunset. So I think that the, the rhetoric about that this is the wrong time, that we shouldn't be doing this, that we should be cutting spending and cutting instead of cutting taxes, is evident that it's just rhetoric by the fact that there was no amendment offered except to sunset after five years. And to me, that's a concurrence with the tax bill as it is by the full committee for five years. I appreciate the opportunity to be in with you. And uh, Mr. Frost, you mentioned too earlier about your chart and will there be any change in the status of those uh, children there. There will be a change for those who reach beyond the age of 18, but there will also be a change in families for those who come in and have children. But no, the I, fact I was, of the matter is I, I that the tax the credit gentleman. only applies to those who have an earning that is equal to a taxation or tax liability as a family. I didn't make reference to the chart. Perhaps one of the other people on this side did. I made reference to the letter. Uh, so well, it might have been Mr. Bielinson or Mr. Yeah. Hall. No, Mr. Hall, I'm sorry. Yeah. You're right. It was uh, not I do want to ask made, a question you, at the appropriate time. You mentioned the letter. I do yeah. not support the position of those on the letter. I would like to see a closed rule on this particular issue. And as we come back with other tax bills later in the year, those who have these great ideas, and they are a lot of good ideas, they'll have an opportunity to offer those in reconciliation and also an additional tax bill. Go ahead, Mark. Well, I, I would only ask, the reason I raised the letter was signed by 102 Republicans. And uh, uh, it was, it's a, a letter that originates in your conference. It does not originate on our side. And it seems to me kind of unusual that you'd have 102 members of the majority party ask that an amendment be made in order, and yet we wouldn't consider making that in order. It's a well, very I'm, peculiar I'm sure, situation. I'm sure that the committee will consider that. It's a request. It's an honorable request by those members. I just oppose that position. And I was pleased to hear Mr. Givens also make the comment that he supported Mr. Archer's position on the closed route. Any more uh, questions? Well, that was, uh, that's just it. It's just uh, I've been on this committee for a few years, and I don't recall a situation where you had that many members of the majority party come in and ask the majority members of their own committee to make something in order, and the majority members then said no. It's, it's a very strange situation. Well, I think that goes back to what I mentioned a while ago, and I didn't mention any type of party affiliation, but because, when, you know, when I walked down the street of the, uh, in 3rd District of Georgia, I can't tell who's on which side of the aisle. So I don't like to refer to sides of the aisle or to parties. But I think that's a situation where that we have, uh, and I mentioned earlier, a large number of members in, the con in this Congress who would like to divide people by incomes. Uh, some take some bait, some don't take some bait. I didn't take that bait. I don't support that position. In fact, I said, too, I wish we'd really never had put any type of cap in there because it only gave some people an opportunity to have a target to shoot at. It should be open-ended. All people have the responsibility of taking care of their children. All people pay taxation. And look, let's take the $200,000 annual income and look at the withholding that comes from that check based on the withholding schedule that you find from the IRS. They'll actually have withheld from that check. They have two children in their family, married, something like $51,800 annually deducted from that $200,000 annual salary. And they have two children. You're going to give them $1,000? That's less than 2% of their tax liability. But look at the same thing at the area of $30,000. You'll have the withheld from that uh, family with two children, approximately $2,000. You give them $1,000 credit, you're giving them a 50% credit toward their tax liability. You can play with figures all you want. There's an old saying, figures don't lie, but liars figure. I think the gentleman actually just made the point for the 102 folks uh, who want to provide this for people 95,000 and below. But let me ask one other question, sure. if I may. Um, Mr. Castle and Mr. Browder, uh, two respected members, one of your party and one of my party, uh, want the opportunity to offer an amendment uh, which would basically provide that uh, you have to apply savings to deficit reduction uh, first. Uh, are you, uh, do you support their amendment? It's over I, a period of time. I, uh, I think parties. I made it pretty em emphatic that I support the closed rule. Uh, there will be a uh, reduction in spending, and reduction in spending if you want to exceed the, the reduction in taxation, which is to, again, uh, deficit reduction. So you do not support their opportunity to offer the amendment, I, uh, I do. Targe I targeting this yeah. to deficit I reduction? I support a closed rule, and I believe if you define that out, you'll see that that says that I do not support the amendment. Well, it's a, it's a good amendment. Uh, I intend to, uh, to support it here in the committee and hope that uh, I have a chance to vote, it on, vote for it on the floor. Uh, both of these are very constructive members who have uh, played a, a, an important role in previous legislation. Uh, Mr. Castle played a very...
key role last year in some legislation that we were considering, and uh, I hope that uh, both these members have the opportunity to proceed. Well, I, I fully agree and respect each member, and I make my decision not on the degree of the person, but on the degree of the amendment that's being offered, and the fact that I think that this is a time we should be looking at a close rule on uh, a tax bill. I believe that's been the precedent set for years and years. No I thank the committee for their time. Gentlelady from Ohio, have any questions? Could I, uh, Mr. Chairman, Could I be recognized? <laughs> I just want to, uh, Mac, thank you. You are one of the, uh, the real stand-up members of this body. And uh, I didn't want to interrupt this Georgia connection here between the, uh, the acting chairman and you, but uh, pr appreciate you coming before us. Thank you, sir. Ms. Waltos? <laughs> thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. The next uh, scheduled witness is uh, the Honorable Fred Upton, and uh, I believe that he has a panel with us, with him, uh, uh, Mr. Orton, Mr. Browder, Mr. Martini, and uh, Mr. Castle. You may all take the. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. You Chairman. Excuse me, uh, Mr. Chairman. If I, I've neglected to do something to uh, ask that a uh, statement be submitted to the record at this point, if I may. Without objection, who's the statement is, uh, from? This statement by uh, Barbara Cadelli, member of the Ways and Means Committee, who cannot be here, but we would like to have her testimony inserted uh, at the at the uh, conclusion of the last witness. Without objection, and uh, it's a privilege to welcome all of you, distinguished members, to this uh, to this uh, table and. Uh, Feel free to summarize, and uh, your entire statements will all be uh, presented to, it for, uh, to the record without objection. Well, I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman, and I, I must say that one of the reasons why we're here early in the schedule is that I also represent today Mr. Bliley, the chairman of our committee, and I want to just pass very quickly on his comments that he asked me to, to run by you, and I will summarize those very briefly, and then I will recognize uh, the other members uh, in terms of our on-block amendment that we're trying to make in order. Uh, first of all, uh, the Chairman Bliley asked me to talk about H.R. Uh, 1216 as well as H.R. Uh, 1218. Both of these passed uh, by voice in the Commerce Committee. The third bill that he asked me to comment on is H.R. 1217. Mr. Chairman, enactment of each of these bills has been scored by the Congressional Budget Office as resulting in a net savings to the federal budget. And as such, they deserve our support. I respectfully request a rule that would al allow a fair and adequate debate on the issues raised by these legislative proposals with the time to be equally divided between the majority and the minority. And in order to expedite consideration of Medicare savings legislation in view of the action taken on H.R. 1217, the Commerce Committee has waived its right to mark up H.R. 1134 at this time. The Commerce Committee, however, has reserved its jurisdictional prerogatives with respect to a House-Senate conference on either H.R. 1217 or 1134 in any amendment any Senate amendments thereto, and, and the Chairman Bliley would ask that the rule providing for consideration of H.R. 1134 provide an equal amount of debate time for the two committees and the time be equally divided between the majority and the minority, and I would ask that his full statement be part of the record. And this time I, ask, I would ask uh, Mr. Browder to comment with regard to our amendment. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we are here not to talk about the uh, technical aspects of the elements of, the, of H.R. 1215, but we are here to ask that you place in order an amendment dealing with a concept that we think is an important part of the, this tax bill. Mr. Chairman, congressional budget hearings out there in uh, Ohio, Arizona, South Carolina, New Jersey, uh, and Montana have convinced me that we need to revisit this issue of a quick uh, tax cut. For five Saturdays, Saturdays in January and February, I asked overflow crowds of Mr. and Mrs. America, would you rather have a tax cut or deficit reduction? Their show of hands response to my question has been an overwhelming rejection of the upfront tax break in favor of reducing the deficit. Since then, public opinion polls have confirmed the people's common sense skepticism about indulging ourselves today while promising to ease the future debt burden on our children. Most economists agree. However, as we all know, the tax cut is a big train on a fast track. I think Mr. and Mrs. America are right. We should be very cautious in dealing with tax cuts at the same time we're trying to balance the budget. My bi bipartisan colleagues and I today propose a way to fulfill the spirit of these disparate objectives. We simply slow down the big, fast,
tax cut train until we see whether it works safely. Congress can accomplish this by committing to the tax cut and deficit reduction as long as the former does not derail the latter. And we can warrant that commitment by legislating a tax cut schedule which follows chronologically and conditionally progress on the budget deficit. Under our plan, tax cuts would be viewed as dividends that our country earns as we make progress towards balancing the budget. With the tangible incentive of tax relief, enhancing public pressure on Congress for deficit reduction. Here's how our plan would work. Two steps. First, tax cuts, which begin when the budget is on track to balance. All tax cuts in H.R. 1215 become effective after OMB <coughs> certifies that the budget will be balanced in the year 2002 or sooner. Certification is, this certification is based on laws which have passed Congress and have been signed by the President. Certification includes a calculation of the cost of the tax cuts in the bill. The second step is deficit reduction. Staying on target keeps the cuts in place. All the cuts in the bill are permanently revo revoked in the next tax year after any fiscal year in which actual deficits exceed the following deficit targets. And we have a chart from FY96 to FY202 which periodically reduces the deficit uh, reaching balanced budget in 2002. This is a simple and responsible concept. It keeps faith with cutting taxes as long as we're making sufficient progress toward a balanced budget. Mr. Chairman, I understand that the Democratic alternative already incorporates this plan, and I urge the Rules Committee to make our amendment in order. Mr. Castle. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would like to uh, thank uh, the other members who have joined in, in this amendment. Obviously, I support it. Uh, we believe this is a common sense amendment uh, that should receive bipartisan support, and I'd like to state why. Uh, first, our amendment is fully consistent for the Republican members with the contract with America. The contract says that we will balance the budget now. Look at page 23. It says it throughout. The Republicans have said nothing else but we will balance the budget now from the beginning. This amendment enforces that commitment by requiring spending cuts to come before tax cuts. This amendment will compel us to make the tough decisions to reduce spending this year in the budget reconciliation bill. The trigger for the tax cuts is a very tasty yes. carrot that will give everyone who wants to cut taxes the incentive to cut spending first. I believe that the American people want the federal government to put its fiscal house in order before it reduces taxes. Everyone would like to skip their vegetables and go straight to dessert, but even a child would say that is not good for you. I, I received a couple of letters, totally unsolicited. Uh, one gentleman I know, I don't know anything about his politics, however, uh, Mr. Bamberger from Smart of Delaware. And he, talking about taxes, says, personally, I do not believe the tax cut proposal should be given any consideration until spending is brought within the limits of current revenues. And then he says this, and I think this is interesting, further on the letter. In the world outside the Beltway, I believe most serious-minded folks suspect the only realistic tax cut on the near horizon will come in the form of a tax increase avoided if this Congress is successful in bringing spending under control. A lot of truth in that particular statement. And then another gentleman whose politics I do know, he's head of our, the largest Republican organization, DuPont, a company employee in, in uh, the state of Delaware, uh, says in talking about what I'm doing, I'm behind him 100% on the tax cut limit proposal, uh, hold cuts until spending is in check, makes good sense. Makes good sense. I mean, it's a very, very simple matter. It is just irresponsible <coughs> to promise tax cuts before the tough votes on cutting spending have been taken. And Mr. Bowder and I won't take the time to do it, as already explained, our trigger mechanism uh, I think you understand the deficit reduction targets. Uh, I would point out that the summary of our amendment is, is completely inaccurate before this committee right now. Uh, somebody should go back and, and look at that again. Uh, but I think the committee understands it, so I won't take the time to, to try to straighten that out. On the, on the deficit reduction aspect, uh, we believe this enforcement mechanism will force Congress to continue to reduce spending. Believe me, everyone benefiting from the tax cuts will pressure Congress to keep us on course to a balanced budget, and we will meet the deficit reduction targets. And Mr. Chairman, you more than any of us probably know all the, the different gimmicks and methodologies that have been come up with over the years to balance the budget of the United States of America. You, who are probably one of the great uh, true balanced budget people in this whole Congress, understands that they all have failed miserably. This would actually give us a mechanism, and I can't stress that enough. You know that the national debt is $4.8 trillion. 
The President's budget uh, would allow $200 billion deficits to continue for the next five years. We are committed to balancing the budget uh, by the year 2002. This is a tremendously difficult uh, task. Uh, we blinked a little bit on the rescission bill. Uh, I am, I'm concerned about where we would go next, next, and we must make it our top priority and leave it there. It is just, as, as has been stated, common sense that tax cuts remain subject to the overwhelming challenge of balancing the budget and removing the burden of debt from future generations. I am for tax cuts. As a governor, I cut taxes three times when other governors weren't even cutting taxes, but only when we had a revenue surplus. The federal government does not have a revenue surplus. We have the deficit, the debt uh, that we know about. So let's put the government on track to a balanced budget, and then let's put the tax cut into places. I thank you for considering this amendment. I don't know what the previous uh, rules have been with respect to amendments to tax cuts, but we really cannot go ahead without this particular amendment. I thank the gentleman and uh, Mr. Orton of Utah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will be brief also. Uh, I just arrived a few minutes ago from the hospital holding my newborn son. Oh, congratulations. There is. Oh, thank you. There is nothing that will change your perspective and focus your priorities quite like holding your firstborn child. It is irresponsible for our government to continue spending more than it's bringing in. It's irresponsible for my son and future generations of our country. It is absolutely imperative that we balance the budget and keep our promise to the people. I, as a tax attorney, there are many dozens of amendments I would like to bring forward in this bill. In fact, I agree with Mr. Gibbons. I would like to eliminate the current tax code and start over. Uh, Mr. Gibbons was right when he talked about problems that we have in our tax policy and the methodology of taxing our country. And just to amplify his example of the two glasses, the glass made in the United States that is shipped over there carrying our entire tax burden and the glass made over there brought here which doesn't carry its own tax burden. In fact, that's only half of the problem, Mr. Chairman. That glass when it's made in our country and shipped over there not only carries our entire tax burden but when it goes into their country they put their tax burden on our product coming in too. And not only does their product, when it leaves their country, have their tax burden removed from it, but when it comes over here, we have no methodology of putting ours on it. So their products in our country, we're not talking only about being able to compete with our products in their country, because our product is double taxed, carrying our country's burden and their country's burden. But their products are unfairly competing in our country because they neither carry their tax burden nor our tax burden. So I would like to just stop fiddling around with this problem we have currently, the current tax code. It is driving us bankrupt. We should eliminate it and start over. This is not the best tax bill that we could have before the Congress. And unfortunately, we're not going to have the opportunity with an open rule to make amendments to make it the best tax bill we could have before the Congress. In fact, it appears to me there's only one possible amendment that we may get before the Congress, and that is this amendment, which is simply a safety mechanism to ensure that we don't fall off the wagon. We've taken the pledge, as Spenders Anonymous, that we will stop. Now, this is an incentive, and this is a mechanism, this is a tool to help all of our other colleagues who are Spenders, and all of the country, sit down with us and say, each year, let's stop because if we don't, we'll lose the tax cuts through this mechanism. That's all we're trying to do. We're not trying to change any of the provisions, although I personally would love to change dozens of them. We're simply trying to put a safety mechanism in here. So, Mr. Chairman, for the future of my son and the future of our country, I would beg you to make this amendment in order. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Burr of North Carolina, new member of this body. No, me. Oh, beg your pardon? Me. 
Upton first. Oh, Upton, I'm sorry. Then, Mar then Martini. Oh, it's gonna go. Beg your pardon, okay. Ms. Sorry. Mr. Chairman, we are delighted to be here this morning, and we know each of us, Burr is bigger than I am. He is, uh, he's a lot bigger. Uh, uh, we know how hard it is to balance the budget, and you know particularly how hard it is. In fact, as we worked many days on the first Solomon budget resolution several years ago, uh, a budget that, by the way, did not raise taxes and balanced the budget before the end of this decade, we only got 20 votes. Three of them at least are in this room, as Mr. Orton was the only Democrat to vote for that budget several years ago, yourself and me. Uh, two years ago, or last year, we did the same thing. We did a little bit better. We got about 73 members uh, that voted for that, again without raising taxes and focusing on reducing the deficit to zero solely on spending cuts. Mr. Bielenson, in his testimony a little bit earlier, talked about the Congress of the past, the one in the 80s that, in fact, cut taxes, yet it did not cut spending at the same time, and the deficit ballooned. We cannot afford to make that mistake again, Mr. Chairman. I remember a, a lot of fun that you had on the floor last year, holding up a little picture of the former speaker, Mr. Foley, talking about the closed rules that he said that he would allow on the House floor. Mr. Chairman, we've gone back to the record as well. And we've found and identified some fun statements that a number of our party made on closed rules over the past years. Uh, we haven't put them yet in picture form, but we're thinking about putting them on some placards to remind our party, in fact, what we said about closed rules, even on tax bills. Mr. Chairman, last night and in closing, uh, I talked to a great senator, Senator Graham. He likes our idea. In fact, uh, within minutes of talking to him last night, he faxed me his own Balanced Budget Amendment Act, which literally takes our same target numbers and with the, with the uh, perhaps only $3 billion difference each year, agreed with exactly what we're trying to do. What we're saying is we'll take the tax cuts. We want them. But we want to make sure that the deficit comes down as well, leading to zero. And we think that this mechanism Though I'd prefer CBO versus OMB, that's not constitutional. We learned that in Graham Rudman back in the early 80s. Uh, this is a way that we can do it. We can take care of Bill Orton's new son. We can take care of my two kids and your kids and your grandkids and really not allow us to rue the day come the turn of the century that we didn't balance the, the budget this decade and, and put it off to the later. And I'd like to recognize Mr. Mr. Martini, Martini of New Jersey. Closing argument. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I thank the members of this uh, distinguished committee for this opportunity to address you this morning with respect to the Browder Castle Amendment to H.R. 1215 and to ask that that be put in order. I'd like to um, speak to you from the perspective of a new member in this body and one who did not have legislative experience before this. I already have witnessed in the last three months the difficulty of getting rescission bills passed and the difficulty in making those tough choices. Uh, what we're talking about in this amendment this morning is really timing of the tax relief. And we've heard other speakers this morning come before you and talk about whether this is the time for tax relief or not. I feel very strongly that I don't want to be here, and I'm sure none of us want to be here in a year from now, or even shorter, uh, wanting to be in a position that passage of this tax relief bill at this point, without adequate passage of deficit reduction, would lead to more of the same old thing. Uh, this amendment, in my mind, is a vehicle to keep our commitment to deficit reduction and not abandon our pledge through the contract with America to provide tax relief to the American people. Uh, I submit this amendment keeps all of the provisions that we ran on in the fall intact, and if we can pay for them in due time, they will all be enacted. Uh, this year, we have a unique opportunity to reduce our national deficit. I think we've seen that by the commitment of the members here on the floor already. But too often in the past, Congress has not made the hard choices to cut government spending and reduce the deficit. Regrettably, in the past, when Congress was faced with the prospects of cutting spending, too often the body blinked in the face of those tough decisions and the deficit increased. As we begin the budget process this year, this amendment will provide the needed incentive for everyone to take the necessary steps to cut federal spending in order to ensure that they will receive the tax cuts. It might not be enough to have good fiscal policy as the incentive alone. 
This, uh, this amendment, in reality, links the two together, and I agree with the comments of other members here this morning, uh, that the first priority of the contract, in my mind, had always been fiscal responsibility. That's why number one was a balanced budget amendment and line item veto. I think the linkage comes through this amendment, amendment of the uh, fiscal responsibility uh, with appropriate tax relief uh, in a timely manner. Being a freshman of a member of this body, I ran on a platform based on reducing our deficit and cutting government spending, and I know most of the colleagues in my freshman class ran on a similar commitment. The American people will support this amendment because they understand they have a vested economic interest in paying off the debt in order to provide tax relief. In fact, I think this amendment invites them into this difficult process and gives them something at stake, and I think it will help us, all of us, as, as we go down the path of making the uh, tough uh, decisions necessary to get deficit reduction, and uh, they will, in fact, I hope, be cheerleaders in that process as we go through this transformation of government. This amendment is a mechanism to reinforce the number one priority of the contract with America by achieving a balanced budget and fiscal responsibility. I submit, uh, Mr. Chairman, it is Congress's moral imperative to achieve a balanced budget in order to provide much needed tax relief for the American people. While the American people have labored far too long not to reap the benefits of tax cuts, the American people will never enjoy authentic economic opportunity until the federal deficit is reined in and tax revenues are no longer used to pay off the national debt. In conclusion, it is my strong hope that this committee will allow this amendment to be put in order so we can have a de debate on the floor of the House on this very important issue that faces our country. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, if I may, if I may conclude our, our comment, let me thank the members of the panel for working together and uh, uh, many other members of both the Democratic and Republican parties for uh, working on this amendment. As you can see, it has bipartisan support. Uh, it's my opinion that if you put this amendment in order, it will have bipartisan support and broad support and will pass the uh, United States House of Representatives. It will pass not only because it has broad bipartisan support, but because Mr. and Mrs. America and our economists know that it's the right thing to do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, if, if you uh, could... If yeah. the gentleman would... Did you have a question or... Uh... What I, I just wanted to comment that I, I have to go to my delegation lunch. Uh, we meet every Wednesday at, at this time. And I, uh, I did want to ask a brief question, but please, no. as the chairman... By all means, we, a, want to, we want to accommodate right. you when we can. Go ahead. Well, Mr. Frost. These, th this bipartisan group before us uh, presents an eminently reasonable proposition. And, and Mr. Chairman, when we were in the majority uh, on this committee, one of our concerns always was passing the rule. And it occurs to me that if we don't make this particular amendment in order, that we could have some difficulty in passing this rule on the floor. And uh, I would ask that the panel before us, is, is that accurate? Do you, do you think that we will have trouble getting a majority for the rule if this amendment is, is, is not a part of the rule? Others can speak for themselves, but if uh, this amendment is not in order, I will vote against the rule. And I think that uh, we have a, a great number of uh, members who will vote against it. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, I would predict that a majority of the members of Congress would vote against the rule. Other, the other members of the panel can speak for themselves. I mean, who knows how the votes are going to go on something like the rule, but, but clearly we feel very strongly about this, uh, Mr. Cross, and uh, uh, we have uh, co-sponsored this. Uh, we have a, a letter which is being signed uh, by more than enough Republican members, assuming no Democrats vote for the rule, that would uh, uh, cause the rule not, not to be successful. Th this is a holistic am amendment, if you will. This doesn't speak to, to one aspect yeah. of this, of this uh, tax. Policy it speaks to the whole concept of putting balanced budgets and straightening out the deficit problems of this country ahead of cutting taxes, and, and we just feel it's fundamental. Um, and as a result, I think those who are, are signing on are, are very committed uh, to to uh, making sure that this is included in the rule. It's not a threat or anything, but uh, we, we're very we think it's a reasonable position beyond yeah. votes. We hope uh, for that reason. The, we hope, frankly, our leadership will accept this. Uh, we are negotiating from that aspect, too, because we think it makes sense. We know there's a lot of discussions back and forth, and that's our real hope that it, that it can be worked out uh, in, in terms that we can all uh, I, I just like to add, I know the gentleman from Texas did not sign the contract, uh, but I did. And part of the contract says that all of the issues would be up within 100 days under an open and fair debate. Yes, I, this we, is a I, in fact, I have read that language yeah. uh, into the record on several and, occasions. And uh, though tax uh, bills uh, normally come under uh, semi-closed or, or open rules, 
uh, not not an open rule, but but more closed than that. I mean, this is something that has pretty good bipartisan support. Again, I'll reference your Senator Graham mm -hmm. in terms of the approach that he's taken. And to me, it seems like it ought to be part of the process. And we're asking that it is part of the open and fair debate, something with a lot of support to, can be offered. Well, again, Mr. Chairman, I have to go to my delegation luncheon. But I, I'm only, only trying to be constructive in that when we were in the majority, uh, we always were very much aware of the, the fact that you needed 218 votes to pass the rule. And uh, I think there is a legitimate question as to whether there will be 218 without this amendment. Well, as the gentleman knows, uh, that's the responsibility of this Rules Committee. This Rules Committee is not going to make a decision today. We're going to listen to all of the testimony from uh, all of the members, and the list is, uh, is lengthy. We'll be lucky if we get out of here by 8 o'clock tonight. Uh, but let me just say this, that um, I think all of you know that this member of Congress uh, has devoted his practically his entire career to trying to bring some fiscal sanity to this House and even uh, have suffered embarrassments in doing so. As my friend Mr. Upton has said uh, several years ago, we brought the first balanced budget to the floor of the Congress and we received uh, the, uh, the astronomical number of uh, support, uh, 16, 16 members out of 435. It was bipartisan. It was bipartisan. <laughs> it was Thanks bi to Mr. It was bipartisan. We Thanks had, to we Mr. had a Democrat. Then we followed uh, the succeeding year and uh, we uh, we had five times as many. I think we had uh, 76 votes for the uh, for a balanced budget, and uh, hopefully we are going to succeed. So let me just say to you that uh, it's nice to be in a in a uh, catbird position to try to leverage all of these uh, these people that want to balance the budget now, and I'm going to try to put put them all together, and by golly, we're going to get one sooner or later. Uh, but let me just uh, make a couple of comments because uh, certainly you know I share uh, share your concern. And my concern is that we just are not going to get there. And uh, I uh, showed charts earlier, but uh, uh, someone of you alluded to the fact that we had trouble coming up with $17 billion just to uh, offset the, uh, the supplemental uh, disaster funds that we had to come up with. Now we've had uh, extreme difficulty in coming up with $189 billion to pay for these uh, myriad of tax cuts. And where in the world are we going to find the guts then to find another $840 billion in cuts uh, in order to bring some fiscal sanity to this body? I have gone to the Republican leadership, of which I am a part of it, and uh, said that no matter what happens, if, we, uh, if this tax cut does work its way through the Congress uh, or through the House of Representatives and uh, then is sent over to the Senate, that uh, that's going to take some time over there, a lot of time, uh, before we ever get back to a conference to work out the differences. And uh, I have told the leadership that uh, it would only be fair to this body uh, and to the American people to, in the interim, uh, regardless of how this bill goes out, whether it has your amendment adopted or others uh, that would delay the entire implementation of tax cuts uh, until after the year after uh, the budget is balanced. Now that's the, the that's the far position. It's a position that I uh, that I shared. Uh, but I said that um, I would hope that they would allow us to bring a bill to the floor, a bill that has 840 billion dollars in in spending cuts. And Fred, as you know, you're a member of the balanced budget task force that I have a, the privilege of uh, chairing, and we have over the years developed. Uh, from a consortium of recommendations from the Heritage Foundation, from the, uh, from the uh, Concord Coalition, from the Grace Commission, from individual members, uh, many of whom are sitting here in this panel. Uh, and we have come up with a, uh, with a total list of spending cuts uh, shared by my good friend, Mr. Uh, Goss, who, uh, who has been responsible for about, for about 200 billion of these cuts in this bill. But what this does, this restructures the government. It, uh, it, it does eliminate the Department of Education. It does eliminate the Department of Housing. Uh, it does eliminate the Department of Energy, and on and on. Uh, and it's not that we agree with all of these cuts, but it is what is going to be necessary to balance the budget at the end of five, six, or seven years. And 
hopefully they will, uh, the Republican leadership will allow this bill on the floor under an open and free debate where if you don't like the fact that we're eliminating the Small Business Administration, then uh, come up with another cut to replace it. If you don't like the fact that we're eliminating the space station, then come up with another cut to replace it. But in the finality, let's pass a bill that balances the budget. My concern is that even with your amendment, and uh, like I say, you know I have sympathy for your, your approach, uh, I'm afraid that as did Graham Rudman, as did Graham Latta, it did not lead to a balanced budget. As a matter of fact, the budget's widened, and we cannot afford to allow that to happen. The only way to do it is to restructure the government and make those specific cuts now in the first year and two years, not in the fifth, sixth, and seventh year. And I'm afraid that following even the glide path that you've outlined, uh, that we will not ever get there because a new Congress will come in and a new, you cannot bind um, a new Congress on the wisdom of the old Congress, and it's going, to, it's going to change. So having said all that, I hope that we're going to be uh, successful in, in doing something that is going to force this Congress to be fiscally responsible. And I appreciate uh, certainly your input. I would hope that uh, no one would uh, commit to voting against a rule uh, until we have had time to uh, look at all of the uh, uh, all of the suggestions that there are many other than yours as well as you know some Democrat uh, Mr. Frost has one Would somebody turn off his microphone by the way that's uh, disturbing the uh, the transmission here uh, hopefully we will be able to get some kind of a commitment that is going to lead uh, to some fiscal sanity around here Mr. Uh, Chairman could I respond to, to my that? friend Mr. Orton. Um, you have just articulated the strongest argument against our amendment, which is that it may fail just as Graham Rudman, Graham Latta, and et cetera have. And you have also articulated the better way to do it, and that is simply defer all of the tax cuts until the year after we balance the budget. And I, for one, would be honored to be the co-sponsor of the Solomon Orton Amendment to do that. And I think we could pass that amendment. But, Mr. Chairman, I would encourage you to give Mr. Kasich a copy of your previous budget, resubmit it again as we're looking at the budget uh, in the coming months, and I'll vote for it again. And in fact, we may actually get your balanced budget passed. Um, I'm on the budget committee, and I haven't yet seen your plan for restructuring the federal government. I would love to have a copy of it and work on a bipartisan basis to try to get to that point. As you said, it is going to be extremely difficult to find the almost $1 trillion of additional cuts that we're going to have to make to balance this budget in the next seven years. And adding 3 to $5 billion more in tax cuts that we've got to come up with uh, in spending cuts to offset as well makes it all that much more difficult. So you've articulated the solution. Um, and if you need a vehicle to propose that onto the, into the Rules Committee and get onto the floor for a vote, I'd be happy to either co-sponsor it with you or sponsor it myself. But uh, I, mean, I think uh, I agree with you. You certainly have been one of the leaders in this Congress on this issue. Uh, you have been pointing the way, and I hope you'll continue to do so as chairman of this committee. Thank the gentleman. Is there further uh, statement? If not, we, uh, Mr. Castle, just, Governor, just very quickly. Uh, and expanding, I, and I agree with a, a lot of what you said, Mr. Chairman, and a lot of what the Mr. Orton said. Maybe if I get the Solomon Orton Castle <laughs> bill, but but I would just, and I'm not defending, uh, you know, what we are are trying to do here. But we are looking at a piece of legislation, which some of us feel sort of takes us off the cliff in terms of where we're going budgetarily in, in this country. Exactly. We're trying to make some stop on the on the way to the cliff, if you will. And I, but I think it's fair to point out that in our legislation there is a distinct possibility because there is a trigger mechanism. Uh, that the tax cuts will never take place because we will never have the courage, as I think you've implied, to make the decisions to really balance the budget. Uh, so we can't just assume that they're just going to be delayed a little bit. They may never take place. And we also, as you know, uh, have a step down, uh, which while it may not be perfect, is a real step down. It's not four sort of flat years and a big fifth year, whatever it may be. It's, it's an equal step down in terms of where the deficit caps will be, which means we could have a revocation of this, awkward perhaps, uh, but I think necessary to balance the budget. I think our amendment really aims at balancing the budget. And, and, and you, you may be right, you shouldn't cut taxes at all if you want to balance the budget. But if we're headed in that direction, I, I think this is the, the, the best 
we can do to improve that legislation to make it meaningful in terms of going to a balanced budget uh, first before we, we uh, start to put any kinds of tax cuts into place. Well, the gentleman's points are well taken, and, uh, and I will just uh, say to you that uh, uh, there are some concerns uh, with some of the economists and some of the, um, the business interests around the country that, uh, uh, that your approach would, would create a problem. And, uh, but, uh, you know, my retort to them was that uh, uh, it's 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 the better than nothing, and certainly, and uh, uh, hopefully, we'll be able to work something up. Uh, Mr. Gus, uh, any questions of the panel? I have only one observation. I certainly agree with what you're trying to accomplish. I think it makes a great deal of sense. Our issue is trying to get at the deficit and the devastating impact it has not only on every American, but on our children particularly. They've been talked about a lot lately. We're starting them off with an $18,000 cross around their neck. And then we're asking them to go out there uh, and accept even more uh, burden if we don't do something. So we have to do something about them. Um, my problem with your, with your approach, and I haven't thought it out yet, and in fact, it, Mr. Castle just triggered it in my mind. It, it seems to me that you're right. We're talking about tax cuts, and there's an anticipation of tax cuts in there as a sort of a secondary goal here. I would not like to be in a position of explaining to my senior citizens who often discuss with me the notch why it is that we are not delivering the earnings test uh, limitation change this year because we failed to do something with our arithmetic in Washington after we clearly had voted it in and, and uh, said it was coming. I mean, I, I think that there may be a little bit of another anticipation problem. I don't know if you have an answer, and I don't mean to be in any way uh, contest what you're suggesting, because I think what you've raised is a very valid well, the, point. It, we actually look at that as a good thing, because what it will do, whether it's your seniors or my business people or farmers or folks all across, students, et cetera, they'll all be watching the Congress with great interest to make sure that we really keep our pledge on keeping spending down, because if we don't, They'll pay for it, and they'll be at our town meetings, and they'll send their letters, and they'll watch our votes, and they'll make sure that that deficit comes down to zero, because otherwise they're going to pay the, the price. But and they're already doing I that. Mean. I mean, they're already doing that, they're and it isn't that. working. Well, maybe but, it did work in the last election. We don't election. take it away. I mean, the, the tax cuts come in unless we don't hit the targets, and it'll keep an enormous pressure on us to make sure that that target stays there and we don't fudge the numbers. Plus, Mr. Goss, I think uh, we probably hesitate to face our senior citizens and, and tell them, uh, try to explain that to them too. But I think the explanation for our senior citizens, plus our, our business people, is that the best thing for you, that we can do for our senior citizens, our business people, and our young working people and kids of the future is that we are working towards a balanced budget. And a, an unbalanced budget and the deficit we have right now is the greatest threat to those kids, to those senior citizens, and those uh, business people. Well, I think that's a fair message, but I'm just wondering what you do with the rest of the story on the tax reduction, which is out there whether we like it or not. That's, that was the only observation. We have to explain. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. May I just briefly uh, respond to the gentleman? Um, I think the opposite of what you've said is, is of greater concern. The opposite would be we're back into the same position that, uh, unfortunately, Congresses historically have been in, and that's why we are where we are. We, we, we go ahead with the tax relief now, we don't do the deficit reduction, and we're standing there before the American people doing more of the same old thing. So I think this amendment, in a way, I, I, I view it as uh, potentially putting sunglasses on all of us as members of Congress so when we're faced with those tough decisions, we won't blink and we'll go forward with uh, making those tough decisions, having two incentives, good fiscal policy as well as being able to provide tax relief. I don't disagree that your proposal takes care of that side of it very well. It's the other side I was a little concerned Mr. about. Mr. Moakley. Uh, I, I just arrived in the place, and uh, I was very interested in what you're going to tell the senior citizens and in telling the young students' schools that they not be getting money, but uh, some of the projects that uh, may not be funded. But I think you've got to try that speech out with those people directly rather than trying it out here. I think you'll find the, uh, the answers may be a little different. But Mr. Buckley, in, in answer to your question, I don't think we're, we're talking about the, uh, the cuts, the spending cuts. We're talking about the concept that uh, the tax cuts only go into effect if we are meeting these uh, targets. I know, but I, I don't think that the, uh, people are just going to listen to concepts. They, they want to know exactly, 
you know, how much that concept costs and how much it's going to cost me. That's a tough, uh, tough assignment, and I think that's what we were elected to do. Thank well, now, well now I'm glad you, that's what you were elected to do. <laughs> now you gentlemen know what I was talking about, right? It's going to be tough. Mr. Linder. Uh, what is being ignored here is lessons of history. In 1921, 1961, and 1981, we had significant tax cuts. And in each occasion, the economy grew and the revenues to the federal treasury grew. Every time we have tax increases, the economy slows, revenues slow. We doubled the size of the economy between 1980 and 1990 by tax cuts. Capital gains category revenues increased in 78, 79, 80, all the way till 87. And then we came in and increased capital gains taxes, and the revenues from the capital gains category today are less than 25% of what was projected in a zero-sum game. Either the government gets the dollar or the citizen gets the dollar. Dollars in the private sector grow and grow the economy. I will promise you that if we have a cut in capital gains this year, we will have more revenues from the capital gains category next year than we did last year. And those venture capital pools will grow and money will be, able, be available for job creation. Between 1984 and 1990, Jamaica, Mexico, Chile, Colombia, and Bolivia all dramatically reduced their marginal tax that all you have to do is raise the tax base and get more money, and it destroyed their economies. When Margaret Thatcher became the leader of Great Britain, she cut taxes, cut spending, and grew the economy, and grew the economy. We have to, we're not going to get the budget balanced with, the, uh, with spending cuts. There's no way in the world to balance this budget with spending cuts. We have to grow the economy and double the size of the economy in the next decade and hold spending down so that the growth in the economy can bring in revenues. I don't think it's accidental that between 1945 and today, federal revenues were 19 to 20 percent of gross domestic product. That happened when, in 1961, they had a 91 percent marginal rate. That happened in 1981 when they had a 70 percent marginal rate. That happened in 1987 when we had a 28 percent marginal rate. The federal treasury brought in about 19 and a half percent of gross domestic product. That's about what we're willing to pay. And when you get punitive beyond that, people change the way they earn their income and the way, the way they live. I say that tax cuts are going to bring in more revenues. Now, I don't say that about the 500 per, per child tax credit. That is going to have a very little impact on our economy in terms of job creation. But tax cuts at the margin and tax cuts on capital are going to grow this economy, and that's the only way we're going to get out of this problem. And I think you're going precisely against that. You're viewing the economy as a zero-sum game, and it simply isn't. If I might very briefly respond, and not meaning to get into an argument or a debate with you, uh, during the decade of the 1980s, uh, when the economy uh, doubled, there was something else going on as well besides just tax cuts. That something else was $4 trillion of deficit spending. And any economist will tell you it's rather hard to differentiate whether that doubling of the economy was based upon tax cuts or uh, government spending. And uh, so I think there is debate on, on those points that you have raised. There are very but those, few Keynesians left. But those issues are not what this debate is about. I, I would venture guess that all of the people on this panel and all of the people who have worked together in a bipartisan effort to come up with this amendment are supporters of tax incentives for capital formation. We're supporters of capital gain provisions. We're supporters of, of uh, research and development tax credits and so on. This issue is not about the substance of any particular portion of that tax bill. This debate and this amendment is simply about are we going to put some mechanism in this bill that says we're not going to repeat again what we did of spending $4 trillion more than we brought in as we cut revenues like we did in 1981. President Reagan 
never submitted a budget lower than what Congress adopted. Congress cut President Reagan's budget in all eight years. And so to suggest that President Reagan was wrong in simply not vetoing the congressional budgets, and that would have solved the problem, President Reagan should have started by submitting lower budgets. So I think we can get into that whole debate which is off the subject of this. This is simply an insurance mechanism that says, let's not continue deficit spending while we're cutting taxes. And I'll respond by saying I think it's the wrong insurance because if you slow down the cut in the capital gains tax, you will restrict the growth in the economy. The fact of the matter is, revenues to the Treasury doubled during the 80s. Congress and the presidents spent too much. All kinds of blame to go around on this thing. But the doubling of the size of the economy was real. It was because there are 19 million new jobs created with all of the major corporations downsizing at the same time, all of these jobs are small businesses, entrepreneurial jobs. It happened because the venture capital pools were filled again because it was worth putting money at risk. It happened because the low marginal tax rates encouraged people to go out and start build, uh, businesses. And this slowing down the advent of a cut in capital gains is precisely the wrong thing to do. Uh, if the gentleman before, the gentleman from Delaware uh, is responds and he'll have all the time he wishes, the chair would like to announce there's a parliamentary procedure vote on the floor. May I suggest to the members of panel two, they might wish to go downstairs and vote uh, and return. It is uh, the intent of the chair, I am told, to proceed to keep the hearing going. And as soon as we are through with the questioning of this panel, we will go to the next panel. Uh, the gentleman from Delaware. Uh, I, I will uh, be brief. Uh, John, it's, it's a very interesting uh, proposition you put forward. Uh, you and I both know that there's a lot of variables that go into why our economy goes up and down. It's not all just tax policy. Uh, but I tend to agree with you. I tend to be a little bit of a supply side uh, economist myself. Um, uh, and I do believe that uh, capital formation is vitally important uh, in this country. So I don't think you're all wrong. But I also have not read an economist yet who's not faced the problems of the deficits of the United States of America. It has not said that that is a more significant problem, a more significant burden than anything we can do with respect to tax cuts at this point. And, and I would just urge you to consider that aspect of it. But one other point, I'm just looking at the numbers here, and the $500 per child credit, uh, which you have indicated, and I would agree is not part of the capital formation, is $110.3 uh, billion of a $178 billion package. And there's a whole series of others. The, the capital formation aspects of this are a relatively small part of it. And, and I, one other thing I would also point out for all of our consideration, and I'm not arguing, I just want to put all the facts on the table. You're looking at about $188, $190 billion in the first five years in this tax cut. You're looking at $630 billion on the outside. Uh, the, the, the neutral cost recovery is actually a plus, believe it or not, in the first. It's 18.4 to the good. And then it's minus $120 billion in the second five years. I believe all we're doing is making a start on balancing the budget. I'm afraid when these taxes go into place, we're going to have to scramble very hard, or maybe if the term limits our successors are going to have to scramble very hard uh, in those next five years after that to make absolutely sure that we are able to continue to balance the budget. I'm just trying to get a balance of those things. I don't have a problem with some of the, the things you're talking about. I'm for tax cuts done in a, in a proper way. I'm just trying to put the horse before the cart in this particular well, situation. My point is just this, that we have got to grow this economy in order to get enough money to get after the uh, deficits, even while we're cutting spending. And uh, you do that by reducing the regulatory and tax burden on businesses. I'm convinced, and I think you'll find this proven next year, that a reduction in capital gains will bring in more revenue. And we're getting at the same thing. You can, you can, you can get more revenue or less spending, and you're getting at the deficits. And I think what you're doing here on, in respect of uh, the tax credit for, per child is smart. Uh, I think what you're doing here in respect of reducing capital gains is uh, counterproductive. Anything further from this panel? Mr. McLeod, do you have anything further? No, I, uh, sorry I didn't hear all the testimony. I'm sure it was very uplifting. <laughs> Actually, it's We're very sending balanced. copies of the statement in, in addition to what you have in the record. Do you have anything for thank, you? thank you, Mr. Chairman. We urge that you in, uh, include this amendment uh, in the rules. In fact, I'm going to support your amendment. Yeah. I figured that you would when you got, when you got the unabridged version. Aren't you glad I didn't hang around and listen to it? Thank you. Good.
Thank you, gentlemen. You have about nine yeah. minutes uh, to vote. Mr. Burton, uh, would you like to come forward and start on behalf of your panel? Sam <laughs> what? Panel. Oh, I thought you ah. said funeral. <laughs> I haven't, haven't heard what he had to say. Oh. No. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me uh, wait for the confusion to die down a little bit. Congressman Kennedy uh, and I are co-sponsoring this legislation. I would just like to say before uh, we start that uh, uh, Mr. Lender made some comments uh, uh, on his previous issue, and real briefly, if I might, I'd like to say my office and I did some research on the tax cuts, and uh, we concur. Uh, every time we've had a tax cut in the capital gains area, there's been a tremendous increase in the amount of tax revenues. And so if you want a stimulant to the economy, cut capital gains and you'll see probably two or three trillion dollars in new investment going into the economy which will be a giant boost to economic growth. Now the purpose uh, of the amendment that uh, Congressman Kennedy and I are, are, are sponsoring is to provide financial incentives for families to adopt children by excluding employee and military adoption assistance benefits from taxable income and allowing families to make tax-free IRA withdrawals if adoption expenses exceed the $5,000 tax credit. There are over 100,000 children, and I, I hope the committee will really pay attention to this. There are 100,000 children waiting to be adopted in the United States at any given time. Approximately 50,000 children were adopted in 1992, but thousands were not. The cost to the taxpayers of keeping children in foster care averages $15,000 a year. If it's a special needs child, it averages between $38,000 and $40,000 a year. And if there's any psychiatric care problems, <clears throat> it averages $100,000 a year. <clears throat> Pardon me. Now, the average cost of adoption is $9,000, and this high cost has discouraged many prospective adoptive parents. Average adoption benefit from companies is about $2,000. Corporate and military adoption assistance for employees who, ad who adopt has increased the number of adopted children and closed the gap between the number of children awaiting adoption and the number of prospective adoptive uh, parents. As many as 2,000 adoptions per year are facilitated by some form of corporate adoption uh, assistance. Wendy's International is one of the leaders in this area. If these adoption benefits are excluded from taxable income, increased numbers of fi families will have the incentive to adopt. Growth in the number of companies offering uh, adoption benefits is steady. About 18% of the big corporations offer benefits. And the bottom line, Mr. Chairman, is that if we provide these tax incentives for people to adopt children who uh, are average children, who have handicaps, who have psychiatric problems, it's going to save the taxpayers money. This, Mr. Chairman, this is a win-win situation. If you give tax credits or tax incentives for people to adopt children, what happens And Congressman Kennedy and I, in a bipartisan way, support this wholeheartedly. We do not believe the fiscal impact will be very high at all, if any. And uh, we think in the long term, when you take, a, take into consideration state costs of keeping children in foster care and in these other facilities, uh, it's going to save the taxpayers a lot of money nationwide. And with that, I'll be happy to turn the mic over to my colleague, Mr. Kennedy. Oh, Mr. Mr. Kennedy's Weiss. not back. I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Weiss. Mr. Weiss, I'm sorry. I thought Joe was back. Okay. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Their accents are a little different. <laughs> Just a little. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And somehow you're managing to keep all these subjects uh, straight today, and, and I admire you for it. Uh, I come today on behalf of the co-chairs of the Older Americans Caucus. We are a bipartisan quartet, uh, Congressman Regula, of Ohio, Congresswoman Morella, uh, Mr. Kennedy, and myself uh, to ask that an amendment be put in order that's of special importance to our senior citizens, particularly groups like the Alzheimer's Association. What uh, this bill does, and of course it's a tax bill, is also take steps with enormous implications for the health care of our elderly. 
Specifically, what it does is it makes uh, the premium payments for long-term care insurance tax deductible. And these would be benefits uh, uh, up to $200 a day for a senior citizen, more than $70,000 a year. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have been one of the Democrats who has believed in the past that I think it's important that there be tax incentives for long-term care insurance. I think with these tax incentives, more older people will purchase these policies, and it will be possible to, through the private sector, make sure more of our senior citizens get good health care. At the same time, I think it is equally important that steps be taken to make sure that when these policies are sold, that there be important consumer protections for the elderly. And what our proposal essentially does is bring to long-term care insurance what has been so successful on a bipartisan basis with the Medigap market. As you'll recall, in 1990, Congress took steps with respect to doctor's coverage, hospital coverage that the senior citizens buy uh, in the private sector known as Medigap. This has been an enormous success. The insurance companies are pleased with it. The responsible ones say they have no difficulty living uh, with the standards. And at the same time, the senior citizens groups have been very pleased because they feel that they're getting more uh, for their a dollar uh, under doctors and hospital coverage. We would like now to do that very same thing for the policies that the older people purchase uh, to cover nursing homes. There are about 2.5 million of these policies now. As a result of the tax breaks that are going to be offered, I would anticipate that millions of other older people purchase these policies. We just want to make sure they get the most for their money as a result of having disclosure, for example, common uh, terminology in these policies, that kind of thing. Let me wrap up by way of saying, Mr. Chairman, that again, I'm hopeful that this amendment will be allowed in the interest of open debate. For more than five years in both the House and the Senate, in a score of committees, this approach has been discussed. What we have done, Mr. Regula, Mr. Ms. Morella, and I, our long-term care proposal virtually mirrors the agreement that Senator Hatch and Senator Kennedy have worked out and have introduced in the last Congress as their own bill. So this is an issue where there is a significant track record of bipartisan support. We know that the model works because we have the old Medigap model for doctors and hospital coverage, and it is our view on a bipartisan basis that now when we're talking about extending upwards of $5 billion worth of tax breaks for long-term care coverage, let's also make sure to give the senior citizens an opportunity to get the most for their money, that there be some basic consumer protections involved as well. And I thank you for the chance to come. We thank, uh, thank you, gentlemen, and we thank you for your concern on this uh, terribly important issue. Uh, what, you mentioned that, uh, I beg your pardon, by all means, Mr. Kennedy, I forgot that you hadn't testified. Don't, don't worry, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Joe I, Kennedy. I appreciate uh, uh, recognition, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I uh, want to thank you and the other members of the committee for the opportunity to come and testify this morning. I want to thank both of my uh, colleagues, Mr. Wyden and Mr. Burden. Uh, I'm here on both of the amendments that have been described, and I won't uh, take a, a great deal of time. I, I was looking around as, we, as I came into the room for Claude Pepper's uh, uh, painting on the wall. I was figuring that the only two members that are here in this committee uh, at the moment uh, probably have a pretty acute interest in wondering where his painting is, but uh, only because uh, I know that uh, Better be careful, Joe. He, was, he, was one of the, he was one of the individuals that was uh, uh, such a strong backer of long-term uh, care and insurance and uh, ha had actually uh, talked with me several years ago about trying to pick up on some of the legislation that he had filed uh, shortly before his death. But uh, the, th the fact is that uh, uh, this is a bipartisan issue. It's one that uh, I think uh, the Republicans have recognized uh, there's a great need for by providing this uh, tax break. All that Mr. Wyden and I are trying to do, along with uh, uh, Mr. Regula and Ms. Morella, uh, are trying to mimic the bipartisan spirit that has been uh, a part of the Senate uh, language that uh, simply sets standards. We in the Aging Committee heard testimony time and time again of terrible abuses where people were taken advantage of in unscrupulous ways by some of the largest companies in this country. 
are not told about how chronic diseases uh, uh, will, will eliminate them from coverage, or are not told about uh, how inflation eliminates them from coverage. A number of, uh, of really uh, terribly uh, onerous abuses had, have taken place. And all we're trying to suggest is that while it's important to set these uh, these tax provisions out to allow people to take advantage of long-term insurance, we've got to take some steps to make certain that the kind of insurance that is provided has uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the blessings of uh, some kind of regulatory uh, uh, approach to make certain that abuses aren't uh, uh, continued to be perpetrated. So I think that this is a very reasonable, uh, non-bureaucratic attempt to try to make certain that there's a certain quality of uh, standards uh, in the in the insurance uh, provisions that uh, can be uh, can be obtained uh, through the private marketplace, but uh, the given the records of these companies in the past, it's important to set some basic standards. And then I, I uh, if I might, uh, Mr. Chairman, just jump right into the the other amendment, which I understand uh, from uh, my staff, Mr. Burton, described very very well. Uh, the uh, the the number of uh, there are many people that are concerned with the number of of, uh, of abortions that take place in this country. There are people that are concerned about uh, the kind of uh, breakup of the American family. There are millions of American couples that want to go out and adopt children. They have a great many barriers to those adoptions, not the least of which is finances. Uh, adopting uh, kids today can cost up to $45,000. And while a $5,000 tax break will help, the fact is it doesn't go long enough towards adopting, particularly some of the children in foster care, which is where the real weight is. The, the trouble is that you can, you know, if, if, uh, if you want to adopt a six-week-old white baby, there's a line in, in, the, in uh, waiting to adopt those children. If you go into foster care uh, with troubled children that have difficult uh, pasts, uh, the, 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 the troubles are much more significant, and we've got to give people some uh, way of paying for the cost that they're incurring. This uh, would take some four very minor provisions in terms of uh, uh, aid that is currently provided by employers, by uh, the military, and uh, that aid that is currently goes to, uh, uh, to families that simply have a child through natural childbirth, uh, but uh, are not provided to, uh, to uh, families that want to adopt. I think it's a, it's a very small cost to the program, but one that would be important. And I'm glad to say that Mr. Burton has, uh, has been a great supporter of this. He worked hard on a bill uh, last week to get it passed on the House floor in terms of a similar uh, piece of legislation. Uh, also, Chris Smith and uh, Bob Matsui have also been involved in getting this uh, legislation moved forward. So I hope, again, this bipartisan effort would uh, see the light of day, or at least the light on the House floor through your uh, efforts, uh, uh, members of the committee. Anyway, thank you very much for your attention, and I appreciate your consideration. <clears throat> Joe, thank you very much, and thank all of you uh, for your testimony. I know you're all uh, very concerned about this issue. Again, what, uh, what, what has happened in the committee on this, on this issue? Mr. Chairman, uh, there has been, uh, with respect to long-term care coverage, there has been no discussion in the Commerce Committee this session on that uh, topic. Uh, certainly in the past two Congresses, there has been extensive uh, coverage. Uh, as I say, in the Senate, I'm particularly pleased that Senator Hatch and Kennedy in the past have been able to reach an agreement on it. We largely mirror our proposal on that. And I think, Mr. Chairman, one of the reasons that we come to offer this is that we've got a model that we can already use. The National Association of Insurance Commissioners work very closely with the senior citizens organizations and others. What we're proposing today work for Medigap. That's the coverage for doctors and hospitals. All we're essentially saying is let's use this time now when we're talking about extending up to $5 billion worth of additional tax brackets, tax breaks to the long-term care uh, market, which is likely to grow dramatically in the future. I'd like to say also that as a Democrat, I think that uh, it is important to have tax incentives to encourage people to purchase uh, this coverage in the private marketplace. So I think now, if we're going to have those tax incentives, let's balance the scales to make sure that they're good consumer protections so that people can get disclosure about the terms. Let's make sure that uh, 
They can ask for a refund if they want to say uh, over a couple of days and had a chance to think about it some more that the policy isn't in their best interest. Let's have some limitations on these harassment practices that uh, some agents employ. Not all of them do, and the good companies have tried to restrict it. But as, uh, as was noted, our hearings found that unfortunately it goes on too often, and uh, we seek to limit that in this proposal. The, uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Re regarding the, the adoptive uh, children, uh, the Ways and Means Committee has looked with favor upon a $5,000 tax credit, and they've looked with favor upon additional language in the bill, which provides incentives for people to adopt children. However, Mr. Children, or Mr. Chairman, this, this uh, amendment that we're talking about today would go further. I believe the fiscal impact of this amendment would be minimal. But the overall benefits of getting these children out of the foster care system from a taxpayer standpoint would be astronomical. So this is going to be, I think, a plus to the taxpayer. In addition to that, it's going to get loving children or children into loving homes. And I think the, this is a step that, uh, that uh, this Congress has already said was a step in the right direction. I think this just enhances it. Uh, I would suggest to you, uh, the three of you, that, um, that you talk to both Mr. Archer and to uh, Mr. Uh, Sam Gibbons, uh, because you probably are going to need their support, or, or at least understanding, if we are going to consider making the amendment in order. So good advice for you is to talk to them. The Chairman, if I, if I might just, there's been some talk that uh, due to the complexity of all the pieces of legislation that you're considering, that there might only be one amendment made in order, which that would That decision has not been made. So there's still some opportunity here to try to get these uh, included. And that was my, uh, my suggestion, that you talk to uh, the, both the chairman and the ranking member, uh, because if we are going to consider it, you certainly are going to uh, need their support. Yeah, but if I might further pursue the, 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 the thought, if, if uh, in fact, I, uh, both chairman or the chairman and ranking member of, of Ways and Means were to endorse this concept. Uh, would there, in your opinion, be a reasonable opportunity that we could include those in the? Joe, we really don't know yet. We we have a lot of testimony. Uh, you know, it's always been the practice of this committee to close down the uh, the rules dealing with the United States tax code. Both your amendments deal with that subject. Uh, and uh, it's hard to say, but uh, there's a great sympathy for what you're trying to do. I, I for one, have great sympathy for what you're doing. And, uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could follow up on that. I, I'm going to follow up on your counsel immediately, and I think it makes a lot of sense. I think the concern was, and as we follow it up, uh, we'll, uh, we'll learn more about it, was that the original contract, as it related to long-term care, simply provided the tax breaks. Now, I don't think anybody in drafting the contract had some sort of malicious design or something and tried to do something injurious to the senior citizens. I think that when the contract was written, this issue had not been brought up. All we're seeking to say with respect to the senior citizens' questions, and groups like the Alzheimer's Association have brought this to it, is here's a way to balance it up. It will in no way injure the tax uh, incentive part of the contract, but it'll make sure that the senior citizens get the disclosure that they need, can compare these kinds of policies, that we can do the kind of thing that really has worked uh, very well in the Medigap market. An announcement that uh, we were going to interrupt this hearing on this, uh, this matter uh, in order to hold an emergency meeting on the, uh, on the health conference report uh, at 2 o'clock, and because there's been a problem between the Senate and the House, we're going to delay that, so it probably won't take place, and I had already notified your staff that that might happen, Joe. Okay. So the meeting will not play, take place at 2 o'clock. It will be more like 4 o'clock. Okay. Mr. Moakley. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm very impressed with the testimony I heard here today, and I'm so impressed that I'm ready to vote for both of the amendments that you people have made in order. I think that uh, when you read about uh, the uh, children uh, who are wandering the streets or don't have the proper care in the projection of what's going to happen to those students, uh, they'll, they'll be just uh, uh, charged to the state and they'll probably be living in institutions all their lives and never get the proper education. I just think that that is a very important one because we just can't afford to give a, another generation of children away and I, I think you people are on the right track. 
Thank you. Mr. Chairman, if I might just point out that last week, I know you spoke out very strongly against the, uh, some of the rescissions and the, uh, uh, that took place. One of the ones that I, I, I think and I hope was inadvertent was that the actual funding for foster care was reduced uh, overall by a, by a very dramatic amount. And as a matter of fact, uh, there will be children uh, as a result of those uh, reductions in government spending that will now have to live uh, in homes where they're being abused and in homes where uh, they're both being physically as well as sexually abused. And I think that we've, uh, if, if those kinds of uh, budget considerations are going to take place, then we really need to make certain that we're going to be able to provide families with the opportunity to adopt children. Mr. Uh, Burton pointed out on the House floor the other day that it costs seven times as much money to put a child into an orphanage or some kind of group home situation versus the kind of foster care situation that exists today where 450,000 kids exist. But there's three and a half million cases of child abuse that are reported every year in this country. There's only 450,000 kids that are living in foster care homes, and there's, and there's slightly over 60,000 kids that ever get into uh, actual adoptions. Adoptions, as Mr. Burton pointed out to me the other day, are much, are much the cheapest alternative, both from the taxpayer's perspective as well as from the society's perspective. It's where they get a loving, caring, nurturing home that they can avoid some of the pitfalls that too many of our nation's young people are facing today. So I think that it just makes sense. I'm sure that if people had known, I hope if people had known the kind of impact that some of those budget cuts had on the whole uh, foster care uh, uh, infrastructure in this country, that those would have been spared the kind of cuts, and I'm very hopeful that the Senate will, uh, will, will put the money back into it, because I'm sure Mr. Solomon and others that, uh, that voted for that package didn't, weren't aware of the, uh, of the dramatic impact that, that, that those cuts will have on that foster care system. Okay. Uh, Mr. I, I, I don't want to uh, prolong the discussion, but let me just say that uh, I was in a in an orphanage at one time. Fortunately, I, I was able to get back with my mother. Uh, but I, I first, uh, from a first-hand perspective, I saw a lot of young people that uh, that uh, went through an awful lot of heartache waiting for adoptive parents. And if we can put some incentives, additional incentives, into the tax code to get kids out of that kind of environment, out of foster care, out of abusive homes, it will be a not only a, a good thing for the taxpayer, but it's, it's a humanitarian, it's the right thing to do. Dave Thomas was here to testify on behalf of this, you know, the founder of Wendy's. Dave was an adopted child. He was, a, he was on his own from the time he was 15. Now, he's one of those people who pulled him up, self, himself up by his own bootstraps and made something out of himself, became one of the bit, most successful businessmen in the world. But there are so many young people who never get that opportunity. And if we can figure out ways through the tax code to provide incentives to get them into loving homes, then we will have done probably more than we can imagine to help this country and to help those kids and help the future. If you don't deal with that problem now, what you end up with was an awful lot of those kids feeling unloved. They stay in that system and they go to jail. And it costs thirty to $35,000 a year to keep them incarcerated. So I think this is a pittance and overall it's going to be a real plus for the taxpayer to get them out of this kind of environment. Well, gentlemen, uh, are you, are you no, I, I, I agree with everything uh, these gentlemen say. Any uh, questions of uh, other witnesses? If not, gentlemen, we appreciate your coming. God bless you. You're a good man. The, uh, good man. the next panel, uh, which has wait, waited patiently, and uh, uh, the uh, elder statesman of the panel is not uh, normally uh, noted for his patience. Uh, it is Mr. Pat Roberts of Kansas, uh, along with uh, a new member of this body, Mr. Greg Gansky, whom we have great respect for already. And he's, he's only been here for two and a half months. Gentlemen, feel free to summarize, and your entire statement will be uh, submitted for the record without objection. Ms. Mr. Chairman, we'll keep this uh, brief. Mr. I know, Gansky. I know you have a long day. Thank you for the opportunity for a few minutes, and Mr. Moakley, thank you. Um, I think you could see that I can see that from testimony that's gone before that, that there is a reason in general for keeping a closed rule on tax bills. I mean, uh, things can open up a Pandora's box. But, uh, and this is going to be a very difficult rule, and so I suspect that this is going to take the uh, wisdom of Solomon, so to say. Um, but I would like to ask you, ask you to make a, uh, uh, an order for at least a couple amendments, and hopefully ours. 
Uh, our amendment is a modest amendment. It uh, would require a change of four words. Uh, Mr. Roberts and I would like to offer an amendment to lower the cap on the $500 per child family tax credit from $200,000 to $95,000. As crafted, the amendment also shortens the phase out period from $50,000 to $25,000. Uh, Mr. Roberts and I both signed the contract with America. I was proud to stand on the east front of the Capitol and make a commitment to fundamental change. We both believe that this amendment would save billions of dollars, it would strengthen the bill, and it would improve the bill's chance of passage. We presented this committee with a petition signed by over 100 members of the Republican caucus, including uh, 11 or so uh, committee chairmen, 35 or so subcommittee chairmen, over half of the freshman class. Uh, Mr. Roberts and I gathered those signatures in a very few hours, indicating that this is something that struck a responsive chord in our own Republican caucus. I feel that it would also uh, receive favorable treatment in a bipartisan fashion. Um, I can tell you that the uh, people back in Iowa who I represent do not consider somebody who's making $200,000 to be part of the middle class. The amendment with which uh, Mr. Roberts and I are asking to be made in order would ensure that the benefits would go to those who are most in need. This change will save the government billions of dollars and it will still provide real tax relief to middle class Americans. According to the Joint Committee on Taxation, adoption of this amendment would result in a savings of an additional $7 billion between now and the end of the century. As one who ran for Congress committed to reducing the deficit, these savings would represent a significant step in our efforts to bring us to a balanced budget. At the same time, this amendment will still aid the vast majority of families who need the help for a uh, child tax credit. Mr. Chairman, we're not debating this tax pack package in a vacuum. I want to roll back taxes as much as any member of this body, but I also want to address the issue of the deficit. And I would ask that your committee uh, strongly consider our amendment. Mr. Roberts. Well, Mr. Chairman, the high road of uh, humility is not bothered by heavy traffic uh, in Washington, but it is always a very humbling experience uh, to appear before you and admire your perseverance and your patience. I don't think I can really add too much uh, to what my colleague and friend has indicated. I would like to underscore again, however, that at least 105 members uh, have indicated their support for this amendment. Uh, this includes uh, an estimated 35 freshmen, 10 full committee chairmen. I think that really accurate number is about 11 and 38 subcommittee chairman. I think the amendment makes sense. Mr. Gansky has summarized it very, very well. What we're really talking about is a 4% difference in the number of families who will be covered in regards to this amendment, which will allow us about a $7 billion savings in regards to the deficit. I think there is some consideration that if there were no cap, that might be different if you want to be in favor of an argument that you are going to be economically pure. But once you put in that cap of 200,000, I think that understandably leads to concern on the part of members and a preference on our part to lower the cap down to 95,000. I really don't think I can add any more to the excellent uh, presentation uh, made uh, by Mr. Gansky, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. <laughs> well, you, uh, <clears throat> you gentlemen know that um when the letter was delivered with 102 signatures to, uh, to me, the letter was addressed to me, and um, I took the liberty of signing the letter myself. So you know that I have great sympathy for what you're, what you're trying to do. Um, the, there is no question but what uh, the tax cut package is going to make it even more difficult to try to bring the deficits under control. And, uh, one of my reasons for signing it uh, was the fact that uh, that if we could, if we have fewer tax cuts in dollars, it will make it that much easier for us to bring that the deficit under control. And I am just uh, frightened that the Congress is not going to have the guts to do that. Uh, and 
Having said that, I don't know what's going to happen with your amendment. We are not going to take action today. Uh, when this hearing does end sometime later this evening, uh, we will be discussing it uh, with you and with uh, the Republican and Democrat leadership as well. Uh, and hopefully we'll be able to, uh, to help you. Having said that, uh, Mr. Moakley, do you have any questions? No, I just uh, want to congratulate the gentleman for outstanding such a Okay, thank you. Mr. Uh, Goss. I apologize for walking in late. I am well aware of the content of the letter. I was happy to sign it. In terms of preferences, it would be at the top of my list. I think the chairman has uh, outlined very well the situation we find ourselves in, but uh, I appreciate the efforts you've made. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bielenson. Uh Mrs. Price. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and I commend the gentleman. I certainly have been hearing the same sentiments back in my district almost overwhelmingly. Uh, and I'm surprised at that, uh, but nonetheless, that's, that's the situation. Uh, so I applaud you for your efforts, and, and just as I'm real uncertain as to how we came up with the $200,000 mark, I, I just wanted to ask you how you came up with 95. I mean, that it came from someplace. Uh, do you have any way to, to explain it? <laughs> uh, in discussing this with uh, many members of the Republican Congress conference, and I should also point out that that I believe that uh, a majority of the conference supports this, in, in addition to names that have already been then signed. Uh, there was concern that, uh, especially for people who live on the east and the west coast, when you have double income uh, families where both the husband and the wife are, are working, if you take uh, the situ family situations in cities such as New York or Los Angeles, uh, that the $95,000 level phased out for an additional 25,000 is, uh, is a reasonable figure. I might add that um, when we were discussing this with Speaker Gingrich and at his request uh, circulated the letter that we were both talking about a cap that would be somewhat lower. Uh, it was the Speaker's suggestion that we go to 95,000. I think the phase out is important because I don't think you want to get into the situation where if you have a specific figure and then somebody earns $95,010 uh, that uh, it would be very awkward and, uh, and just an administrative nightmare. So consequently we follow the speaker's advice and I, I think it is well taken for the reasons that <coughs> Mr. Kansky has already summarized. Uh, and uh, in addition to that uh, you probably have looked into the fact there are there's some um, argument that this $200,000 figure is in the contract. Now, um, I guess there are different versions of the contract. Some of them evolved after the actual signing of the contract, or they were at least um, uh, beefed up, so to speak. Can you tell me when and where this $200,000 figure came from, if, if you know? Uh, when I, I think a, a large number of members of the conference, when they signed on to the contract, uh, did not have some of the of the uh, fine details. Um, I, this is an effort by Mr. Roberts and I to honor the contract and to help the uh, leadership. Uh, both of us, I think I can speak for Mr. Roberts, feel that, uh, for instance, capital gains uh, tax cuts are very important, will improve the economy. Both of us represent agricultural areas where this is a very important issue to uh, farmers who work all of their life. And as Mr. Archer earlier today uh, eloquently pointed out, uh, for one year when they sell the farm, uh, half a, a very high income and then are taxed uh, very high for that, whereas they've basically saved all of their lives for that moment. So, so I want to reiterate my support for the basic tenets of the, of the contract. Mm -hmm. I just think that this makes more common sense to most people. Let me emphasize that uh, when the task force that was writing the contract met after the election, Many of the specific details were added on, and that is obviously uh, should be expected uh, in that process. But I would remind everybody in regards to our amendment that the one sentence that we really have tried to emphasize, or the point we've tried to emphasize, is this. Our objective is to pass a tax package that is consistent with the principles of the contract uh, with America. And the gentleman from Iowa has already talked about the tremendous importance of capital gains 
In my uh, position of having the privilege of being the chairman of the House Ag Committee, obviously I'm very supportive of the estate tax reform. We take important steps in regards to the earning limitation. Uh, we take important steps in regards to the IRA. That, you know, that whole package, I think, is extremely important. But what we're really talking about is the difference between 93% of the American families and about 95 to 96%. And once you put that cap in at 200,000, I think it makes much more sense to save more money and to put it down to 95,000. I don't think this is in any way a violation of the principle of the contract. When I signed it, when you signed it, when others signed it, it was general in principle. It does not mean that if you think you can improve it or if you could prevent something that would be very counterproductive and could even lead to the defeat of this particular provision, that you would not want to do that. So consequently, I think, and I think Mr. Gansky agrees, that we are consistent with the goals in regards to the contract with America. Well, I, I, I agree with that, I, I think, and um, certainly my constituents see it that way, and I thank you for your uh, candid answers. Thank you. Mr. diaz Bellar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have no questions. I think this issue is, is very clear. Uh, and I thank these distinguished leaders for their, uh, their work on it and their uh, patience and waiting. I know I saw Chairman Roberts for some time uh, waiting and, uh, for their testimony today. Thank you. Mrs. Waldholz. Uh, I'm one of the proud signers of your letter. Uh, I campaigned on the family tax credit, $500 per child, before there was a contract. And I campaigned on a lower threshold than the $200,000 uh, income limit. Uh, I, I think this is an important amendment. Uh, as Mr. Goss said, you know, we find ourselves in a difficult position. Uh, but, but if we have an opportunity to offer an amendment, this is the one I hope makes it to the floor. And I thank you for your work on this issue. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Did uh, uh, Mr. Hall, I think you came late. Do you have any questions? If not, gentlemen, we appreciate your coming, and uh, as, uh, as usual, we commend you for your due diligence in this work. Okay, Goodbye you. now. Uh, the next uh, scheduled witness is Richard Burr, who is a member of the uh, Commerce Committee, which uh, is the jurisdiction we're on now. But since he is not here, there are two other members uh, of that panel, uh, Mr. Salmon and Mr. Tate. If the two of you would uh, come forward and... Uh, Feel free to uh, summarize, and without objection, your entire statement will be submitted for the record. Thank you. And we'd like to welcome two distinguished new members of this body, and uh, can't tell you how uh, happy I am to see uh, see both of you here. It's uh, starting who, to feel who will like be the opening spokesman, uh, Mr. Chairman. I will, without Mr. objection. Mr. Salmon of Arizona. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Really appreciate this opportunity. I think that uh, this is a very, very important debate uh, for us to be having right now as to the uh, family tax credits. While it is important for us to realize that uh, tax cuts uh, for businesses like the capital gains cuts and uh, some of the other changes that we'll be making in the estate uh, taxes uh, are helpful in jump-starting the economy and really actually have a, a, a positive impact on reducing the uh, uh, or increasing the revenues and decreasing the debt. Um, I, I think that uh, we can't lose sight on the fact that uh, we do need to do something also for the American families who have been punished for too long. And I think back to my dad, uh, who grew up uh, during the World War II era, well, he served in World War II, and uh, raised six children. And he paid 2% of his income to the federal government. Now, I'm raising four kids right now and paying 24% of my income. Uh, and that's the average out there. And, Mr. Chairman, I, I think that the American people need tax relief. I, I'm going to argue against any kind of a cap. That we're, we're here to talk about our specific amendment, but I would just like to say uh, that it doesn't make a lot of sense that we give somebody with uh, 95000 and one child a tax break, yet somebody who's making 96000 who has six children doesn't get a tax break. That, to me, is perpetuating this class warfare nonsense uh, that I don't believe in, and I think every family out there uh, believes uh, that uh, this Congress is serious about relieving their tax burden, and they ought to be able to determine the priorities for their family, not this august body. Um, I think most of us agree that the deficit and uh, tax relief ought to go hand in hand and, and, and relieving the deficit, but the goal it, it does not preclude us from cutting taxes for American families. Um, 
this is, has been shown by H.R. 1215, the work of Chairman Archer and Chairman Kasich. They've come up with a plan that eases the tax burden of the American family and provides $90 billion for deficit reduction. I support H.R. 1215 as it's outlined and uh, in its purest form. But if we're serious about modifying the bill further, and we are going to consider amendments, uh, Representative Tate and Representative Burr and myself have kind of put our heads together because we've heard the same thing as we've gone home and done town halls and heard folks say, listen, I'd rather not receive a tax break. I'd rather have my money go to deficit reduction. And so we believe we've come up with a win-win solution. And that is amend the bill to make a box for a tax or for a checkoff to allow them to designate that their tax credit will go to deficit reduction. I think it's a, it, again, it's a win-win proposal. And those folks out there that uh, uh, are more interested in uh, getting us out of the, the fiscal woes that we're in than receiving the tax benefit for their own family can designate to do so. I don't think anything could be more democratic or uh, place the power more in the hands of the American people where it really ought to be. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Tate. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I'm sorry Chairman Solomon stepped out because I wanted to thank him for his tireless work on deficit reduction. He's, he's been a real leader and a real deficit hawk, and I appreciate his work. But I'm, I'm here today to talk about H.R. 1215, the family tax credit. And I, too, was one of those assigned a contract with America on the Capitol steps, very proudly did so. Um, this amendment that we're proposing would do a couple of simple things. It would give families a choice of whether they want to utilize that $500 family tax credit for each child or they want, if they want to reject it and have that money sent to the Treasury to reduce the national debt. And that's what the purpose of the Salmon, Tate, Burr Amendment really is about. It, to me, it strengthens the bill. And to address some of the concerns we just heard from the last panel that came before this committee. You know, there's those that want to lower the cap and they have good purposes. They want to reduce the debt and they want to reduce the deficit. And we believe it's important also to give family tax credits and families some relief from the taxes. And our amendment solves both those problems. It allows families to make the decisions, not bureaucrats, not politicians, but let the families decide what's most important for them and what's most important for their money to be used. Because ultimately, folks, it, it's their money. They should be able to decide if it should go for their family's needs or for reducing the debt. This amendment will strengthen the bill it addresses the concerns that have been raised, and more importantly, it lets families decide where their money should actually be spent. And I would encourage the committee to give this serious consideration. Thank you. That's very articulately stated and very briefly stated. Uh, Mr. Quillen, did you have a question? No questions. I didn't hear their testimony, but I'm sure it was excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Judge Price. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I, I guess I just uh, don't disagree with the, the basic concept. Uh, you still would ca cap it at 200000 though, is that correct? Uh, we would not change the cap. We would keep the spirit and the, and the content of the contract right. with America. But we would let the people decide, instead of us trying to decide amongst ourselves which is the best way to, to spend the money, why not let the people yeah, decide their money? Well, and that's, that's the concept. We do not change the cap. We try to address the concerns of those that want to lower the cap. Well, the, my, my problem is, I guess, in, um, you know, it, one of you referred to it as, as class warfare nonsense. Now, you know, I, I don't disagree with that either. If we're, 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 anytime you put a cap on it, we're going to start arguing where it should be. So you're justifying or you're defending the 200,000. I don't know that uh, if, if there's a cap at all. We have the same argument. Don't uh, actually, my, Mr. Chairman, uh, Madam Price, uh, my, my original position was I don't think there should have been a cap. But there is a cap. There is a cap, and I think that was a compromise in the first place. I, I think we're here to argue this amendment, and, and I... And well, I'm, you took a, bit, a good bit but, of time arguing... But, but my, my position is we've already compromised once. I do not see the difference, personally, w with a family of, of six kids not getting the tax break because they make $96,000, yet a family with one child gets the tax break and they're at 95. That to me is not fair and it's not doing justice to the American family. Well, anytime you, you, yeah. you put an arbitrary figure on, that's where I was trying to ask mm -hmm. the last panel, where did we come up with these figures in the first yeah. place? And so uh, maybe... We'll and, and that's what we're trying to do with this amendment. And, and, I, and I sincerely appreciate the concerns of the last panel. I may disagree personally. Mm -hmm. 
and we may all have a different idea. This way, I think, addresses everybody's concerns by letting ultimately the people we work for, the people that hired us, the people whose money it is, to decide where their money should be spent. And I think it, that's the best way to deal with it. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Bielenson. Mr. diaz Ballard. No, no questions. I thank the uh, gentlemen for their participation and their ideas. Thank you. Mr. McGinnis, you had no questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank the you. The presentation thank you, was very clear. Privileged to welcome the minority leader to the proceeding of the Rules Committee. Uh, Mr. Gavard, if you wish to come forward at this time, we have uh, alerted the uh, chairman that uh, you are in the room, and I think he will be here shortly. I understand the arrangement was that uh, we needed to accommodate your schedule. We're happy to do that, sir. I appreciate it very much. I thank the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me to be here today and for the opportunity to testify, to share my thoughts on H.R. 1215, the tax provisions of the Republican contract with America, and to explain why this bill, in my view, demands an open rule and why this country demands a wholly different approach to tax cuts. Let me begin by saying there's no one in this country who would deny that taxes are too high. Families deserve tax relief. And when you boil the issue down to sound bite you know, simplicity, as I believe the contract with America does, the logic of any tax cut plan may seem self-evident. Unfortunately, the real question isn't whether we cut taxes, it's how we do it and on whose backs. And that is where the rhetoric of the Republican proposal clashes with reality. And that is why we need the opportunity to debate and vote upon the Democratic alternative that I will describe today. My objection to the Republican tax plan is simple and I believe irrefutable. It is nothing more than a package of giveaways to the wealthiest Americans and the special interests funded by making deep and dangerous cuts in programs that help children, pregnant women, the elderly, and hardworking middle-class families. In other words, the tax breaks go to those who don't really need the help at an enormous co cost to those who really need help. This issue may sound like a purely partisan charge, but listen to these facts. Nearly 80% of the capital gains tax cut goes to families who earn more than $100,000 a year. And almost 52% of the entire tax package benefits those earning more than $100,000 a year. And that is why 102 Republicans, including the chairman of this committee, have courageously broken ranks with their own leadership and urged a wholesale revision of this bill lowering the eligibility for the Republican child tax credit to those earning less than $95,000 a year. In my opinion, that's a worthy change, but I think it too is largely cosmetic. Since the child credit is a small part of the overall tax plan, the amount of the program that benefits the wealthiest Americans would drop from 52 to 51 percent, hardly a sea change. I believe we can do better economically and morally as well. To slant the benefits of the package so heavily toward the most privileged in our country is bad tax policy and an affront to the working families who have seen their incomes erode for 16 years. And to pay for the tax break with cuts on children and the elderly, I believe, adds insult to injury. America does not need an assault on school lunches, nutrition, for babies, summer jobs, and heat for low-income elderly to strengthen those at the top of the ladder. What we need is tax relief that's carefully targeted toward hard-working middle-income families and paid for in an affordable, sensible, and responsible way. That is why I'm presenting what I call the School Act, a democratic alternative to the Republican plan. It's based on a simple premise that rather than slashing programs for the young to line the pockets of wealthy interests, we should be strengthening our commitment to children and young people, especially in the crucial area of education. 100% of the benefits of this alternative go to families with adjusted gross incomes of less than $100,000 a year. Here's what the bill does. It lets us invest in our human capital 
by letting middle-income families deduct up to $10,000 a year in educational expenses every year. It lets students deduct interest payments on their student loans because an investment in education is an investment in America's future and we should reward it. The School Act expands individual retirement accounts so that millions more Americans can open them and it lets them be used for education. And it establishes a special new guaranteed education plan bond paid for by cutting government bureaucracy which lets families put aside as little as $25 a month to save as much as $16,000 for their children's education. I also urge you to pay special attention to an amendment proposed by Congressman Glenn Browder that says that no tax cut can become law unless we have a plan to balance the budget and pay for the tax cuts. Above and beyond the issue of an open rule, I believe this amendment deserves consideration because it is truly the kind of proposal that can gain broad bipartisan support. At a time when college costs are soaring past the rate of inflation and a time when leading corporations are posting record profits but household income is actually in decline, I believe this alternative makes great sense. I urge that you make this amendment in order and let this issue be decided on the merits. That's the only way we can make tax relief the serious solution that it needs to be and not just a cynical slogan that it sometimes becomes. I thank you for allowing me to be here this morning to present this alternative to you and uh, I hope that it can be put in order. One final note, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have this proposal here today in writing we are still getting some of the estimates of exactly how we pay for it and how much it costs. We may have some minor changes that we need to make to make sure that we have adequately paid for our proposal. And I would seek the ability to make some minor adjustments between now and probably the early part of next week when we will actually have to uh, bring this to the floor. So I would ask that we be given the flexibility to make some minor changes to make sure that our numbers work. <clears throat> well, as the uh, minority leader knows, uh, I personally have great, uh, great respect for you, Dick, and uh, uh, I appreciate your coming before us. I'm, I'm a little concerned uh, that uh, this is the first moment that we've had the opportunity to uh, to look at your your document. It is. Uh, 36 pages long. Uh, in uh, Mr. Uh, Gibbons was here earlier, and uh, uh, he did not know what was in your document, and uh, consequently, uh, it's going to take uh, some some consideration for us to go through your document and see uh, exactly what it does. Uh, just for example, I notice on page two of your testimony. Uh, you talk about the uh, guaranteed educational plan bond paid for by cutting government bureaucracy and uh, that's what I've been working on as you know for a long time but uh, in that specific instance how do you how do you cut the government bureaucracy essentially in, in that program essentially is that, is that spelled out in here in it is program? but there are some again I would like to retain enough flexibility so that we can make any changes we would have to make once we have a final estimate on what our tax changes cost and what we have to pick up in spending cuts in order to pay for it generally what we've tried to accomplish is a freeze on discretionary to 95 levels which when combined with a few other uh, cuts that we make should get us to the 24 to 27 billion dollars over five years that we believe our tax bill does cost. Uh, it is it is because we're not sure of our figures that we would like to be able to before Tuesday or Monday of next week be able to make some final changes so that we know our math works. I don't want to come to the floor with a tax cut proposal that is not paid for and that I can't vouch for. Well, you know, in the, uh, <clears throat> in the bills that are before us that are now combined into one bill, as you know, um, it does require waivers of, uh, of various rules. 
and I would just want to make sure that uh, that your substitute doesn't require further waivers. In other words, it'd be germane, you know, to the issue. Uh, that's true, of course, of um, if you were going to have a the motion to recommit uh, with instructions, uh, that has to stay within the parameters of the germaneness of the bill, and we would hope that that your your substitute would as well. And you need to get back to us as soon as you possibly can. Uh, and let us know where we stand on that issue. We will. So that we could, uh, we do not intend to put out a rule on this today, uh, nor tomorrow. We will hold it over the weekend so that we can consult with you and uh, other members of your party uh, as to uh, what action we would take. I thank you. But the uh, we understand we'll why be you're back here. As quickly and, uh, as we can. We appreciate your coming. Mr. Uh, Quillen, do you have any questions of the minority yes, leader? Yes, I'd like to ask one question. I heard. Uh, well, the rumor mill that your substitute was going to contain an amendment opposed to the uh, increase in the retirement pay for government employees. Does it or does it not? Uh, we have not uh, finally concluded what cuts. As I said, there may be additional spending cut features that we have to put in here to reach our figures. So there may be something on the retirement programs. We haven't had to finally decide that. Would the gentleman yield? Yeah. Uh, is, Mr. Kephart, are you, are you saying that, uh, that that issue is not dealt with in, in the document that we have here now? It, it is not in it that not. document. It may be added in some sense because we may have to pick up more money to pay for the program. If you do not need to pick up more money, it will not be in the document? Is that what you're saying? The, the, what you're requesting is that we allow you the time to, to add additional spending cuts, but you, you aren't going to substitute or change what's in here now. What, what I've generally tried to do, just so you know conceptually what I've been trying to figure out, is to use a freeze at 95 levels as the main part of my cuts. I think that comes to about $20 billion over five years. And then I've got to add some more to get up to the number that I've got to produce. And we're looking at a, a number of different ideas to get that extra revenue. Thank you, gentlemen. I certainly don't think you should have that riding on the back of federal employees making them pay more. I understand. If the gentleman will yield, I, um, as I understood the, the bill the way it now sits as it comes out of the committees, it does have a change in federal retirement that affects all federal employees it, as well as uh, members of Congress and, and uh, higher paid federal officials. It does, but I... I'd like to see a separate vote on that in its entirety, not not grouped in a separate. I understand. I understand. Let me ask the chairman, uh, without putting him on, on the spot, do you think it would be possible to have a separate vote on that particular provision in the, in the, in the master bill? If the gentleman H wanted to... H.R. 1327. Uh, if the gentleman wanted to uh, submit an amendment uh, suggestion to this committee, we would certainly, as the gentleman knows, take it under consideration. There is no provision for it right now. There is no pending amendment, and no one has testified uh, uh, to that point. And that's why you were asking the minority leader uh, if there were, uh, if, if his was going to deal with it. And uh, evidently it's not. Even if his does, he might have some other provisions that I couldn't vote for. I'd just like to have an up or down vote on the, on the matter itself. Well, then the so gentleman I will have an amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Moakley. Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Quillen, I'm sure that somebody will give you a heads up if there's anything in there about your pension or my pension or anybody else's well, I pension. Care. I don't care about my pension. Oh, no, you don't? Well, let's uh, put back in then. Since I'm 19 years old, it won't matter. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I, I, I uh, appreciate the presentation today, and I'm waiting till you get the fine figures in there so we can just see exactly how much money we do have to come up with. But I, I think uh, school uh, is very important. 
there? School lunches? I, I don't know if, did you leave any in there? Uh, anyway, we, uh, I think that schools need to be corrected and more people should have the right the ability to go to school and so I think this works right into the overall picture that I see. I thank the gentleman. Thank Mr. Goss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I want to make sure that I understood and we're all on the same wavelength. Mr. Gebhardt has asked us for an open rule, uh, as I understand it, plus some flexibility uh, or latitude to fill out some numbers uh, on this version uh, between That's now correct. and the time we get together to pull a rule together. And uh, are not, you're not asking any further uh, concerns, uh, waivers, or protection against points of order. Is that correct or not? That's my understanding. I may need to consult with my trusty staff. We'll consult with the staff. I don't know of any that we're asking for that are different or unusual. I, I, I'm not trying to pin that down. I just wanted that's, to know if that was in the range of things. That's not in my mind. Okay. Would the gentleman yield? Uh, certainly. Did I hear the, the gentleman say that, that our good friend Mr. Gephardt asked for an open rule? I, I came in uh, a, a minute or two late, uh, but uh, is that I correct? did. That was in the an early part of my statement. I asked for an open rule and for the right to bring up this substitute. Well, Mr. Gephardt, um, you know, I've sat here for years and uh, heard you uh, uh, beg us not to open up the U.S. tax code to an open rule, and that really surprises me. But I respect the wisdom of this great committee. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Moakley. Uh, the gentleman has the time. I, of course, yield to the distinguished uh, ranking member. Actually, as I get it, uh, Mr. Gephardt, you, you're going to ask for the same waive as that the original bill has? Yes. Sorry. So no different. But no further waivers. That was my point to the yeah. uh, to minority leader. That's correct. Uh, reclaiming my time, if I may, I, uh, I think every uh, consideration should be given and every uh, possible uh, opportunity to, to deal with uh, this very difficult issue because we are going to make an order Democrat substitute. What that is going to be, we're That's all interested in. We've just received, uh, at least I've just received, I don't know whether anybody else got it, uh, the document to which you've testified. I have no idea whether it has any of the matters that are interest uh, to me and my constituency regarding the seniors particularly and the rollback of the, the uh, Social Security tax and the earnings test limitation. I don't know if that would fit into a school act or not. Um, but uh, I think that is a matter of very great concern and we will uh, be pleased to use the time to review this. I, I do want to, uh, despite my high esteem, say that I, I don't think that we ought to be offering uh, the idea of a sort of this is a credit card for the next four or five days. And I'm very serious about that because we've had a number of suggested democratic uh, programs that we're going to deal with. I think President Clinton has sent one up and we've spent some time looking at that. I believe you yourself have authored one. We've spent some time looking at that. Uh, I've told there's going to be another one. I gather this is it. Uh, and, and what I hope is that when we've invested the time in this and completed this, that this will be very close to what the final product of the, the preferred democratic substitute will be. Can the gentleman give me that? Let issue? me assure the gentleman that there is no effort here to add Good. items <laughs> to this to cut taxes. I, I do not want to get into a bidding war. I do not want to add tax provisions to this. What you see on the tax side is what we want to do. The only reason I'm asking for any flexibility is I want to make sure the numbers work and I don't want to be out there with a bill that's off in I, terms of its ability to pay for what we're asking to do. I think that's entirely uh, reasonable uh, and uh, I certainly would respect that. With regard to the uh, distinguished minority leader's uh, comments about uh, the courageous uh, chairman uh, who broke ranks with the leadership to sign the letter. Uh, I, I didn't hear that either. I, well, I better not be late I anymore. was throwing bouquets at you, Mr. I, I agree that the, uh, the chairman is very courageous, and I think the others of us who also associated <laughs> ourselves and signed that letter were not trying to break ranks with anybody. What we were trying to do is to say this is a complicated subject and we have some preferences that deserve some consideration. And I think that that is a fair characterization of what has happened. We've had testimony on that. And I suspect we will look at that uh, request the same as we will look at your request fairly and honorably as we go ahead in the days ahead. But I appreciate the gentleman's observation about our courage. Thank you. Mr. Bielenson. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We appreciate the gentleman's coming up to testify. I would like to say to our, to our chairman, who was not here just for a couple of minutes at, at the outset of the gentleman's testimony, uh, I think it's fair to say that Mr. Gephardt was only trying to be fair when he, he was asking for a rule to make an order his own substitute, so he thought he should ask for an open rule in case anybody else had suggestions you know, for, or amendments, because he didn't want to just speak on behalf of his own. I think that was the, the thrust of his, of his testimony. I would only say to, to our friend from Missouri that many of us remain concerned about any kind of tax cuts of whatever size. However, if there is to be one, I do think that the one the gentleman suggests is, is one which is properly targeted, which costs a good deal less than the one that's included in the base bill. And I do hope, Mr. Chairman, that we're able to make it in order. Thank the gentleman. Judge Price. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Leader, um, <coughs> along Mr. Goss's line of questioning, uh, are we to understand that you want your substitute to be open to amendment? No. By an open rule, what I was suggesting was that there be an open rule that any number of substitutes be brought up. I do think, as I thought on the welfare bill, that having holistic substitutes makes sense. And as I said, I, I would hope that there would not be amendments of substitutes so that we can get a up or down vote on ideas against ideas. Would the gentlelady yield on that Certainly, point? Certainly, yield. Just so that we're not overwhelmed further, you can see visibly the pile of matters we have before us on this. How would you control, how would you propose that we control the substitutes? Would we cut them off at some point, or are we going to accept substitutes from the floor under a true open rule? If the gentleman yield, I don't know what is being offered here today. I assume that there are other tax ideas, but I'm, I don't know whether they would constitute a complete substitute of ideas. And so I would, you know, I, I think you've got to look at the, the way the, the programs are brought forward. In other words, there may be members coming in with a singular idea of one particular tax to cut or one preference to take out of the code. That may or may not constitute a sub an entire substitute for the bill that's come out of the committee. Uh, if the gentlelady would continue to yield. So what you're really asking for is an open rule for holistic substitutes. That's the way we've usually done tax bills. Right. Thank you for the clarification. Okay, and, and one uh, additional question, Mr. Leader. Do you have a, in your own mind an idea of when you might be able to make this as complete a product as it will be? Uh, do you know when the final touches will be placed upon it? Just so if we know the gentlelady would yield. The, the Joint Tax Committee got all of our information finally this morning, and it just it depends on how long it takes them to come up with a proper estimate so we can then fix the spending side. I would hope it could happen by the end of the week. Okay. All right. I have nothing further. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank if you. I can add one other comment to uh, the gentleman from Florida. Um, I, I don't want to uh, uh, include in my comment that, uh, that, that it's a holistic substitute, the Browder Amendment. Uh, we've included the Browder Amendment in this substitute. But it is the kind of amendment that I believe affects any substitute that's out there because it goes to the question of when the tax law gets changed and if it stays changed and links it, of course, to the activity on the balanced budget. And I think it's an amendment that could be included on any substitute. Uh, responding, if I may, uh, I'm not sure whose time I on, but uh, the problem, I, re I respect exactly what you're saying. That's a very difficult management problem for us. We've got a lot of judgments to make. We've got several pages of such judgments to make of what should or shouldn't apply. And, and I guess my comment would be it, it's not really entirely an open rule as we are defining it that uh, the gentleman is calling for, as, as you did in your open remarks, uh, your first opening statement. I mean, a true open rule, now that we've clarified a little further, we're trying to get down to whole substitutes, and then whole substitutes that are amendable with reasonable amendments. That is a managed rule, a structured rule, and we do those kinds of rules. I think the tradition of this committee has to be very, very careful uh, because of the tax code, as the chairman has already referred. Um, uh, but I suggest that, that what the distinguished minority leader is asking for is not truly an open rule. Perhaps in the classic definition. 
Well, that is yet another definition. <laughs> I think we we'll yield on this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. There's a definition in the Roll Call magazine on what are open and what are closed rules. Maybe that's one of the definitions. I just uh, make note that uh, even though we did not require or, or advertise for amendments, although I understand you did write a letter uh, asking for amendments, that uh, we have been deluged with uh, with uh, amendments uh, uh, just out of the blue here today. I think there's a list you have there of some 30 or so, and we have another 10 or 12. And uh, uh, I'm just afraid that if uh, under an open rule, we would uh, we would be in trouble. But uh, let me yield to Mr. Hall. I don't think you've had a question, uh, time to ask questions, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just like to ask uh, Mr. Gephardt. Now, your substitute is strictly a, a middle class tax cut. It, it is aimed at uh, people actually $85,000 a year and under for a family. Um, uh, the, probably the more accurate definition of it is adjusted gross income for a family, which is a little bit different, of 100 and under, $100,000 a year and under. No one over $100,000 of adjusted gross income would get any tax relief under my approach. I particularly like the fact that you're giving incentives for investment in higher education. I, I haven't read the whole substitute, but that looks like it's a major portion of your bill. Is that correct? The basic idea is to try to encourage savings and investment by middle-income families in education and training. It includes vocational training and other kinds of training uh, that we that we have out there. It's not limited to college in the traditional college setting. Good. I thank the gentleman. Mr. McGinnis. Mr. McGinnis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Gephardt, I would just reemphasize the point made by Mr. Goss, and that is that I don't believe either that the chairman of the committee broke ranks uh, with uh, leadership by signing that letter. I think that letter was a good indication of another issue that needed to be discussed. Let me ask you on, because I'm trying to put together uh, what your bill says here. Uh, you were very specific in your demands with the Republicans when the balanced budget came up about being specific on where they came up with the revenue or where they were going to come up with the cuts. Is, so far what I've heard from you is your bill is going to be paid for by a freeze in discretionary funds. What we are suggesting and what you have in front of you is a lowering of the caps in the discretionary area. And we further suggest, uh, as I understand your bill does, exactly specifically how those caps could be reached, what cuts in what areas would be needed to reach those caps. Uh, what I am striving for conceptually is to, in effect, lower the caps to achieve a freeze in discretionary at 95 levels. I believe, although we don't know yet, that that will yield about $20 billion over five years. So we've got to add a few other specific cuts to that in order to achieve the amount of money we need to hit the revenue loss that Joint Tax Committee comes up with. And is it safe to assume that you will be very specific on yes. exactly where these freezes and spending cuts will take place before we vote on this rules committee? Yes. Okay. And then the, uh, Mr. Chairman, the, the other point um, that I wanted to ask about is this adjusted gross income of $100,000. Uh, now, what the average person on the street thinks when we talk about income is how much they make every year. So clearly that this would apply to people who are pretty wealthy in our society, people who make in excess of $100,000 a year, but because of deductions and so on, get to drop down to an adjusted gross income of $100,000 or lower. Is that correct? As you know, the way you have to write a tax provision is uh, you begin to phase it out at a certain level. We begin to phase it out at $85,000 for a family. Uh, I think it's safe to say that there won't be many people, if any, who are making above $100,000 who will get any benefit out of this at all, or very little benefit. What's, where's the, in the bill, tell me where the phase out is between $85,000 of gross in, adjusted gross income and $100,000 of adjusted gross income. For a family. 
We start the phase out at 50,000 for an individual and 75,000 in the case of a joint return. Okay, but then, but where's the, you said the real difference takes place between the 85 and the 100. Maybe you can help me. Are, Maybe I misspoke, really it's 50? 75. So, so the 100 is adjusted, uh, is, is joint adjusted gross income, not I was using, individually. Yeah, I was using okay. AGI. Just, our belief is that no one who has in excess of 100000 in adjusted gross income will get one cent of tax relief. That's right. But again, back to my original point that, that people with the adjusted income, uh, joint income of $100,000 a year, actually in the terms that the people on the street understand, uh, their gross income, not adjusted gross income, but gross income is usually well in excess of $100,000. So people that make $125,000 a year in their family could become eligible for this with their house deduction that may drop them to an adjusted income of $100,000. Yeah, yeah. Um, you could be literally right that there could be some small amount that would go to a family. But when you start phasing out at $75,000 in gross income. There aren't going to be many people with adjusted gross income above 100 who get much of anything, unlike your bill where 51 percent of the benefits go to people who earn $100,000 a year or more. No further questions, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Gebhardt, I just want to uh, make one observation, and that is that uh, in freezing discretionary spending at 95 levels, uh, what you are doing is similar to what uh, we've been doing right along. And I wish my good friend Joe Moakley were here because um, he, is, uh, he keeps uh, espousing uh, the fact that uh, we, we are cutting school lunch programs when, in effect, we are simply reducing the rate of growth. And that's exactly what you're doing uh, in the child nutrition programs such as WIC, in Head Start programs, which I happen to like. You are freezing those uh, discretionary spending at 95 levels. So I just want to say that you're doing what we're doing, and uh, uh, for the record, I wanted that to I wanted Mr. Bielens to understand that. I would just say to the gentleman that when you're trying to find 27 billion dollars in savings, it's a lot different than 188 billion dollars in savings, and I believe we can avoid some of the egregious changes that the majority is trying to make in very good programs like the school lunch program. We thank the gentleman for coming. <laughs> thank you. The uh, next, uh, next scheduled witnesses are uh, uh, Mr. Colby of Arizona and Mr. Nolenberg of Michigan. Welcome to the committee, gentlemen. Thank you. Feel free to summarize and your entire statement will appear in the record uh, without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My statement uh, will be submitted for the record. Uh, let me uh, summarize very briefly. Ours is one of those amendments, those freestanding amendments that you were talking about here earlier and, and what kind of a rule you would uh, you would apply, I realize uh, that causes some difficulty for us. Is this us. amendment in your name or Mr. Nolenberg? Yeah, it, it's both. both. Okay. I believe you're having both names here. Um, we, ours is, what we call ours is the choice in welfare. Let me just, I'm going to describe briefly how it works and Mr. Nolenberg is going to describe how it's paid for. What we are doing is trying to go one step beyond where the welfare legislation that we passed recently would go by privatizing, if you will, some of the welfare decisions. We would allow taxpayers to contribute up to $100 to any qualified private charity that's engaged in anti-poverty relief efforts, and in return they would get a dollar-for-dollar dollar tax credit off their liability. They can make the charitable contribution any time up until they file a tax return, very much like an IRA now where you have up until April 15th of the following year to make it. Any contributions above that limit would, of course, be tax deductible as they are now. To be eligible, charitable organizations have to engage in activities that aim at assisting individuals who earn 150 percent of the poverty line or below that as defined by OMB. They have to spend 70 percent of their funds directly on services to the poor. No more than 30 percent of their aggregate expenses could be spent on administration, lobbying, fundraising, or litigation. They would have to obtain their state tax-exempt status. They would have to file an annual IRS Form 990 provide copies to the public upon request. We estimate the, the bottom line of what we're trying to do, Mr. Chairman, is to, instead of having the federal government take money out of the taxpayer's pocket, take it to Washington and send it back 
to agencies in the state. We're trying to go beyond the block grant to say let individuals make decisions about what agencies are best in terms of providing services. That's the, the bottom line of what we're trying to do. The speaker, I might add, is extremely enthusiastic about this proposal. We might, we estimate that it would add a cost about 15 to 20 billion dollars over five years and it would be offset by a change in the earned income tax credit that was a change in the 1993 OBRA and my colleague will describe that uh, very shortly here. Uh, our amendment will give people the that pay the bills and provide the services in the community a role in how poverty relief efforts are structured. If states can administer welfare programs, shouldn't it follow that individual citizens ought to know something even better about which programs work in a community? Let me just quote one thing that Robert Woodson, president of the National Center for Neighborhood Enterprise, recently wrote in the Wall Street Journal, talking about our, our bill. Not only does this provision, the tax credit provision, respond to a desire by citizens to wrest decision-making authority from the government's grip, but more important, it breaks the monopoly of public sector service programs. At last, they will be forced to compete with the thousands of grassroots organizations that have, with meager resources, established track records of remarkable success in addressing problems that professionals have deemed intractable and in changing the lives of individuals who the experts considered incorrigible. We think the private charities, so that's un unquote, Mr. Chairman, we think private charities' view of assistance as a tool by which to change behavior it's not a right nor a way of life, and we think that's what we need to get back to in, our, uh, in, in considering where we go with welfare. It's an appropriate amendment to the tax code because it does change the tax code in terms of how we would pay for it, and it fundamentally changes the way we collect and direct tax dollars. And I hope that the, our amendment can be uh, considered for consideration. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Nolenberg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and um, members of the Rules Committee. Um, while my colleague focused pretty much on the tax credit provisions, I'd like to focus on the amendment's funding mechanism. Just last week, we passed the Personal Responsibility Act, which reforms most of the federal government's social welfare programs, programs including AFDC, food stamps, SSI, and so forth. However, there's one program thus far that's escaped the eye of reformers, and that's the Earned Income Tax Credit. The EITC is different from other welfare programs in that it supplements, as the name implies, earned income. Thank you. It was originally created in 1975 as a temporary measure to offset the regressivity of the Social Security payroll tax, but since that time, and it's, a, it's been expanded several times, and most recently in the 1993 Clinton tax bill, it's become a full-fledged income transfer program. We, can, uh, we seek to scale the EITC back to a more manageable pre-1993 level and then reroute those savings back into the same communities but not through cash payments, rather through an infusion of capital into community-run, local, non-profit, poverty-fighting charities. While the EITC has in the past received praise from both sides of the aisle, it is more in common, it has more in common, rather, with traditional welfare programs and first meets the eye. It is the fastest growing social welfare program on the federal government's books. In 1989, the refundable portion cost us five billion. Last year it cost $10 billion. Next year is projected to cost $20 billion. The refundable portion provides cash benefits that in some cases can exceed $3,000 per wage earner. The EITC creates probably the stiffest marriage penalty in the tax code. An unmarried couple with two children and $11,000 in income each would lose $5,686 in EITC, EITC benefits if they married. The EITC is fraud prone. Con artists have found the credit when combined with electronic filing and refund anticipation loans is a powerful tool for ripping off the taxpayers. In fact, thousands of taxpayer refunds are presently being delayed while the IRS grapples with this problem. But the most disturbing aspect probably of the current EITC is that it acts as a very harsh disincentive to work. During the credits phase-out period, most families lose, and this is a correction from my submitted testimony, they lose 20 cents in benefits for every dollar additional that they earn. Once a family begins to pay taxes, the marginal rate can easily top 50%. And finally, if an EITC family lives in public housing, housing and or receives other means-tested benefits, they could actually find themselves in a marginal tax bracket exceeding 100%. In fact, a 1973 study 
GAO study, which documents the EITC's anti-work bias in great detail, found that the average EITC recipient works only 1,300 hours a year compared to an average of 2,000 hours for the, the average individual. We don't think the EITC should be eliminated. Rather, we believe that it should be reformed so that it serves the original purpose. Progressivity at the lower end of the tax code is a very laudable goal, but we can't afford to ignore the negative side effects. Cash payments, work disincentives, marriage penalties, and fraud. These are all the things that have helped create the current welfare crisis. And in contrast, community self-help, local nonprofit, poverty-fighting charities represent, I think, the future of welfare reform. In a nutshell, that's what our amendment, amendment seeks to do, to move away from the failed policies of the last 30 years and towards proven poverty-fighting methods. We uh, very respectfully urge you to make our amendment in order under the rule. But thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. That was a very clear and logical presentation, and I appreciate the balance of uh, the way you've done it and explaining it to us and how you pay for it. Uh, I had two quick questions. Um, one is, what made you pick $100? Is there a magic in that area? Um, and we think that um, you could have started, and we did, with a larger number. But $100 seems to be a very, very modest approach, a very modest way to get the, the, this whole idea in track. Obviously, uh, it could be phased in uh, in a fashion where it would raise annually. But the point is we wanted to make it very modest initially so that we could at least uh, sell the concept because we think it's a very credible and worthwhile concept. And I the, might, could I please, just add Mr. to that? Uh, uh, as, he, as Mr. Nolenberg pointed out, it's, uh, it is very modest. When you consider that we spend well over $100 billion a year at the federal level on all uh, welfare kinds of pover or poverty kinds of programs, including health care, housing, <coughs> cash supplements, and so forth. This is a very small amount. But one could argue that it's a, a foot in the door for the concept of privatizing welfare. As Bob Woodson has pointed out, you create an army of 100 million or more taxpayers out there that have this each year and have a vested interest in the kind of co decisions they're making about where their money is going to help fight uh, poverty to uh, help those to low-income people. I, and, I and completely an agree with the concept, and uh, I think it probably is a good way to begin the program. I was just curious whether there was some magic in the hundred dollars. The second question was the way our uh, instruction sheet uh, provided listed this amendment. It was per wage earner. Uh, that means a given family might have one or two or three or Correct. four or five wage earners. So on a per family basis, this. Uh, this could actually amount to a very significant and attractive amount of money in terms of their tax. That's correct. We decided we didn't want to put the marriage penalty on the contributions to poverty uh, in, in the bill. I think that's very good. Mr. Bielinson? Uh, Mr. Chairman? No, go right ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, very much. Thank we you, will uh, give you. it consideration. I think it's a very interesting thought. The uh, next uh, scheduled panel is uh, Mrs. Cardis Collins, uh, accompanied by Mrs. Connie Morella, Jim Moran, Tom Davis, Frank Wolf, and Stenny Hoyer. If uh, who is the uh, where's the lead? Uh, oh, here she is. Uh, Cardis, come on up. There you are. My my former next door neighbor. That's right. Uh, you want us to sit in the front row here? We'd like you to all to uh, pull up chairs. Uh, you need access to the microphone. That's why you need to come up. Uh, okay. Okay. Mrs. Collins, while uh, other members are coming up to the table, uh, please feel free to all of you to summarize. Your entire statement will appear in the record without objection, and uh, but uh, feel free to take what time is necessary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, I appear before you, and we've appeared before you today to urge you not to make in order any provision that would revise civil service retirement laws in order to pay for the tax cut bill that's before you. On March 15th, Chairman Klinger attempted to mark up H.R. 1185, and that was a bill that added 2.5% on federal employees' income and would have reduced pension benefits by moving the period for calculating benefits from the highest three years of salary to the highest five. 
The markup was suspended indefinitely when the chairman recognized that the votes just weren't there for such a measure. There were five or six good reasons why members on both sides of the aisle were not willing to grab more than $11 billion from federal employees in order to pay for a tax cut, and I'm going to briefly list them. The first was that there has been not been any budget resolution. Under normal circumstances, the Congress would first establish a federal budget. At that stage, it could determine whether the reductions in the federal retirement program were appropriate. However, in this case, the Republican leadership arbitrarily told the committee to come up with the cuts of $12 billion. Secondly, there had been no testimony uh, on the Government Reform and Oversight Committee to justify the modifications of the program. In fact, there were only two hearings on the issue. The first, which was held prior to the introduction of the bill, brought employee unions to testify, and they opposed the changes. The second, at which the GAO testified that the pension system for federal employees was comparable to private plans, dealt primarily with those pensions of members of Congress. The third reason is that there was no consensus that the federal retirement system needs fixing. For example, a memorandum from the Congressional Research Service responded to two questions as follows. I'm, I'm quoting now. First, is the unfunded liability of the civil service retirement system a problem that needs to be fixed to avoid steep increases in outlays from the Treasury or increases in the deficit? Second, is the system now insolvent or will it become insolvent in the future? The answer to both of these questions is no, end quote. The fourth reason is that there were strong sentiments on both sides of the aisle that any changes in the federal retirement program should not be used to pay for a tax cut. It should be apparent to all the members on this committee that this money cannot be double counted. If the purpose of the 2.5% tax hike on federal employees is to reduce unfunded liability of the program, then the funds cannot also be used to pay for a tax cut. While a budget scorekeeping rules may allow for such a result, common sense just doesn't. Finally, perhaps more importantly, members of our committee on both sides of the aisle spoke eloquently of a contract with federal employees that transcends any contract with America. When the Congress passed the civil service reforms in 1986, we put the new FERS system on a self-sustaining basis and provided for a memorandum for making good on the liabilities of the old system. We gave employees a one-time election to choose the federal employees retirement uh, system or the civil service retirement system, and we promised them the rules of the game would not be changed. This legislation would in fact break our promise, the promise upon which they relied for uh, planning of their future well-being. At the end of the markup, Chairman Klinger offered to work with Democrats on a bipartisan basis on civil service matters, and Ms. Moran and I, uh, Ms. Moran was a ranking member of the Civil Service Committee, and I readily agreed. We recommended further hearings on this subject and are willing to explore other ways to review this issue. However, to date, the, the efforts to attack the civil service retirement problem uh, or program have been strictly partisan. The decision to take $12 billion from the program was made solely by the majority for the purpose of funding those tax cuts. Mr. Chairman, I believe you would be creating a very bad precedent if you allowed changes to the federal retirement system to go to the floor when the authorizing committee has not completed its action. This is not the same situation as a reconciliation bill where the Congress has previously voted for a budget resolution that included reconciliation instructions. In such case, the Congress would vote to authorize the Budget Committee to report the necessary legislation if the authorizing committee had failed to act and the Congress had voted that budget re reductions in a particular area were justified. In this case, however, there has been no such vote to tamper with the federal retirement system, nor has Congress voted to authorize the Budget Committee to act. If the rule nevertheless should include revisions to, re to the retirement system, it should also permit amendments to that provision. However, I respectfully urge this committee not to allow these provisions to come to the floor without the approval of the authorizing committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your generosity of time. Well, before uh, calling the next witness, uh, you do know that the um, that this measure has been folded into the bill, which is before us. And I was just going through the amendments. I don't see an amendment in any of your names. Uh, there's an amendment that Mr. Moran is going to offer. There is. Yes. Is, is this amendment on this list? To Title IV. So we haven't seen it. Okay. Do you have a copy of it uh, handy? 
we don't seem right. to have it. Uh, here, right there. Who is going to be the next person? Right here. Pass it out. Uh, Mr. Moran, are you the next spokesman? Well, that's fine. Mr. I, Mr. I, Moran of Virginia. To, to uh, proceed, Mr. Chairman. Uh, hmm? you want to, Frank, do you want to go uh, next? I don't want to go All right. Time is of the SO. Alphonse Gaston. Uh, it should not be uh, any surprise that uh, we all strongly support. Uh, including this provision in the uh, uh, in the bill before you, Mr. Chairman, because it is ill-conceived, ill-advised. On March 15th, the committee with jurisdiction over this legislation uh, rejected the very approach that is being considered today. We had about four hours of debate, and the people that were most familiar with it chose not to report the Federal Retirement Reform Act out of committee. And yet that is what is in the bill before you today. Uh, the um, uh, added to uh, tax cut legislation, which uh, has um, in a way that we have not seen, we haven't seen this, uh, uh, the wording of this, and uh, the committee specifically rejected it. Now you compare what you have before you with the dramatic changes that it causes with the last time that the Congress reviewed the federal pension system. In 1984, Congress undertook a two-year effort uh, to review the entire federal retirement system. And it was a bipartisan effort. Uh, Senator Stevens uh, was one of the most uh, influential leaders on it. Uh, we reached a consensus that we would create a new retirement system that had no unfunded liability. It was not overly generous. It was pattern on what exists in the private sector, and it was based upon the retiree's Social Security pension, as is most private retirement pensions. We closed the civil service retirement system at that time. That was the system that was underfunded. Uh, and when we gave every federal employee the option to stay in the old system or to get into the new system. And what is terribly important that we all recognize is that at the time of giving every federal employee that option, what system to go into, we told them this is the last time we are going to change the federal retirement system. We will not meddle with your retirement programs again, and there will be no future increase in employee contributions. That's probably the most egregious aspect of this because it goes back on a commitment that the federal government made to its employees. There is a, a suggestion that we have a unfunded liability that is more than we can handle. The fact is we can handle it. Last year, the unfunded liability in the civil service retirement system, which is being phased out, was reduced by $60 billion. We paid off $60 billion towards the unfunded liability. We are currently bringing in $63 billion a year, and we're paying out $36 billion. All of this was anticipated. This is exactly what was expected to happen, and it has been happening. There is no reason that it needs to be fixed. And in fact, uh, one of the arguments is that we ought to look at what the, the uh, private corporations do for their employees. 95% of private corporations uh, don't require their employees to contribute to the retirement system. We do require every federal employee to re contribute uh, to our retirement system. Uh, and, and as I say, it is not overly generous. It is wholly consistent with what you would, ex would expect in the um, private sector. Uh, in, and in fact, if you take the cost of the system on an annual basis, uh, it has gone down from 14% of payroll, which is what it was in 1969, down to between 10 and 12% of payroll. So if we were going to do anything with the federal retirement system, we should reduce the employee's contribution because our assumptions uh, have declined because we haven't paid full cost of living increases and the like. Uh, and if you, uh, if you consider it on 
an alternative basis, which is a basis that looks at locality pay and COLAs and all of those other things that have happened in the meantime that can't possibly be predicted, it's actually gone down from 37% of payroll down to 25% of payroll. I won't get into all the minutiae, uh, but the, the, the point is that uh, there is a very strong argument for reducing federal employees' required contributions, certainly not increasing them as this bill would do. Uh, you know, we, ha we are the, the country's largest employer. We have two million employees, and just as with any private firm, we have a responsibility to contribute to uh, their health, uh, to their retirement plans, uh, and, and we do that. We, it would be nice to be a, a model employer. That's what was originally intended back in 1984 when we took on this system. Let's see how we can do this to be fiscally responsible and to be a model employer. We, we want a system that recruits new employees, recruits the best, the brightest, and also gives us the flexibility to encourage older uh, uh, senior employees uh, who get paid the highest to leave. All of this is built into the system that we have. And yet, what we would be doing now is not reforming the federal retirement system. Uh, we would be creating a, uh, what essentially is an unfunded liability on federal em employees. We would be making a system that is far less equitable, uh, that has not been adequately considered, and is a 2.5% tax increase on federal employees in order to finance a tax reduction on other uh, American employees. Uh, that is so uh, profoundly unfair, Mr. Chairman, I'm sure you would agree. Uh, and I think it is also significant that not a single member of the Government Reform Committee is here to speak in support of including this provision in the tax cut legislation. No member of the Civil Service Subcommittee uh, has ever voted on this provision. No member of the Government Reform Committee that is, has jurisdiction over it has never voted on this provision. Uh, Mrs. Collins, the ranking minority member of the committee, has never seen it. Uh, Mr. Wolf and uh, uh, Mr. Davis represent huge numbers of federal employees, as does uh, Mrs. Morella, who was on the committee. They've never seen uh, the legislation. Uh, we haven't had a chance to consult with our constituents, more importantly with experts who, uh, uh, who have studied federal retirement plans and who really ought to have some input into this. So we strongly urge you, do not include this uh, provision in the tax cut bill. Give us, at least give the committee an opportunity to consider it in full, uh, to, to even be able to read the language. Uh, um, uh, our constituents deserve uh, uh, better than this, uh, those of us who have federal employees. But I think it sets a terribly uh, unsettling precedent for, for uh, every American taxpayer to, uh, to change the retirement system for two million people with so little uh, consideration and so, uh, so little uh, uh, reason to do so. so I, uh, we feel very strongly about this, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Davis is in the D.C. Committee. He would be here otherwise, but you can see that we are all united in a bipartisan way. Thank you. Mr. Wolf. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I wanted to make a comment that Mr. Davis can't be here. Because uh, please he use the mic. Thank you. I, I will be brief because I know the other things have been covered, and I'll kind of come at it from a different point of, point of view. I want to vote for the tax cut. I signed the contract for America. When we signed the contract for America, this provision wasn't in there. This really isn't necessary to, to pay for that. This really puts members like me who believe very deeply. I had the bill last year that increased the personal exemption. Uh, uh, we had 200 and some co-sponsors, and we were ready to pass it down. Either take this out because it is actually a tax increase. It's, it's actually a tax increase for these FBI agents, Secret Service agents, DE agents, and, and people like people like like that. A person making thirty thousand dollars a year will pay an extra seven hundred and fifty dollars in to this this program. So I would ask you to one one of two things. We're in a different position. Some members here probably won't vote for the tax cut. I want to vote for the tax cut. I believe in it. I think it's very very important. 
but it really puts me in a very difficult spot. So I would ask you to do one or one of two things: either remove it from the bill, because believe me, it is it is not fair. This group has been hit time <coughs> after time after time, all through the 80s. Every time the budget committee looks, this is the one group they come. If that's not done, if it's not re removed, then allow the amendment to be made in order where this issue can be debated on the floor and the Congress work its will. Again, it is not needed to pay. It is not needed to pay for the con contract. There is about a $90 billion plus advantage. And so I would just ask you either take it out, which would be preferable, or if you can't do that, allow there to be a vote on the floor. Because those of us who want this bill to pass, I want the tax cut to pass, are put in a very, very difficult position. And this was not in the contract for a month. Before yielding to the next speaker, would, uh, Frank, would you just uh, cover that again? You said someone with an income of 30000 Somebody, an average federal employee earning $30,000 annually, the proposal will impose an additional $750 a, a year for them. It, it will cost them, but they will have to pay in to an their additional $750. And and what about if, if you double the salary, $60,000, what, what would that result in? Well, I guess it would be a, a lot higher, yes. If you get a GS-15 or a senior FBI agent, it would be a lot more. Be a lot more. The gentleman would yield it increases the contribution requirement from seven to nine and a half percent. It was nine and a half percent of the seven. Yeah. So it would really hit the upper in incomes. But I took a thirty thousand dollar level because that's an average in income around the country. It will hurt these people he heavily. And there haven't been the hearings on it. Nobody really knew about it. I understand now the latest language even covers the postal service, which the last time I was told were were not involved. They go postal from three high retiring to now five high retiring. I just found that out late late last night. It's I, I think it ought to be taken out. Let the committee come back and look at it in a rational basis. Or if you're if you're locked into doing that, certainly give us those who I want this contract to pass. I mean I I stood on the front step. You're putting us and Tom Davis and people who want to vote for it in a very tough spot because this was this was not in there, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mrs. Morella. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee for allowing Turn us the opportunity to... Turn it off. Push the button. All right, thank you. Allowing us the opportunity to, to uh, discuss with you something we feel very strongly about. This is a tax reduction bill that's going to be coming before the Congress. And in this tax reduction bill, we are adding a tax increase. Uh, mention has been made by my colleagues about this 2.5% increase in it. and. Um, the comment was made about the fact that a, an employee making $30,000 a year would pay an additional $750. Look at the employee who starts off at $20,000. Even that employee will be paying $500 uh, more. We talk about a contract that we made in getting these issues before us on the floor. The contract we made with these federal employees is that their uh, pension system would be intact would have integrity and we would not be tampering with it. To tamper with it, to increase what they are going to pay for a tax cut just doesn't make any sense. And at a time that we are downsizing too, I mean I spoke to the Space Roundtable yesterday at the very day on the front page of the paper, 55,000 jobs, and this is the administration suggesting that. So that upon uh, the kinds of reductions to do this to our federal employees is, is just um, not going to not going to be profitable at all in terms of morale or productivity for instance federal uh, retirees are, are just not getting rich from their pensions as an example after 20 years of service the average federal employee can look forward to receiving an annual pension of twelve thousand seven hundred and seventy nine dollars after 30 years of service the average retiree will make a little bit more than $17,000. These are meager sums considering a lifetime commitment to public service. Um, I need not say anything more except that reiterating um, the fact that has been mentioned, if you can take it out, uh, it would be wonderful. If you cannot take it out, to at least allow the amendment to be, uh, to be allowed on the floor of the House. When we had it before the Government Reform Committee, it was given to us as something that was going to help to reduce the unfunded liability. That just isn't the case. When we find it coming up, it is not to reduce an unfunded liability. It is to bring in more revenue um, to begin with for a tax cut. 
I really think that as a, as a country, we would suffer if we allowed this to happen. So I add my voice to that of my colleagues asking for an amendment or to take it out. We haven't uh, necessarily saved the best till last, but uh, we would now recognize the articulate Mr. Hoyer of Maryland. Now, let's see what we can do. Let's see yeah. how we can work this thing out. Yeah. Jim, help us out. For the articulate Mr. Hoyer. I appreciate you, you may uh, summarize your articulate Mike. remarks if you care to. <laughs> you want to be briefly <laughs> articulate, is that correct? <laughs> I thank the chairman uh, for uh, his recognition. I thank the committee for this opportunity to appear before you. Uh, this is an issue of uh, great import, obviously, not just to two million people uh, on whom it will have a direct impact. It is an impact on the country and the quality of uh, persons they will be able to recruit and retain. Uh, quite clearly, uh, employees, uh, prospective or in being, count on the uh, employer's word uh, in terms of salary, uh, which changes from year to year, but in terms of their retirement, uh, towards which they are looking, uh, they rely that the employer will keep their word and maintain the level of benefits. Mr. Chairman, this is a relatively extraordinary procedure. It is not unheard of, obviously, as we all know, and as you know so well, having served on this committee for some period of time. On July 12, 1994, Mr. Klinger and Mr. Michael wrote to this committee. They wrote to this committee uh, with 15 of their colleagues from the committee expressing concern about bypassing the Committee on Government Operations in favor of direct action by the Rules Committee and on the floor. And the letter noted, and I'm quoting Mr. Klinger and Mr. Micah, we have yet to mark up and report out a single budget bill. Our members, both majority and minority alike, are missing the opportunity to put their knowledge to use, and the House is being denied the benefits of their expertise. Uh, they were advocating that the committee not be bypassed. That was, I believe, on a bill sponsored by Mr. Spratt and the bill didn't have the votes in committee. And they were being critical of that. I would uh, urge all of us, as we consider these matters uh, from time to time, to think of the principles we have enunciated in the past. Why is that principle uh, uh, raised? Enunciated in the past. Why is that principle uh, uh, raised? Because of the fact, as Mr. Moran and the others have mentioned, this is a very, very substantial action to take with respect to our personnel system, period. Because it is a substantial impact on our employees, it is worthy of considered consideration. There was one hearing on this bill, uh, actually two hearings, uh, relatively brief, uh, and after the second hearing, uh, there was a markup scheduled for four days later. That markup was canceled because the votes were not there to pass the legislation. The votes would have been there if all of the majority party had been for it, but there were substantial concerns. Not just, I would tell you, among those of us who live in the Washington metropolitan area. And I would say to, the, to, to those of you who do not live in the Washington metropolitan area, there are 360,000 of the 2 million federal employees who live in this area. That means that 1.6 million plus live in other areas of the country, all over the country. Mr. Chairman, this uh, proposal, uh, as Mr. Wolf pointed out, was not in the contract. Your contract was to reduce taxes on people because you thought they were overburdened with taxes uh, and that we ought to cut spending and cut taxes. Nowhere in that contract that any of you signed did you say, except for the two million federal employees, on whom we will have a 10% tax increase. Because that's what this is tantamount to. Two and a half points off the top is, is tantamount to about 10% of tax liability. Now, obviously, the higher the income, the less the percentage. Maybe on down to 8% or 7% as you move up the scale. But for the average worker, the $20,000 or the $30,000 or the $40,000 supporting a family and their kids and trying to send them to school and pay their mortgage payment and their car payment. If you increase their taxes, in effect, they're off the top of the uh, income by 750 or 1,000 or by 1,250. That 
any way you cut it, is a very substantial tax increase. Mr. Wolf has correctly observed, you don't need this money. This bill is all about money for funding uh, a tax program. It is not about retirement or pension reform. On a bipartisan basis, Ms. Morella, Mr. Wolf, myself, uh, Mr. Moran, and the ranking member of the committee have pointed out that CRS has pointed out there is not a, there's not a problem here. We re reform the retirement system. It is working the way it was uh, proposed to work. And yes, we are paying as employers. Every employer contributes uh, towards their retirement system. I would urge this committee not to do what you've done, not to sneak in at the last minute a provision which substantially adversely affects two million of our fellow citizens, some of whom live in this area, but most of whom live around this country, and who are trying to give us the best possible service they know how. Let us not retreat from our word as their employer. Let us not fail them in the trust we have as their employers. Let's reject this, then let us debate it. It is my own view that if we're going to get the balanced budget amendment uh, uh, concept ever to fruition, that is that we balance the budget, we're going to have to deal with entitlements. And this is an entitlement. I understand that. And very frankly, I think there are ways to do that. But the fact of the matter is ways to do it are perspective. Give notice to our people that these are the rules. We're changing them. And so those of you who are coming in or those of you who are not yet vested understand the rules have changed. But we will not change the rules for you after you've worked 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years for us. I suggest to the chairman of this committee that if this proposal were to change the rules on those people who had given 17, 18, 19 years of service to this country as members of the United States Marine Corps, you'd be on the ceiling. You'd be saying this was un-American, unpatriotic. We should not stand for it. Mr. Chairman, we ask you to take the same position for those not in uniform, but who have given the same measure of service to their country. Thank you very much. The gentleman's points are very well taken. Um, having heard from all of you, let me just make a couple of comments and ask a couple of questions. But uh, I have to uh, I have to agree with you that uh, you know this is a case where we're raising taxes on some to pay for tax cuts for others, and that to me is uh, it's wrong. Uh, I don't believe that we ought to be doing this in this bill uh, because that's really what it amounts to. Uh, if there is need for change, uh, that certainly we ought to go through the committee system, uh, and it ought to be brought to the, flare, to the floor under free and open debate, uh, and debate the merits of, of the bill. But there is no way, in my opinion, that this can be debated on the merits. Uh, I was somewhat critical of, uh, of your Democrat leader, Mr. Gephardt, when he laid a 36-page substitute on our, on our table here. Uh, and it has not dealt with this issue. This issue you're here for is in that substitute. But I was critical of him because we don't really know what is in here. Uh, but I have to be critical of our Republicans as well because in this document that's before us now, uh, I don't know. I'm confused about what is, uh, what changes are being made in this portion of the bill. You don't know, and, I, and certainly I don't. Members of this committee don't know. For instance, uh, I understand it was H.R. 1185 that was marked up in your Government Operations Committee, which did not come out. That was attempted to be marked up. Was attempted to be marked up. But now we have before us H.R. 1327. Uh, and I don't know what those differences are. Uh, can anybody here tell me what they, what they are? I think it does, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think Ms. one of Mrs. Morella. I think accelerates it. Accelerates it. Yeah. It, I, I don't quite understand that, and, and just so because we, we really do need to understand it. Uh, two and a half percent. Excuse me. I know what the bill does, but I mean, what what is the difference though 
between uh, what you had in your committee and what this new language, this new language is evidently different. And I don't understand the differences. Yeah, right. Uh, Mrs. Morello has yes. the floor. What, what the uh, change does, from what I understand, and I just found out about that today also, was that what you, will you, happen Use the is microphone. That you all can help me out on that. Mr. Chairman, it's like the first year. Well, we, we only have the one microphone, and C-SPAN is asking year, you to speak right. to the mic. Totally, over, th over three years, the desire was to, to uh, escalate uh, to 2.5 percent increase. Now, what this bill does is it changes the percentage each year so that the first year the increase is 1.5 percent, the second year it is 0.5 percent, and the third year 0.5 percent. In so, doing, in so doing, there will be more money generated the first year, and, and that may be the rationale for it. And then, as, uh, as Congressman Wolf mentioned, it I, is... I was told there may be, uh, postal workers may now be involved in, with yeah. regard to three high yeah. retirement yeah. Another thing... Not in their bill. Right. And another thing the bill does is it, it changes the annuity rate so that the retirement is predicated on the five highest years rather than three. And as Congressman Wolf said, this new version evidently brings in the postal workers in that regard. Just, just in that regard, just in regard to st stretching to it from three-year final average to five-year final average. Uh, Mr. Chairman. M Mrs. Collins. In addition, I understand that the agency... I have to have some... Uh, there's a little hum in here, and I can't hear. Maybe it's my age. <laughs> well, the hum is because we're all trying to get these answers together for you. <laughs> the agency contribution also is increased by 3% in the first year. Before, it was going to be 1% each year increase of agency contribution now is three percent the first year which means a bigger a bigger increase by the agencies for civil uh, service uh, mr chairman i think there's another change in it too and that is it takes away the equity uh with the uh members of congress and the federal employees and that i understand the members con the contribution is 1.5 percent only in the first year. You start dealing with inequities, then you're in even bigger trouble. Well, uh, before I yield to Mr. Moran, I, I would just hope, uh, as I mentioned, and maybe you weren't here, but uh, <clears throat> it is not the intention of this committee to put out a rule on this today. This is a confusing issue. Uh, we want to uh, we want to know what we're doing. And I would uh, like to lean on all of you with your expertise to, to please give, uh, give this committee a summary of the differences and what the bill really does. It will help us immensely if you would do that. Mr. Moran. Well, Mr. Chairman, if that's what we're going to do, there's no need for further testimony as far as what this does versus the uh, bill that came before the committee. The main point is that there are different bills, and we haven't had an adequate time to even read it, never mind consider it. Mr. Uh, Hoyer. But pass that mic over there, would you please? Mr. Chairman, sure. with all due respect, I think your questions uh, demonstrate uh, dramatically why this amendment uh, or why this provision should not be included in this legislation. Clearly, the Ways and Means Committee has had very substantial hearings, discussion, debate. Uh, the chairman has articulated on numerous occasions the provisions of the bill. Uh, whether you agree with it or disagree with it, the public has had notice of what it's all about. Here, we have in the very last minute before the consideration by this committee of the bill a very major proposal made and none of us are sure who take a lot of time following these issues exactly what it does. Under those circumstances, I think the chairman's uh, comments uh, in response to our testimony was right on target. This is a matter that well, needs uh, uh, the light of day, substantial discussion by the committee, by the public, and then a debate on the floor as to what direction uh, we ought to take. Well, and I would hope that at the, at the same time, uh, again, I haven't had time to analyze, nor has our staff, uh, the, uh, the Gephardt substitute, but uh, you better take a look at that, too, because that, that, as I understand, may contain almost identical language, but slightly different than, than the uh, bill before us. Mr. Moran. Uh, one thing we should say, Mr. Chairman, since it is in the bill, our amendment, proposed amendment, strikes only the part dealing with the federal employees' retirement plan. There is a provision within this tax cut bill that also addresses the members' retirement system. 
Uh, again, that hasn't had adequate consideration either. It increases the contributions from members and decreases their, accumul uh, their accumulation as well as reducing the, the number of years on which they would ba have their retirement based. Uh, before those changes are made, I think that needs to be adequately considered as well. Uh, obviously, it's awkward to be saying anything uh, de defensive of the member's retirement system because it appears to be so self-serving. But we would suggest that that hasn't had adequate deliberation either, and that is part of the bill. Our amendment does not address that, but if, if the same rationale applies, as I think it would, that provision of this tax cut bill ought to be deferred as well. Mr. Ver uh Tennessee. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity of saying a few words. First, I compliment all five of you for the excellent uh, job you're doing and for bringing this to the attention of the Rules Committee and to the membership of this House, and certainly being on C-SPAN to the attention of the American public. I support a tax cut. I'm like Mr. Wolf. I want to support the contract with America a provision, but this is an addition to that, and it's a tax increase, and I don't support it. And I know that you all are heavily loaded with federal employees, and I have uh, postal employees, and it's my understanding that they're also included in this measure. Is that right or wrong? It's correct. Uh, their plans, based upon their last five years of service, would be changed. It would be <coughs> consolidated so that their last three years, which means that uh, it, many of them will now work longer, whereas we're trying to encourage them to leave. So it's Well, that's consistent. true. And I, it, it's not a, a, a thing that does not concern me in that I have a major number of federal employees or postal employees which I consider to be federal employees. Would the gentleman yield? Yes. I, I don't quite understand how, um, how the Postal Service can be included. I don't see how, that is, how we find revenue to offset you know, what, what other cuts. Isn't that a separate system entirely? I mean, it's quasi-private. Uh, it's not the same as the, as the federal retirement system, is it? Yes, they are in our, they're in our system. It's the same way we do, Mr. Chairman. And the monies are in the same pot? That's my understanding, sir. That's correct. And the reason for this, it will cosmetically make the deficit look lower. Cosmetically. I think Thank it, you for yielding. Yes, sir. I think it's a matter of right and wrong. And it's wrong to do this and a tax cut bill to grant an increase. And I think it's absolutely wrong. And if it's not too late, I'm, want, I'm making a request of the sponsors of this amendment. If you'll add my name to it, I'd be ever appreciative. Well, you do that immediately. <laughs> Mr. Beal, oh, I'm sorry. No, I just think, let's consider the contract with America. I know there's a division. I know some of the Democrats don't support that, and that's their prerogative. But I support it. This amendment, in, uh, unless it's added or unless the measure is taken out, puts me in a terrible bind because I don't think it's fair to make certain class of citizens bear the brunt when the others receive a tax cut. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Mr. Beelan. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll, I'll be brief. I, I've listened attentively to what all of these five men and women have had to say, and I must say I've, I've found their testimony or what they've had to say, not so much their testimony, as I think many of my colleagues have, very, very troubling. The, the situation really is, is outrageous. As, the, as our chairman has mentioned himself, the, the bill in effect is, is imposing an additional tax on one group of people to help pay for a tax cut for other people. We have before us a copy of the memorandum by the Congressional Research Service, which I think is what Ms. Collins referred to originally, when they were asked specifically whether they're the unfunded liability of the CSRS is a problem that needs to be fixed. 
or and secondly is the system now insolvent or will will it become insolvent in the future and the answer to both of those questions is is no and they've got four pages of explanation to that the reason we have this before us is because the the, the reform committee was asked to come up with 12 billion dollars in savings and so they did it uh, this way it's true of course that that some three or four or five of you um, have a more difficult or put in a more difficult spot I suppose than others uh, of your colleagues because you have particularly large numbers of federal employees but many of us do represent lots of federal employees and clearly we care about them and most importantly as Mr. Hoyer said said earlier it's a question for all of us as to the to the question of the quality of, of public employees and our promises to them this is an outrageous thing to suggest that we that we do to these people when it's not necessary uh, in order to to um, to help the health of the of the retirement system itself. I mean, it just comes out of nowhere. It's not necessary, and I hope, Mr. Chairman, and our friends on the majority side, that you'll find some way for us to be able to properly deal with this portion of this large bill. Thanks. Mr. Goss. Mr. Chairman, I think this uh, subject has been uh, sufficiently perplexing and uh, troublesome for all of us, and uh, obviously we're going to have to work it out, and we are going to try and do that. I appreciate you bringing it forward. Mr. Frost, did you have a question? Mr. Chairman, yes, I would uh, observe that um, when we were in the majority and those rare instances when we attempted to take a bill out of committee when it had not been reported by that committee, we were roundly criticized for doing that. And I think this is a highly irregular procedure. I do not think this... Uh, I do not think these sections at all should be in this piece of legislation. I think, as Mr. Hoyer pointed out, that this should be dealt with by the Committee of Jurisdiction and that whatever resolution to it uh, should be done within that committee by the people who follow this matter closely. I don't think we on the Rules Committee ought to be trying to patch this thing together and saying, well, what are the alternatives and let's play like we're the Committee of Original Jurisdiction. We're not the Committee of Original Jurisdiction over this legislation and I would hate to see us try and function as such. I think this, this title clearly should go back to this committee. It should not be included in this bill when we report it out. And uh, as I observed earlier, um, when we were in the majority, we spent a lot of time counting to 218. And uh, I would hope that the current majority would also count to 218 because I think this is how, if you put this section in this bill, this may be how you get under 218 on the floor on the rule. And I must tell the gentleman, uh, he was a good counter because uh, I think in, uh, in the last Congress, we only defeated uh, four rules, I believe, the whole, uh, the whole two years. Uh, but not to justify uh, the, uh, the gentleman's statement, but to, uh, uh, there were many instances, though, when uh, this committee has acted on, on measures that were not reported. Here's a, coming out of the Government Operations Committee alone, here's a, a, a large list of them, but which I would submit for the record without objection. But uh, the gentleman's points are certainly well taken. In those instances when we did that, I believe that we were subject to criticism for doing so. Oh, yes. I don't believe that it passed unnoticed. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm afraid I was uh, one of those that were criticizing. Uh, no, Mrs. You'll be consistent. Judge, Judge, <laughs> Judge Price. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think we've all found this uh, uh, very compelling and we appreciate the time the thought you put into it and certainly um, there's some sympathy, sympathy here. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm uh, corrected. I understand we actually defeated six of your rules uh, last, uh, in the last Congress. I didn't realize we were so effective. <laughs> the question is, what was the earliest defeat? <laughs> I think that may be relevant, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we want to thank you for coming. And, uh, thank you very thank you. much, Mr. Chairman. Excellent testimony. Thanks. Getting Mr. Quillen on that legislation. In a hurry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is uh, Mr. Kasich, uh, Mr. Kasich is here. John, if you would, as uh, soon as this uh, mob clears out. Let's try to uh, exit as fast as we can uh, so we can get on with this uh, hearing that's going to last for many hours.
It is a uh, privilege to welcome one of the most effective members of this entire body, a great friend of mine, John Kasich. And uh, John, if there's anyone more outspoken than me, it's probably you in this whole body. And uh, uh, my hat goes off to you. <laughs> my hat goes off to you for the outstanding job you have done over the years that you were doing this year. Yours is without question the toughest uh, job uh, before this Congress. And uh, I just want to pledge to you, I will do everything in my power to help you in a, in, in a very, very difficult situation. Uh, we're going to have Mr. Kasich testify first. I know he has to leave. And uh, Marty, if you don't mind, then I'll call you up directly afterwards, interrupting the, uh, the regular uh, order. Mr. Chairman, will there be the opportunity to ask Mr. Kasich questions? Yes, there will. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kasich, uh, feel you, free Mr. to Chairman. summarize, but uh, take as long as you wish. I, it's a pleasure for me to be here, and particularly to be here with my friend and colleague from Columbus, uh, Deborah Price. And um, first time I've been before the Rules Committee since you've been chairman. So I uh, appreciate the chance to be here. And of course, I'm here to, I don't know if this request has been made, but that the um, the text of H.R. 1327 be made in order as an amendment in the nature of a substitute uh, of H.R. 1215, a tax cut reported by the uh, Ways and Means Committee. What I bring forward here today is um, the bundling of some provisions. Uh, we have the hundred billion dollars in uh, lowered caps, uh, Mr. Chairman, that will and those savings will appear on the uh, on the pay go scorecard so that the combination of both discretionary and entitlement savings uh, will offset the costs of our tax relief for families and the tax provisions designed to create jobs in this country. Uh, also, of course, in the package total will be the welfare reform bill, which has already passed the House floor, uh, and uh, the civil service retirement reforms uh, come before the committee as well, and those involve um, the provisions in terms which I guess you had ample discussion of. I don't know how many people are aware of this, but we have a $540 billion unfunded liability in the civil service retirement system. I don't think people are aware of that. Let me repeat that number, 540 billion unfunded liability. You got the Medicare system going broke in six years. We all know about the concerns about Social Security after the turn of the century. And um, you, know, you, you think about all these problems out there and, and you realize this is the United States of America and you say we better get working on some of these things. In the area of the civil service retirement, uh, we go from high three to high five in regard to retirement, and uh, we increase the uh, amount of contribution to two and a half percent. This will also, of course, affect uh, members' pensions. We're starting in 1996 on, uh, members of Congress will have the same formula for determining pensions as all other federal employees. I think there's been a lot of concern expressed in this country about this whole uh, congressional retirement uh, system. We made efforts in, I believe, 1986 to address it. This is an, a, a further effort to address it and will make things consistent with the way uh, that retirement is set for other federal employees. And I think that this particular provision will be greeted enthusiastically uh, by the taxpaying public. Also uh, included in the bill, of course, are the Medicare extenders, uh, similar to the Clinton budget. Uh, ex we extend the spectrum uh, auction authority, and we privatize the uranium enrichment uh, 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 operation, and we make it a private operation. When you put all this together, it's very, very curious. As, as the chairman of the committee knows, as he has been involved in tremendous number of, uh, of efforts to try to reduce spending. And I, I didn't really come here to talk so much about uh, the Clinton budget or baseline budgeting or anything else, but I think it's important for the committee to understand and for the American people to know that what we have done in our discretionary spending area is to lower the spending caps $100 billion below the 95 spending level. That's kind of the way families work. Uh, if you're going to have a cut in something, it's a cut below last year's actual spending. So what we've done is we've taken the 95 spending level 
and we cut $100 billion below the 95 level. Now, the amazing thing is when we, when we take that $100 billion and we score it against the caps that are permanently, or that have been placed in the law, that have the force of law for 96, 97, 98, and I wish I had a chart here, but I don't have my chart, and we extend those caps in a non-inflation basis in 99 in the year 2000, we get scored an extra 30 billion. Now, we can come in here and actually claim that we've not only paid for tax relief, but we've made a down payment on reducing the deficit by having deficit reduction of slightly over $30 billion. Now, if you take that model of scoring everything from the 95 level against those caps without inflation built into them, and you put the president's budget in that model, his budget actually increases the deficit by $30 billion. There's no deficit reduction whatsoever in the president's budget. And I believe you've got to get everything scored from the 95 level. But if we put our, our cuts, our savings, in the model that the president used to have his budget calculated, we have $90 billion in deficit reduction. Now, people watching this are just scratching their head and saying, I have no idea what he is talking about here. But in a nutshell, if in fact we score spending from the actual 95 level, we have $100 billion in less spending. When you include the caps that were created to give you just a slight bit of increased spending over these five years, we have an additional $30 billion worth of deficit reduction, which I think is legitimate to claim because the caps are something that we've all voted on. The out-year caps that the president's inflated, I think, are phony, and that's why we don't, we don't even think we ought to count that. So what we were able to do here today is to bring a package that not only pays for the tax relief, but also makes a down payment on the deficit. Now, we will, of course, come back in May. We will further lower the discretionary caps, and we will bring in uh, huge reforms uh, in, in entitlement programs. And that will be the effort by which we will be able to fulfill uh, our commitment, which is to provide tax relief for Americans and also to balance the budget. I think conventional wisdom has dr driven us, uh, driven some people to believe that we can't do both. I believe that we can, and I think that today to come forward and delay this kind of a document down where we can not only show that we have tax relief, but we have real deficit reduction, is uh, an indication of what we are capable of doing. So, Mr. Chairman, it's a pleasure for me to be here today. Um, I don't know what kind of time requirements you want to do on the floor. I, I would think the committee would, would like to have about an hour. I, I don't, whatever you would consider to be appropriate would be fine with us. I think an hour would, would be about right. And um, I stand ready to answer questions. Well, John, again, I want to uh, just take off my hat to you and, uh, and praise you and your staff for the, for the work you've done. I don't know how in the world we can, uh, we are ever going to accomplish what we have to do, but uh, if it can be done, certainly you and your staff uh, will, will find a way. Uh, can I say one thing about the Budget Committee, too? I, I want to say that the efforts that are being made are not just my efforts or the efforts of, of staff. The members of the committee, I think, from 1993 on have demonstrated a, uh, a unique team effort here on Capitol Hill, and uh, we're only as good as our members, and uh, they deserve the lion's share of the credit. Concerning uh, that, uh, <laughs> Mr. Gephardt was here earlier with um, with a uh, with a um, alternative substitute, and uh, it is uh, confusing to me, but. Uh, I would hope that you and your staff would take this and give us uh, an analysis as fast as you can. Mr. Guppard says it's not in its final form, uh, but we need to know what's in here. There's nobody better <laughs> capable than you and your staff to, uh, to let us know. We have some very difficult decisions to make in the uh, next uh, 72 hours. Uh, let me just ask you... Uh, I, I look forward to, to looking at the, uh, at the uh, leader's uh, alternative. I, I don't think I've heard it really described in any detail, so I, 
would be anxious to well, see it. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of uh, new areas, and of course, what we have to worry about is that if we are going to give waivers to you and your committees, the uh, five committees of jurisdiction, uh, we're going to, and I'll give this to you now, John, take with you. Uh, the uh, we have to we want to make the same waivers available and only those waivers available to uh, to whatever alternative we might make in order for the Democrats. So it's important that uh, uh, that you get back to us. One quick question: What did you do with that spectrum? Is that issue finally dealt with now? The uh, uh, are we finally dealing with it? Well, I don't think we. I think we just really touched um, the tip of the iceberg on the spectrum. What we've done is to extend the authority. Uh, for it to be to be privatized, uh, but Mr. Fields has some ideas about uh, where we would head with the spectrum a few years down the road that are very intriguing, and I I don't think we have, I think we've just hit, touched the tip of the iceberg because as you know a lot of a lot of these uh, commercial stations are going to be trying to get into high density television a few years from now. And they will be searching for frequencies in, a, in another part of the spectrum. And uh, I think we're going to be hearing a lot about spectrum in here. There will be a lot of people holding their breath and hyperventilating about what we're going to be doing. But this is a very interesting area. And I, I, I think we're going to be hearing more from the Budget Committee and clearly more from Mr. Fields. Well, John, uh, let me just uh, in closing say that <laughs> there were a number of questions raised about the uh, the uh, old H.R. 1185 dealing with the federal employees, and it's confusing to me and the other members of the Rules Committee that we heard testify. And um, if if we can, um, I know that's not totally your jurisdiction there, but uh, we need to, the, the members need to have a uh, clear explanation of exactly how it differs than, uh, than H.R. 1185 that was before the Government Operations Committee. So sometime again in the next 24 hours, we would like to have your staff and the other relative staffs get together with you know in, in, in a nutshell what we have in this provision is one that increases the contributions in uh, FERS and the Civil Service Retirement uh, Trust Fund by two and a half percent and also says that retirement will be based on high five years rather than high three years mm -hmm. and um, members will be affected as well. Members' uh, contributions go up by 2 percent because we're already a half a percent. And so what we're essentially doing is uh, uh, we are uh, asking people to contribute somewhat more to their retirement, which I think is, is fairly consistent, but what I, fairly consistent with the private sector. But what is interesting to note is that uh, FERS was created in 84, and its uh, purpose was basically to limit the unfunded liability in the federal pension system. But the fact is we have a $540 billion unfunded liability. And uh, I'm not an expert on the implications of that, but clearly that's something probably hadn't come up here before. It's a serious problem, very serious problem. And this doesn't begin to really deal with it, but it's an effort to I mean, it doesn't deal with it in a major way, but it's, it's, it's an effort to try to begin to deal with it. Well, and basically, in, in that legislation, um, I had uh, a man with 30-some years of, uh, of uh, service in the federal government. Some was military, some was, uh, was uh, civilian employment. Uh, his question was, to me was, uh, would he lose benefits? In other words, if he stayed in, in federal employment uh, for another two or three years, in other words, the... the, the no, he may gain because if it's based on high... If it's going to be based on high five at the time you retire, he, he may want to serve longer to maximize the amount that would be... It would he, that would accrue on, under a, a high five as opposed to a high three. I see. Okay. John, thank you very, very much. And uh, Mr. Uh, Goss? John, this is uh, obviously, we've heard a ton of testimony today. We've had talk about triggers. And we've had talk about uh, reducing the amount uh, down uh, for the, um, the $500 and the, the level that would hit. We've had some really serious concerns uh, along the line that Mr. Solomon has just explained. Uh, Mr. Sawyer even said that uh, some, some of this um, $540 billion, there was, a, there was a cosmetic aspect to it that uh, 
that was really not fair to these folks. Uh, we're getting a ton of testimony, and I, I think what we need to know is uh, if we got a piece of legislation ready to roll uh, that you're satisfied with. Yeah, because it, it, we, we said one thing, Mr. Goss, we were going to pay for our tax relief. And we've not only done that, but we also have deficit reduction at the same time. Plus, we've paid for the contract with America as well. We pay for the, the contract. We keep our word. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Bielenson. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, it's good to have you here. You are a, somebody who is serious and real about budget deficit reduction, and it's good to have you in that position as long as, you know, if we have to have a Republican there, it's good to have you. And I mean it very seriously. Thank you. I think most of our colleagues feel exactly the same way. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, maybe you can do both tax reduction and deficit reduction, uh, but clearly it would be easier if you just did one. I mean, clearly you'd have an easier job, and all of us together would have an easier job if you were just trying to reduce the deficit, and you didn't have to come up with additional savings in order to pay for these, for these uh, uh, tax cuts. Uh, as I understand it, the, the bill before us will will produce something like something like close to seven hundred billion dollars over a ten year period in tax uh, in tax cuts. How do we pay for the remainder out there are you are you involved with that yet or are you are you are well is, everything are you just being asked to to come up with some payments no for, all for this, the all the part? spending payments we laid down i mean it, as the gentleman knows. Our goal is to be it's, to have uh, to have this thing totally paid for and to be able to get to zero by 2002. And uh, all these savings that we bring to you today, when added together, will in fact uh, pay for the contract and allow us to balance the budget by 2002. You're, you're assuming. I mean, we're look, you're looking forward to your to your to your budget resolution, which we'll see, I guess, next month or in, in May sometime or something of that sort. In a sense, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves here. I mean, many of us would be far more comfortable if we could see that be put in a position, I'm sure you're not that happy about it yourself, perhaps, of having to, to vote, at least some of our colleagues, to vote for really substantial cuts before we see how it's all going to play out over a, over a period of time or where other cuts might additionally come from. I take it, am I correct in understanding that the discretionary cuts that you're providing for here by lowering the caps, the discretionary caps, come out of entirely or almost entirely out of non-defense spending? Yes, that is correct. We have some, uh, so, a very limited amount of defense spending. I think it's about three and a half billion that we would recommend. Now, as you know, the cuts that we recommend are, uh, don't have to be taken by the Appropriations sure. Committee, but what the Appropriations Committee has to do is to live under the cap. But we. I mean, I've always felt as though we need to, to show a road map. Uh, the, our, our leadership has felt as though we need to show a road map. And, um, but I, I think the concern, Mr. Bielenson, is that defense is, uh, you know, I, I try to avoid having my cake and eating it too, where you talk about cutting something based on a baseline if it's your program and if it's not, you, you don't. But defense has been reduced in real terms. And, I'm not arguing with yeah. you, John. I understand that. It's just that I'm just trying to point out that, that these relatively sizable discretionary cuts come out of non-defense programs, very but, programs that, you yeah. know, that some might argue have been, <clears throat> have been underfunded for a number of years past. Well, well, non-defense discretionary has gone up by 12 percent over the last two years, so that's why we felt it was appropriate to deal with that. Okay. Anyway, unfortunately, we're stuck with your stupid contract. You know, I wish some of us, no, I mean it, you know, I, some of us would just feel so much more comfortable, perhaps some of you too, and I'm not, I'm not saying this for political purposes, just many of us would feel so much more comfortable if we were, if we were devoting all of this deficit reduction, of the spending reduction, which is very difficult, as, as you, you, you and Mr. Solomon and others know as well as anybody around here, and it's, it's easy thus far, so because we're still talking, we're not quite yet talking in terms of the specific cuts to be made, although you've got it, illustratory ones here listed, which, you know, which is good of you, but we haven't voted on them yet. You know, all I'm saying is, all, all we're expressing on our side of the aisle here is that we sure wish we could, we could work first at, at deficit reduction and then get eventually later to paying for some tax yeah. deductions if that's what people think are necessary, because it's going to be difficult enough to, for us to, to bring this, this uh, budget into balance in the next seven or eight years. And I know you're stuck with this, and you've got to do your best to do it as well as you possibly can. If we can possibly help you do it the other way, we offer our help. Let me, uh, let me uh, say to the gentleman that um, 
I, I love the contract. I think it's great. But uh, I, let, let me say this, uh, Mr. Bielenson, and, you know, we use a lot of words around here that we don't all, all always mean, but you're, you're one, of the, one of the guys I like the most and I've come to respect over the years here. And I take you at your word because you put your money where your mouth is. Um, so I, I really appreciate what you say to me. The issue of the caps, I, I, I want to spend just a, a minute on that because I think that we worry sometimes about, we, we, we worry sometimes about the details. What we do with the caps is that, and when I say worry about the details, I don't mean that the programs are important, but we, we fail to recognize that we have created a budget and an internal discipline under which we must live. And we don't do that in a vacuum. I mean, I, I can tell you that I spent many hours talking to the appropriations chairman and staff director and, uh, and various uh, authorizing committees about what, what, what kind of number is really doable and what's realistic. And so when you put a cap on, the cap of which has the force of law will force us to live within a budget. The other thing I want to say to the gentleman is I, I have some concerns about the neutral cost recovery provisions of the contract. I have said this from the beginning. Um, I hope that that will be very closely looked at in the out years. Good argument can be made that that neutral cost recovery will be a pretty strong growth provision. I will tell the gentleman that I believe the capital gains provision over time will bring in more revenue than it will cost us. I mean, I, I, I don't know anybody that argues against that. But I think conventional wisdom tells us that we're not capable here of reducing taxes and balancing the budget. But I'm here to tell you today that I, I believe it is absolutely doable. If I didn't think it was doable, I would tell you it wasn't doable. I believe that it is doable, and I believe it is right. I believe it's, uh, it's right to, uh, to help grow the economy, and I also believe it's right to downsize government and give people some of their money back. And I, I don't want to be in a no, no. rhetorical debate. I, I just happen to believe this, and some people think, well, John doesn't really believe it. He'd just love it if the, if the taxes were dropped in the contract. That's not true. I believe in these provisions in the contract. There's, as I say, neutral cost recovery that I have concern about, but I believe we can do this whole job. I think we're showing it. Oh, the other thing no, I want to tell you. I know you believe it. The other thing I wanted to tell you is, yeah. look, we passed the tax relief and the spending cuts through the House next week. And it goes over in the Senate. We're not going to end up being able to, to do the tax relief and have it locked into law until we do reconciliation. And reconciliation is going to be the vote that everybody in this country has been waiting for. I mean, it's like the major showdown between North Carolina and Duke, uh, between Ohio State and Michigan. I mean, this will be, this will be like a 12, what is it, 12 uh, high noon, Gary North Cooper. North Carolina and Arkansas. This you might be right about that, Mr. Frost. This is going to be uh, the decision time that the country's been waiting for this May. We're going to have a vote on the largest amount of deficit reduction that comes about by spending cuts and entitlement savings that we've ever had in our history. So we're going to get a chance to show you that how it all gets paid for. And I think there's a concern, well, they'll flip this through and somehow they won't make the cuts in going to happen because reconciliation will force us. And we'll see if we're up to it for all of us. Well, we know that if you have anything to say about it, you'll, you'll force us to, to be intellectually honest about it. And I wasn't suggesting before, I didn't mean to suggest, I'm sorry if it was interpreted that way, that, that you yourself or some of my colleagues didn't believe in these things. I know, you, I know you do. And finally, let me just say one more thing. I agree with you about the caps and how useful they are. And some of us have been arguing now for three, four, five years since we've had these caps in one form or another uh, that actually we deserve, we in the Congress deserve more credit uh, for being more careful uh, about spending and, and keeping within the confines that the caps require us to stay in than, uh, than the public's given us credit for. You, you might recall that in last year when I was helping you folks with the crime bill, Mr. Solomon and I got an argument about the caps, and I said that the caps hadn't been violated. I said, we've got to give the Democrats credit. They haven't violated the caps. But I don't know if the gentleman knows this or not. I, I just really even 
hate to say this because it just drives people crazy. But you know, in the year 99 and 2000, there are no spending caps. They expire. Do you know what the White House does? They go to all, they go, to, they inflate the spending caps basically along baseline this inflation growth. This is what you were referring growth. to earlier. Pardon? This, this is what you were referring to, I take it. Yeah, the and then they the put testimony. the caps in and then they claim savings from the inflated line and what we spent this year and they claim that as a savings. And that's, that's when you start monkeying with the caps that way, what we will do in our bill from here on out is the caps will be flat. We're not even going to have inflation growth in the caps. I mean, what you see is what you get, and we're going to cut from the way families do. You're going to have some entitlement caps, too? No, I, I mean, I don't, I don't want to preclude that, but I, my sense is, is that I think we have an obligation to give you as much of a road map as we possibly can. Uh, well, we wish you well. We just, some of us are sorry that, we, sorry that you also have to pay for these, these tax cuts. As I recognize Thanks. Mr. Linder, let me just make an announcement that um, the Rules Committee is going to interrupt this hearing at uh, 4 o'clock, approximately 4 o'clock, to take up a self-employment health deduction uh, conference report rule. If you would notify Mr. Mokley, I'd appreciate it. Mr. Linder. John, isn't, isn't it true that the 1993 budget agreement had a line item of $69.9 billion entitled Unspecified Future Cuts? Yeah, I can't remember exactly how that all got resolved, but as I, I could recall that one day when I said, Mr. President, could you please give me your specifics, there was a, a $69 billion plug, and the argument was the Budget Committee didn't need to be um, specific, and, um, you know, that, that's 93, and... Let me ask you further, we got the 250, rough, roughly 250,000, or billion, <coughs> excuse me, in uh, tax increases. But most of the spending cuts were going to be coming years three, four, and five. I think there was about six or eight billion in spending cuts, real spending cuts in the years one and two. Is that correct? Uh, I don't want to, uh, if Pretty the gentleman's done the research, I trust it. I, I hate to welcome, confirm welcome, numbers I don't have in front of me. I welcome you to year three. Did the president have spending cuts in your, this, <laughs> this budget? If you want to define spending cuts on the basis of what we spent last year, I want to define, the answer is no. I want to define the cuts based on the commitment made in the, 19 th uh, in, in the uh, 90, 1993 budget agreement, where we were going to have roughly $250 billion in cuts toward deficit reduction in the years 3, 4, and 5. Maybe this is a time to kind of, I, got a, I think I got an E in art, but if, if this is the if this is the flat line from 95 to 2000, the president, under the current service baseline, we go up in spending, and if we save this money, we count that as a cut. Now, that's cut in Washington term, but in Georgia term, you know, if I think I'm going to get three tickets to the Olympics and I end up with two, that's a cut. If I thought I was going to get three and I hoped I was going to get five and I ended up with three, that isn't a cut. And what, what the president has done is he's claimed a lot of cuts from these inflated baselines. And I'd say to the gentleman that, I mean, as he knows, it is, it is our goal to put the, the federal budget in family dinner table terms so we can understand it. So when you say how, where was a five, you know, we heard Bush said, President Bush said, $500 billion spending cut package and tax cut package in 1990. 93, $500 billion, that's a trillion dollars. I mean, if we're doing so great, why is the deficit going up and Alan Greenspan's talking about the fact that we're on a, uh, we're on a collision course with the future, negative collision course with the future? So when you're talking about, this is the amazing thing, when you put the president's budget based on 95 actual spending, his deficit goes up by $30 billion. Do you run your numbers through dynamic models at all just to compare the difference with the static models that Treasury uses and CBO uses? Well, we, we have not done that, Mr. Linder, and that this issue of the dynamic versus the static, what we're basically talking about in complicated uh, economics, uh, it's not even 101, it's about 670 terms, is what we call feedback effects. If all of us in this room are given an incentive to paint this room, 
and we're given an extra dollar an hour to paint this room, it's concluded that we will all paint more. But at the end of the day, the experts say it's impossible to estimate what the overall effect was of all of us painting. We can, we can measure each one's individual effort, but we're, it's inca we're incapable of being able to say how that affects the overall room. So take capital gains. We know that a capital gains incentive for risk taking will get more people to, to sell and invest and risk and, and it will create an awful lot of activity. But what we are unable to do is to feed that back through the economy and talk about how that affects GDP. And we are pushing the envelope to get that done. Not only because we want to have proper revenue estimates, but I'd say to the gentleman, if all of a sudden you assume that risk-taking incentives are a loss of money to the Treasury, you may not use that option. And that hurts the economy. And that's a bad way to do things. So, but we're not currently using dynamic well, it's scoring. It's a fact, isn't it, that every time you cut marginal tax rates or capital gains tax rates, you wind with more transactions and actually more revenues to the Treasury from capital gains than you would at a higher rate. Right now, about six to ten trillion dollars is tied up in over time, generally. But tied over up in time. Well, the revenue, revenue from category, the category of capital gains increased in 1978. It increased again in 79, all the way up until 1986, when we increased the rates in capital gains, and then it fell off. Yes. Fell off the table. But we've got six to ten trillion dollars tied up in assets that people are unwilling to sell because the bite is too large. And at a lower, a preferred rate, a preference rate, they would exchange those, and the government would get more money. How, do you can, how can you calculate that? Well, we have met with joint tax to talk to Mr. Keyes about the way in which they do the, the amount of sales that, uh, what is that terminology called? Realization. Realizations, that's the, that's the word. We have increased realizations as a result, but he is unable to take the next step and to talk about how those realizations affect GDP. That is what we need to hammer down. That's, that's what we need to achieve, I, I, I'd say to the gentleman. And I think it's a, it's a big mistake uh, in the fact that we can't, we cannot uh, uh, accurately predict GDP. And I'm working actively now with Jim Colby from Arizona and, so, and Martin Feldstein, some of the leading economists in the country, to try to figure out how to do it. I think one of the steps is potential, potentially that we'd want to have these estimates done uh, side by side. We can use the static model, but we ought to look at the, uh, the more dynamic model and, and see how we can push the ball up the field. I will tell you that Mr. Greens, Dr. Greenspan did say <laughs> that he'd like to put deficit reduction first, but I will also tell you that Dr. Greenspan said that had we indexed, just indexed capital gains in the middle 1980s, it would have more than paid for itself and we would have had a much more uh, a productive economy, we would have had faster growth. Capital gains, as I like to describe it in Main Street economics, is if you have a funnel with, with a very narrow stem, when you pour prosperity in there, you're limited on how much prosperity you can put in that funnel until it overflows. If you widen the stem, you can pour more prosperity through the funnel, and capital gains is about widening the stem so more people can get jobs. Uh, and I would say one other thing to the gentleman. We have a number of programs in the federal government where we use taxpayers' money to do risk-taking. And I don't think we ought to use ta taxpayers' money to do risk-taking. I think we ought to give people reasons to take risk in the private sector. Capital gains investments are probably the most important investment in terms of creating jobs. And the way you – I don't believe it's going to be possible to cut spending to balance this budget. We've got to have a larger economy. We've got to grow the economy. Twofold. We can double the economy, and we've got to control spending, and then we can start making a pay down on the on the six or five trillion dollar debt. Well, the capital gains tax cut of 1977 was a very large part of the mechanism for fueling 19 million new jobs, 19 million new taxpayers, and doubling the revenues to the treasury. Um, there is an amendment being pursued in this rules committee right now to to be made in order to delay the to delay the uh, enactment of any of the tax cuts until, ap until some triggers were hit in terms of deficit reduction. It's my judgment that that will be more harmful than helpful because when you cut capital gains taxes, you get more revenue, which is, enhances deficit reduction. 
Uh, I don't know if that's going to be made in order. There's some people getting very concerned about whether they'll even vote for the rule if they don't get their way. Um, my question to you is, um, do you do you have any, any economic statistics as to the impact on the economy of the $500 per child tax credit, which I think is about 110 billion worth of the deficit, I mean of the tax uh, package? Were there any economic analyses of its impact on the economy? I would say, that the gentleman, while the capital gains reduction is viewed as a real incentive for economic growth, the family tax credit was never viewed as having a a huge uh, or as having a, a really a real growth component. That wasn't the purpose of it. Although I will say to the gentleman that it makes a heck of a lot more sense to me, and economically, it makes. I don't, you want to have an economist argue that individuals uh, almost all the time have a have a far greater impact on the economy by making choices themselves than rather rather than having government invest this in more consumption. And so it does make sense from an economic point of view, from a growth point of view, to put this money in the hands of the private sector people and get it out of the hands of the government. But the family tax relief was designed to let people share, get, let them get some of their money back, let them make choices about how they want to spend, to shrink the size of the government. But that is coupled with the capital gains, which is, is purely growth. And let me say to the gentleman, I'm wearing two hats these days. One hat is a listening hat where I'm sitting and listening to members who have lots of problems uh, with the tax provisions. And then I have another hat where I believe in the contract. So, but let me just say that when we get into this business of, of setting these targets, it would be ironic, wouldn't it, if what we say is, is if the Congress is incapable or unable to hit a target, we'll punish the people that pay the bills. If they really want to get creative, why don't we say that if the Congress doesn't hit the targets, we don't get paid? I mean, why, the Congress doesn't get paid. I, I, I bet we'd start hitting a lot of targets right about then, or we get less of our salary. The problem with the target business is uh, it gets to be one that depends on, on economic activity. And I don't think we want to say that in bad times, we want to say that taxpayers should get less relief. Uh, I don't happen to subscribe to that. What everybody is worried about, you know, I, I want to tell the gentleman again, people want to have, want to be convinced that we're going to have deficit reduction. Uh, my birthday is May the 13th. It will be some time after that that I hope uh, that we will have a vote on the House floor uh, that will have the most amount of deficit reduction, will be successful. They'll come before the Rules Committee. The chairman will make it in order. We'll have a substitute from my friend and colleague, Mr. Sabo. We'll go down on the floor, and we're going to have a vote to balance the budget in seven years and have tax relief. I mean, we're going to have that vote in May. May is two months away. We aren't going to get this tax thing all the way through both houses of Congress and signed by the president until we do that. This package is paid for. First of all, it's paid for. We kept our word. We would not have tax relief unless it was paid for. It's paid for right here in this bill, folks, right here. All of this pays for tax relief and has $30 billion in deficit reduction. But we're going to take this bill and we're going to add it to this, this other bill that's probably going to be about this high and take an all together, we're going to have our 1995 American Revolution. And it's going to be a revolution that is going to mean that we are going to transfer power and money from this city back to where people live. And we'll have that vote. So, I mean, it's not like, you know, they keep saying, well, wait till we get you in the finals. Finals are coming. We're going to blow the whistle, do a tip off the ball. We're going to play the game, and we're going to have the vote in May. Your budget, and will have us on a glide slope to balance by 2002. Will the alternative budget have that, too? I, I, I really don't know. I can tell you that the president's budget has a, has a glide path to bankruptcy. Not the zero. Thank you, John. Uh, Judge Price. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I don't have any questions of my esteemed colleague from Columbus, Ohio. But if the, the chairman would indulge me, um, just a few observations. Uh, and I will be brief, because I know that Chairman Casey has to get on his way, and there are other members waiting. But 
<clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I believe that America is truly lucky to have a man like John Kasich leading the charge on this issue and notwithstanding his sports analogies ad nauseum, uh, he certainly has made a great case today. Uh, because I believe, Mr. Chairman, there's probably not another person in this entire Congress with the courage and the energy and the good humor that John Kasich has to take on the task before us. And I believe it's going to take a lot of your good humor, Chairman Kasich, to get through the next couple months. But you have made yourself a lightning rod for every special interest group Don't that's come that. down the pike. <laughs> and your dedication is nothing short of inspirational. I mean, we have to help Chairman Kasich do the hard job before him and, and lead us as a Congress to be the truly historic Congress that this one can be. And I just want to personally say thank you, um, because with you at the helm, I have all the confidence in the world that we're going to be able to get this job done. Thank you for that opportunity, Mr. Chairman. I just want to concur in every single word that uh, Judge Price has just uh, said. Um, Diaz Villar. Uh, I wasn't here for all your testimony, but uh, uh, I, uh, I want to concur. And you know, you're getting a lot. I'm sure you're not used to all the praise you're getting today. Uh, certainly from a lot of the interest groups that uh, you're, you're hearing from. Uh, the, the reality of the matter is that uh, it's historic uh, what, what we're dealing with. And uh, uh, as, uh, as uh, Deborah Price just stated, uh, we're very cognizant of the fact that uh, a lot of it is owed to your leadership. And so uh, uh, there, there will be uh, some uh, interesting and somewhat tough times in the next months. But uh, the important thing is that we, uh, we keep our eye on, on why, why we have to do what we're doing. And so I don't, I don't uh, have any questions, Mr. Chairman, but, uh, but uh, I, think, uh, I think we're all aware of the fact that this is very important, what's being discussed here. And uh, there may be some you know, disagreements on some of the details, uh, for example, uh, with regard to what's the bill before us today. I mean, there's some legitimate, legitimate uh, ideas for amendments uh, that are being brought forth. But um, on the essence, I think that we have to uh, uh, stay um, uh, looking at uh, where we're going and why. Thank you. John, you mentioned uh, that uh, you wear two hats. Uh, one is to, uh, to listen and the other is to carry out that contract. You Actually, you wear four hats because you've got to do the same thing on the spending cuts. You have to listen. You have to be courteous to members. But on that other hat, You've got to stay that course, and there's no better man to do it than you. And uh, God bless you. We want to help you do it. Go to it. Mr. Mr. Uh, Kulin. I regret that I wasn't here to all your testimony. But I appreciate you and the good job you do. How do you uh, make a rationale increasing the taxes on, on federal employees by making pay more on their retirement and a tax cut in the other provision of the bill. I think it's a good question, Mr. Quillen. The, the, the situation is, is that these, this civil service retirement fund is, has an unfunded liability of half a trillion dollars approximately. And um, I, I don't think it's inappropriate to suggest to our federal employees that we go from a high three to a high five, and also that we, uh, uh, we increase the contribution rate. I think, though, that if we had not included the members of Congress in this pension reform provision that will begin in 1996, it wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have been smart. I think we, we needed to do this. And uh, I think the committee, Mr. Klinger, who talked this through, has made a good recommendation. And um, I would say to the gentleman that as we go through this whole process of balancing the budget, as the speaker said, I know the chairman has said, and I have said, everything is on the table uh, in this federal government except for Social Security. Everything is on the table. And every element is going to have to give a little. And I think our challenge is to be fair. You know, in the 80s, we cut taxes and tried to cut spending, we're going to come back and finish the job. We're going to have a little tax relief in here and some growth, but we're also going to cut spending, which is the, the greatest tribute we can do to, to, to President Reagan. And everybody's going to have to participate in this. And uh, I, I mean, I've got programs in my district where people aren't happy. But you know what? What it gets down to is 
one simple thing. I believe the tax relief can be achieved and is doable, but beyond that, the balanced budget business is real, real simple. Could you imagine if we all went home after May and we failed uh, to pass a, uh, a budget resolution that moves us to balance the budget and we got home and somebody said to us, well, what happened? We would have to say, well, we failed. And I don't think the American people are going to give us a lot of ch uh, chance. Uh, we've got to do this now. You know, Paul Songus was down there before the Commerce Committee yesterday with some very tough language to all parties. Hates our tax cuts, thinks the Democrats were irresponsible on Medicaid, Medic I mean, he just he dished it out to everybody. Now, let me tell you, it, let me not tell you. Let me just suggest to you that in my opinion, if we don't get the job done, Paul Songus will start a party, God bless him, he's a great man, and he will have other people in there, and it will be viable, and we will see a splintering of the American political system based on the fact that we didn't have the will to do the job. And I think we've got to have it. Well, I support the contract with America, the tax cut, but I can't figure out in my own mind with a federal uh, employee making 30000 a year that it's going to cost him some $750 more a year out of his earnings to participate. To pay for his, reti his or her retirement. That's right. I don't mind the retirement for members. That's Is that what the two and a half would mean to that worker? At 30000 I'm not sure it would. I don't know what the number would be, but I mean, we, the problem we have, Mr. Quillen, is when they presented their amendment to the committee, and it seems to me that's a tax increase for them when there's a tax decrease uh, for others. It doesn't seem fair. There'll be an amendment to, uh, requesting the Rules Committee to make it an order for federal employees, the members of the House, not included, to exempt that. It seems fair to me that we shouldn't penalize a certain group and make favoritism to the other. Yeah, I, I guess my, my response on that would be that there, there are going to be a whole lot of groups that are going to complain about what we do between now and May. The civil service retirement system is not sound. It has to be made sound. It is not sound. But let me suggest to you that when we change agriculture subsidies, that's going to get people upset. When we change the interest subs in school interest subsidy, it's going to get people upset. When we do any variety, everything, every program we touch, the Appalachian Regional Commission, if we were to move to eliminate it, that's going to get people upset. No matter what we do, people are going to be upset. And what I would maintain is uh, if we if we start exempting people from this, then we will fail. We just have to make sure that the federal employees aren't going to give more than other groups. And I think at the end of the day, we're going to find out that they won't be. I that agree, but that provision is not in the contract with America. Well, there's one provision in the contract. We will pay for our tax cuts. But that is not what you just said. You said that that was to go to pay for civil service retirement. No, I'm saying that with a system that, that now subsidizes that system, taxpayers subsidize that system, it's appropriate to have those that get this subsidy to pay some more to maintain their own retirement. I thank the chairman. I have but, the, but the gentleman's point is, is well taken. It's not a, it's not, this is not all pleasant. I mean, it just isn't. But I will tell you that uh, if, you, if you drop the tax provisions in this bill, you're still going to end up having to do this kind of a thing in May anyway. I mean, we are, everybody in this, everybody who is part of this government is going to have to give. You know why? So that at the end of the day, at the end of the day, as Alan Greenspan says, at the end of the day, we will have a more prosperous country. That's what it's all about. Well, I'm for the contract with America. I just don't like to see gotcha. the provision added. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. John, thank you very, very much, and uh, any help we can be Thanks to you, for your just call patience us anytime. And Appreciate thank it. You Keep very up the much. good work. Uh, we are going to rise in a few minutes, but I don't see Mr. Archer here yet, uh, so we'll take Mr. Sabo and uh, Martin. Feel free, uh, free to uh, summarize. Your entire uh, statement will appear in the record and uh, take whatever time you need. Yeah, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, the opportunity to appear before the Rules Committee again. My understanding uh, is that the bill that will come to the floor combines several bills, not only the bill that came out of Budget Committee, but uh, those coming from other committees. I oppose the package uh, for two reasons. First, I have grave concerns about the substantive impacts of these proposals, particularly as they affect the budget. And second, I don't think we should be doing any of these things without an overall budget plan in place. The Budget Committee uh, bill lowers the caps of discretionary spending by $100 billion, which is misplaced, priority spend misplaced priorities. Discretionary spending has already been substantially cut over the past five years and is not the cause of our deficit problem. When the entitlement cuts are added to the cap reduction, this package saves roughly $125 billion. Yet not one penny of these savings goes to reduce the deficit. Instead, they're all devoted to paying for tax reductions, over half of which goes to the wealthiest in our society. You just had significant discussion about deficit reduction. What we're dealing with here is not a deficit reduction package. As a matter of fact, under this package, the deficit will be $11 billion higher in the year 2000 than it would be if we did simply nothing. Let me repeat that again, Mr. Chairman. Under this package, the deficit will be $11 billion higher in the year 2000 than it would be if we simply did nothing. It also reduces funding for the Medicare Hospitalization Fund. This is absolutely ba backwards. Our first priority should be bringing the deficit down. When the Budget Committee held hearings around the country this year, uh, with substantial number of citizens uh, attending, they were asked the question, should budget cuts go for deficit reduction or paying for a tax cut? Overwhelmingly, the public would say it should go for deficit cut, uh, deficit reduction not tax cuts. Uh, I have not arranged the people to appear before the Budget Committee this year, but virtually every person who has appeared, economists cho chosen by the majority, not by the minority, have also said any budget cuts should go for deficit reduction first, not tax cuts first. We're also following a very unusual process. We would have been so much better off if the Budget Committee had followed the normal procedure and reported a budget resolution. Budget Act requires Congress complete conference action and budget resolution by April 15th. In each of the past three years, the House has passed its resolution by mid-March. This year, however, Budget Committee will not start until May. The budget resolution is supposed to provide an overall plan before Congress starts acting on the individual pieces. Action on a resolution would allow a public open debate about the size of the tax cut that is feasible. It would also allow an open public debate about spending priorities and where spending cuts should be made. This year, the House is taking up major tax and spending legislation before it has a budget plan in place. The process has been both secretive and chaotic sort of a stealthy reconciliation bill. And two weeks before the deadline for the final action on a budget, we still have no idea how the majority intends to fulfill its promise to, the bal to balance the budget by the year 2002. Legislating in this manner results in many violations of the Congressional Budget Act. <coughs> The tax cut bill before you contains at least two serious violations. By reducing revenues below the floor in the latest budget resolution, the measure violates Section 311A of the Budget Act.
by reducing revenues in a year for which a budget resolution has been not has not been adopted. It violates Section 303A of the Act. Neither of these violations is cured by packaging the tax cuts with the spending reductions. Both violations could have been avoided. However, if a budget resolution had been adopted before action was taken on the tax cut bill. Under these circumstances, waiver of the Budget Act is completely unjustified. I urge you not to grant any waivers or allow the Budget Act to be circumvented by other means. Mr. Chairman, as it relates to the substance of the bill, <coughs> I must say that I also find it in a very amazing bill. We are told that this Congress is about renewing American civilization. I find this bill not representing the best values of American civilization. I think it represents some of the worst values of American civilization. It is a bill that is truly historic. I know of no other time in history when the most vulnerable in our society, the weakest and most poor, have asked, been asked to make significant sacrifice so that we could pass a tax cut that primarily benefits the most affluent in our society. I think it's historic, but very negative. Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm happy to respond to any questions. Well, Mr. Sabo, and uh, I'll call you Marty because you're a friend, and I have great respect for you. But I really have to take exception to your, your kind of testimony. I, I just read here uh, where you say our first priority should be bringing the deficit down. Now, when you were chairman of the, of the Budget Committee, this is the last budget that you brought before the Congress. This was the President's budget. And look at these deficits annually, totaling over $900 billion. Now, what is compassionate about that? Mr. Chairman? Just a minute. Will okay. you don't inter Wait a minute. Yep. Don't interrupt no, me. I didn't interrupt okay. you. Excuse me. Okay. You know how uh, I'm like Judge Smith. You know, I like to have a little give and take. But there is nothing compassionate about this. And look at the President's budget this year. <coughs> Another $900 billion. You know, to come here and then say that our first priority ought to be balancing the, or to, to dealing with these deficits, when you have never done it, is just, uh, uh, well, it's just almost more than, uh, than many of us can take. But I would go back and just question uh, uh, some of your, your testimony where you say that the uh, deficit will be $11 billion higher in the year 2000 than it would be if we simply did nothing. Now, uh, according to uh, my conversations with the Congressional Budget Office, uh, and with others, if we did nothing, it would be we would we would at least add 30 billion dollars to uh, to deficit reduction. Uh, if uh, if we compared it to last year's spending, it would actually reduce the deficit by 90 billion. Now, having said that, that's not enough. In other words, we need to take stronger action than that. So I I do uh, sympathize with with some of your testimony in that in that we're not really doing the job. And I am going to be so anxious to see what is going to happen. John Kasich said that uh, there is time because once we pass this tax package and then it goes over to the Senate, there's going to be several months before any action uh, is taken before we resolve this issue. And by golly, this Congress had better come with a reconciliation bill or with a pure spending cut bill that is going to reduce these deficits down to something way beyond what this is, or this member of Congress is not going to vote for the conference report on the final passage of this bill, because this Congress had better be responsible. Uh, I just had to say that, but I'll okay, be glad let to yield me, my if, friend. May I respond, Mr. Chairman? Sure, you certainly you may. Um, it may re um, let me respond twofold. First, as it relates to this bill. Uh, the chairman of our committee is accurate when he says the bill is paid the bill is paid for over a five-year period of time. Right. But the cash flow of how it's paid for increases the deficit in the year 2000 by $11 billion. That's by CBO scoring. If we were to move beyond that to projecting its impact in the deficit in years 2001 and 2002, it would add even more to the deficit. And the reason for that is uh, that the 
costs of the tax bill escalates very rapidly by year five, six, seven through year 10. So your cash flow under this bill complicates your problem by the year 2000. It does not make it simpler. As it relates to our history of 1993, we passed a deficit reduction package of $500 billion. It was real. It passed. It reduced the deficit. Actually, it reduced the deficit by more than $500 billion. Uh, it was one of the few times uh, where we underestimated. Uh, the actual deficits came in lower than what we were projecting in 1993. In answer Mr. Linder's question, the spending cuts in that bill are happening pursuant to the 1993 uh, uh, Budget Act. The caps are there, changes in, the, in, uh, in entitlement programs are occurring on schedule by what we did in 1993. They were not dependent on further action than 94 or 95. Well, Martin, I've looked all over for those spending cuts, and I just cannot find them. All I know is that we, we voted for the, uh, I didn't vote for it, but uh, the Congress voted for the largest tax increase in history, and yet the deficits grew. I, and I that might, is wrong. Mr. Chairman, I might add with interest that I, the biggest part of our revenue increases were increasing the rates for the most affluent in this country. Mm -hmm. I note with interest that your tax bill does not repeal them. Our tax bill doesn't repeal them. Yes, we do. No, you don't. Oh, yes, we do. Uh, as a matter of fact, the uh, the uh, the increased taxes on uh, Social Security recipients is repealed in this legislation. Uh, that one little part. Well, you want which, more? Which reduces, we'll give you more. <laughs> which reduces the funding to the Medi to the Medicare uh, trust fund. That is a, a repeal, uh, which complicates the problem Mr. Kasich was talking about about the long-term funding of Medicare. I note with interest that our increase in the rates for the highest and most affluent in this country, are, that you complain the most vociferously about 1993 is not repealed in this bill. Um, I'll say to my good friend Mr. Sabo, we are going to bring a bill on this floor that is going to reduce this deficit by $800 billion, and I want you to vote for every nickel of it. I am. Mr. Quilla. Uh, I won't prolong the hearing because we have Mr. Archer here, Chairman of the Ways and Means Committee. That your statement about what this bill does, did you say that as a partisan or as an American? Certainly as a member of Congress. Now I say it as an American and as a member of Congress. Not as a partisan? No. Would you repeat what you said and let me analyze if that turns out that way? <coughs> the bill that's before us today Does what? increases the deficit no, no, by... you said something about something else that I thought was... About what, what I, my political judgment on this bill or my... No, your my, judgment, you didn't say political. No, okay, my... my well, it's political judgment, it's, uh, I suppose, uh, uh, social judgment of this bill, that it, it is, is, is historic. I have never seen a bill like this, which asks the most vulnerable in our society to pay so much, to pay for a tax cut that is aimed primarily at the most affluent in our society. No, you didn't say that. Well, I said something like that. <laughs> Keep working on me. <laughs> uh, being a non-American of the greatest thing that ever happened against civilization. Oh, no, no. Yeah, yeah. What I said is uh, we are told that uh, uh, this session is about renewing American civilization. I think that's the speaker's yeah, book, isn't it? what did you say? I thought that this bill represented the, the worst of American values rather than the best of American values. Would you say that as a partisan? No, I would say that as a historian. Yeah. Well, well, I noticed you. Well, Jimmy's that, wrong anyway. I noticed you kindly forgot what you said. But I said lots of things. A, and they're all accurate, a, Mr. Quilla. Thank, thank but as a historian and as, a, uh, as someone who, who's observed the middle, American political scene and also studied it, uh, this is a pretty bad one. 
Thank you. Mr. Bielensen, did you understand what he said? <coughs> I understand what okay. Mr. Sebel says, and I basically agree with him. Thank you. I have oh, no questions think... of the gentleman. Glad Mr. he's Linder. here. Judge Price. I pass, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Are there any further questions of the witness? Well, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Guinness. along with uh, Mr. Quinlan's remarks, uh, I have great respect for the gentleman, but uh, it is my opinion that the remarks are driven much more by partisan politics, politics rather than historic uh, views. Mrs. Walholtz? I'd simply point out, Mr. Chairman, that, that this bill does not roll back the earned income tax credit either, which does the most for the working poor and that that remains intact in this bill. And what we're trying to do is to get some help to families and seniors who saw their taxes go up in the Clinton tax increase. So when we're talking about those who need the most help, let's not forget what we're leaving in place. Mr. Uh, Sabo, we appreciate your coming before us and uh, we part I, friends even though we uh, disagree. I thank the gentleman. You're always courteous to appear in front of him. Thank you for coming. The, uh, we're going to recess this hearing just briefly in order to uh, uh, report a rule on the, uh, the uh, self-employment uh, health deduction conference report. If uh, Mr. Archer could come back to the table along with Mr. Uh, Gibbons. And uh, you gentlemen are here to testify on the uh, conference report uh, that was just uh, reported, I take it? Mr. Solomon? Yes. Uh, may I go ahead, Mr. Gibbons, uh, as well, on this? well, if Mr. Archer has no, no, uh, no objection, come that. forward. I don't know if I'll say anything. But, uh, okay. I, I also, I mean, well, why don't we all come on up? All right, yeah, that'll yeah. be fine. Yeah, everybody gather <laughs> around here. <laughs> Make it a cozy affair. We're going to have a revival. Here. I think, I think the ratio of the numbers is about right now. Uh, we can handle them, Bill. The ratios are not only right, yes. but the Democrats are still at a disadvantage. <laughs> Mr. Archer, you have the floor, sir. Mr. Chairman, thank you for letting me come back twice in one day. Um, yeah. Turn to uh, you, you people are in the Rules Committee are advanced with these space, space age mics, uh, uh, well ahead of all the rest of us. Um, we were able to complete last night the conference committee uh, report on H.R. 31. And I believe it's an excellent conference report. When it came out of the House, we retroactively um, renewed the tax deductibility for health insurance for the self-employed at 25 percent, which, had, as you know, it expired last year on January the 1st. Right. So retroactively now, we've got that in place. And in addition, we've been able to increase the deductibility for the self-employed to 30 percent prospectively. So I think this is a very, very good bill. Uh, in, in doing so, uh, we filed the conference report uh, this afternoon, and we need to move rapidly on this bill so that uh, Americans who wish to take this deduction for their health insurance for last, last year will be able to do so before the eight, April 15th deadline. Uh, and we would like for you to give us a rule that will put it on the floor tomorrow so that we com can complete the uh, House work on this conference report. Um, we also respectively, respectfully request that you provide a rule waiving points of order uh, and against, against the conference report and against its uh, consideration that the co conference report be considered as read. In particular, I request that you waive the three-day layover requirement for consideration of the conference report and waive the rule regarding scope. This is needed because the conference report includes a matter involving the extension of the current tax treatment of certain group health plans that was not originally in the bill. Uh, this was agreed to last night in the conference, uh, primarily at the request of representatives from your state, Mr. Chairman, the state of, of New York. Uh, I also request that you provide for one hour of floor debate equally divided. While the bill is deficit neutral over the five-year period, there are technical points of order to the Budget Act that I also request be waived. And Mr. Chairman, that's about it. Uh, and thank you for listening once again to me today. Before I hear from uh, Mr. Gibbons, 
do I understand that by, by extending uh, the, uh, the time that it, excuse me, uh, I understand that by extending the time, it is totally retroactive. It never has expired then. Is that what you're saying? That's the effect of it, right. yes. Well, that's more than fair to, uh, to the self-employed in this nation. Many of them are, are uh, struggling today, and uh, uh, that certainly will be a help to them. Not only that, Mr. Chairman, but in the past, over and over again, we have provided this and then let it sunset. Right. so that we had to get back into it again and it left uh, people hanging out there without a degree of certainty now we have been able to do this permanently in the law and we won't have to revisit this i hope that in the in the near future we can up that percentage above 30 percent well it certainly uh, it certainly should be but i commend you for what you've done mr gibbons well thank you and i want to preface my remarks with this kind of statement because what I say is a little explosive, and I want to certainly say that I have known Mr. Archer for as long as he's been in Congress, and I have served with him on the Ways and Means Committee longer than any other human being has served with him on the Ways and Means Committee. <laughs> and in the difficult time that uh, the Democrats and the Ways and Means Committee have been going through, Mr. Archer has been very fair with us. He's been a good chairman, and he is an honest man. But if there ever was a conference report that needs to lay over, this is one. And let me outline exactly why this is one, and it goes to the integrity of the whole process. Last night on the floor, when we were debating my motion to instruct conferees, one of the debaters on the Republican side said, well, you know, we could, we, we could drop the language that the Senate has put in there and we could come back and uh, using the same effective date, I think the debater said that, that's in the Senate bill, we could, we, we could, we could do it all and, and no, 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 nobody would be able to jump through the window that is created in all of this. But when we took up the conference last night, and I didn't sign the conference report, I disagreed with it and I expressed my reason and my reason was similar to what I'm expressing now. That effective date had moved from February the 5th, 1994 to March the 15th, 1994. 95, excuse me. The figures should be 95. From February the 5th, 1995 to March the 15th, 1995. Now, in tax bills, effective dates are very, very important. And this is important, and I know it's important because my instincts tell me it's, it's important. My staff, my Ways and Means staff, reports to me that there has been an unusual number of telephone calls wondering about exactly the effective date of all of this. I don't know why. All that it takes to not pay any more taxes in the United States is to sign a little quit slip that you file with the State Department down there. Now, we don't know who's filed quit slips between February the 5th, 1995 and March the 15th, 1995, but we're going to get that information somehow. Uh, I hope it's public information. It ought to be public. It ought, if we don't, we'll have to try the Freedom of Information route to get that information as to who's filed those quit slips. But there are a number of very well-paid lobbyists moving around this Capitol Hill right now uh, who are very interested in this effective date. Now, this committee, as traffic cop for the House, I hate to use that word, but you all control the flow of it. You should not force this bill onto the House floor until we've had a chance to find out what happened last night. <coughs> An hour elapsed between the time we debated this on the floor and about the time we took up this in conference last night, and in that time, the effective date of this slipped some 40 days. Now, I have no information other than my suspicion somebody got out and 
there's a lot of taxes involved in it. And before we move ahead on this, we ought to be able to either go back and rectify that date and move it back to the debate we talked about on the floor of March the 15th, which was the time that was it, excuse me, February the 5th, which was the time that was in the Senate amendment. We ought, to, we, ought, we, ought to, we ought to be able to get to the bottom of this thing and either go back to that date or find out that no damage was done. But with the lobbying interest that there is in that effective date expressed in phone calls to my staff, there's something there, Mr. Chairman. And I think it's up to the Rules Committee to protect the integrity of this body and of all the members in this body until we get that matter straightened out. Now, I'm going to be in Florida tomorrow with the president. He's coming to my district, and so I won't be here. And I'll have to designate one of the members of the Democratic side to, to make a motion, if you all don't hold this up, uh, to recommit the bill to conference in which we will debate on the floor what I've said here now, and perhaps we'll have some more information tomorrow. But I don't know. I'm not familiar with the process with which the names of those who have renounced their citizenship so that they will not have to pay taxes. I don't know how difficult it is to get hold of those names. They ought to be public information. Perhaps they are public information. It's just that I don't know, Mr. Chairman. We'll, I have instructed my Ways and Means staff to ask the State Department, point blank right now, can we have those names? And then to go to the IRS and run them against their tax returns and see whether or not uh, there's any big ones in there. Uh, if, if, if there's some big ones in there, the Congress ought to know that before they vote. That's the rule. That's the role of the Rules Committee, as I've always understand it, is to make sure that the integrity of this body is protected over, uh, over rush to get something done. I, I think that's. I think I said it enough. Who? Uh, I, I thought that uh, Mr. Rangel signed this. Uh, he did. This conference report. He did. Hmm. I didn't. Sam, were you the only one that didn't sign it? I don't know. I know I didn't sign it. Mr. Archer, would, uh, Mr. Rangel did sign it. Uh, were yes. there others that, uh, that, was there anyone else besides Sam that didn't sign the report? Uh, not to my knowledge. No. I'm not sure about the Senate. The chairman. But, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, I, I, you've got to be confused. By, I am by what, by what Mr. Gibbons just said to you, because it, it, it leaves up in the air as to just what he's talking about. Number one, there was no effective date in the House bill on the proposal relative to expatriates, the exit fee, because it wasn't in the House bill. So there could be no effective date for that. There is no effective date in the conference report because it isn't in the conference report. It was dropped out. Uh, the Senate receded. So I, I, I don't know what he's talking about. Maybe I, it, it's very, it, it, it's very unusual to me. There was some discussion about the fact that we would have a study of this issue so that we could look more intensely at it and in more detail at it in a more considered way later this year. And that provision is in the conference report that uh, the Joint Committee would study this issue and would then give us a report on it. There was some thought that if we did come back and do something, that maybe we ought to put some date in there so that we could refer back to that date. Um, but that was a protection, not a loophole. Uh, the original House offer that was prepared was not to have any date in it, that we would merely consider this and look at it later on after the study came back to us. Uh, and then there was some thought that maybe there ought to be some date put in there. But, but he is acting like there is some cover-up or something that's involved in this, which is, is far from the truth. And, and I am told now that in the conference report uh, that there is no date. Even though there was a discussion, at least informally, about, well, should there be some date that we would refer back to in the event that we decided to do something later? 
But the way that, that Mr. Gibbons has presented this is if we had decided to do something in there and had put a date in there that was going to let somebody off the hook, and I, obviously that's not true because this provision was dropped from the conference report. Well, I'll just say to the gentleman, I don't think I've had any more phone calls on any subject since well, I've been in this Congress for 16 years. But, you know, they're waiting to, to, to file their income taxes. There are problems out there, and these small businessmen need to know about this, and we need to do it, in my opinion, as soon as we can. I don't see any problem with it. But, uh, but, well, but the implication from the gentleman from Florida is that I or members of my staff have been contacted by somebody who wants <laughs> to uh, uh, crawl through some loophole, and I can guarantee you that I've been contacted by no one, nor has a member of my staff been contacted by anyone, because there really wasn't anything to contact me. Well, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, uh, I, I don't, don't want to get in a personal well, contest with Mr. Archer. And I said at the beginning here, I have known him since he came to Congress. I have served with him on the Ways and Means Committee all these years. I think he is an honorable man. I know that he would not have anything to do with it. But the facts are this. The Senate language had an effective date in it of February the 5th, 1995. The date that was set in all of the, and that was a date we talked about on the floor during the debate last night. But an hour later, the date suddenly is moved to, to March the 15th. Now, you know, uh, there's some, you know, there's something there. Mr. Chairman, may I uh, speak on this? Mr. Matsui. Thank you. I think Mr. Gibbons is, is correct. And, and this, this committee, the Rules Committee, is a committee that has to protect the membership on the floor of the House. And it's my hope that the Rules Committee will protect the membership on the floor of the House because a vote on this one could be embarrassing if, in fact, what Mr. Gibbons is suggesting is true. And, and Mr. Gibbons is correct on the recitation of the numbers because when the Senate passed this legislation, uh, they stated, and this is in their legislation, this is in the law, the effective date uh, shall be February 6, 1995. That's in the legislation. This is the uh, expatriates issue. This is a matter that will cost the taxpayers, unless it's solved, $3.6 billion over the next 10 years, $1.4 billion over the next five years, and this will affect anywhere from 12 to 20 to 25 taxpayers a year. So we're talking about a lot of money per taxpayer. I received a number of telephone calls as well from lobbyists representing whomever they represent. They wouldn't tell me who they represent, from New York, Washington, and elsewhere. But the effective date on the repatriates, uh, expatriates legislation in the Senate was February 6. Mrs. Johnson last night testified on the floor when she suggested we delay this matter for reasons that she said we need to look at it. She said we should retain the date and therefore have the same effective uh, effect in a month or two if we bring this back, uh, when we bring it back out of conference or bring it back out of a, a, another piece of legislation. She said we should keep that date. Last night, uh, it did say the chairman of both the Ways and Means Committee and the fin Senate Finance Committee realizes that uh, we need to look at this issue. And it states in the last sentence, any change ultimately adopted may have the effective date as the date of the original Senate Finance Committee action, which was March 15th. So why not go back to the date of February 6th rather than March 15th? I mean, after all, on the Viacom issue, which all of us are very aware of, we decided to make that date January 17th, which I strongly support because we want to catch Viacom, because Viacom will either walk away with uh, anywhere from $440 million to $640 million if we change that effective date because about three days after January 17th, uh, they completed the deal. So if we're going to hold Viacom to these standards, why shouldn't we hold the issue of expatriation to these same standards? And, and again, if, as Mr. Gibbons says, if there are some people that have renounced their citizenship and could cost the federal government millions and millions of dollars, this will be embarrassment to the members on the floor of the House unless we know for sure whether from from that February 6th date to the March 15th date, there was no such action taken and uh, there was no dollars involved in here. We ought to know that before we vote on this bill. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Archer. I, I really, I have the same concern that we've got to protect the integrity of whatever we 
do so that people don't slip through. But, but I, I would simply ask my colleagues, uh, because I, I think they want to be accurate, and they're not being accurate. Um, I'd like for them to show me in the conference report, because I have the conference report right in front of me. I'm not talking about what you, that's not the conference report, Bob. Um, I want you to show me in the conference agreement where there is a date other than February the 6th, 1995. That is not the conference report. Why, why do we use this then? I have no idea. Your staff uh, obviously gave that to you. It's not the conference report. I have the conference report right here in front of me. I'd like for you to show me where that date is in there. What is, what is this? That was a draft of a possible this offer. Is a possible offer. That was a draft of a possible offer. We're talking about a conference no. report now, and you gentlemen want to be accurate. You're not being accurate. Well, let me ask you, what is the effective date? Is there is none. It was dropped. The provision was dropped in conference. There is no effective date on a dropped provision. That's what I tried to explain earlier on. If if there, uh, well. I am, I am perfectly pleased in a colloquy on the floor to say that if we do anything, with this totally speculative, if we do something on this issue, uh, that people are alerted and on notice that it can be effective February the 6th. Well, Chairman, but, you, but you're, 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 you're making a big deal out of something that isn't even in the conference report, and you're reading from something that isn't in the conference I, report. I apologize. Well, I think I think an apology is is uh, is in order because uh, you know that 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 was really misleading, not, not, not unintentionally, I'm sure, Bob, because you're a very honorable person. Uh, but let me just say this: I hope that just one minute. I hope you uh, you might have this colloquy on the floor. But I'm going to tell you one thing right now: the farmers that I represent want to, in other words, they operate all year long and they need their refund coming back. They need to file their income taxes. They need to do it now. And I, well, I don't want this thing delayed. I want you to settle it on the floor. But we've had just about enough discussion on it here. Yeah. Mr. I, I yield just, to my good friend, Mr. Linder. I, I just wanted to ask Chairman Archer, does this conference report in any way deal with expatriates? No. Other than to order a study of this issue and for the Joint Committee to report back to us what the results of their study are. So the question of an effective date in here is a moot point right That's now. That's what I point I tried to make at the yeah. very beginning. I couldn't understand, well, and I'm sure you were confused yeah. by the gentleman from Florida's uh, initial comments, talking about an effective date that never survived the conference committee. Uh, an effective date for a matter that wasn't dealt with in the conference exactly. committee. Exactly. That Thank was you. dropped. All right, we have to move on here. Mr. Moakley. How are you, Mr. Sullivan? Very good to see you back. I've been lonesome here most of the afternoon. Well, I'll send you a tape. I was going to put an amendment in that would strike uh, <coughs> that would uh, strike the waiver of the layoffs. But I, after listening to the, the colloquy, I have to agree with my chairman. I, I don't think it's necessary. Uh, Mr. Uh, Quillen of Tennessee. I'm glad we, I'm glad we uh, cleared the matter up and we listened to the colloquy there a long time under a misunderstanding. And I think that's not fair to we members who've been sitting here since 10 o'clock this morning. <laughs> well, I think we got it cleared up right here. The effective, well, the effective date will be February the 15th. Well, the effective date will be February the 15th. If that's February the 6th. 6th. February the 6th, excuse me. Okay. There, were the six. There, there really cannot be an effective date. It will merely be noticed that if we do something, uh, that it can go back to February the 6th. That's, uh, that's good enough for me. Mr. Uh, Mr. Goss. I'm, I'm sorry I missed the colloquy, apparently. I uh, appreciate what you're trying to move here, and I hope we can get on with it. Thank you for coming forward, and I, I'm sorry about the misunderstanding. I'm sure it was unintentional. Mr. Bielenson. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Just a quick question, if I may, if it's relevant as to, as to why the expatriate provision was not included in the, um, in the conference report. I mean, it sounded like it was a useful thing and a reasonable thing to do, and I'm just kind of sorry myself that 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 Senate version of the expatriate uh, tax was not uh, was not included in the conference report. So was there some reason why it wasn't? I mean, can you just because give us the, the reason? Because the Senate decided to receive. Was is it not? Is it, it wasn't in our bill. 
I understand. I'm just curious. I'm just asking. I mean, That's it's, all. It's, a, it's a simple conference occurrence that one side recedes and provisions are dropped from their bill. So, so it was they, although that was in their bill, who receded from it. They had to. Yeah. I think the gentleman understands the procedures for conference committees. Mr. Bielinski, I think you ought to understand too that we Democrats tried to put this in the bill when it was in committee, but we got outvoted yes. by every single Republican <coughs> on the committee. I know. Well, let, let me clarify that. The, it, the provision in the Senate bill was different than the one that was offered in the Ways and Means Committee, but there was a, a provision offered by the Democrats in the Ways and Means Committee uh, that had some resemblance to what the Senate did. And why was that not accepted by you folks? Do you remember? Because our committee voted against it. I'm just curious as to the, the rationale Senate, for it. That's Senate, all. It just sounds so sensible on the face the Senate, of that bill. The Senate provision actually was more discriminatory than the provision that was offered in our committee. Well, could we? Uh, not really. No. I mean, you know. I mean, it'll be done in the next four or five minutes. We don't have to. It'll be voted on tomorrow. I would worry. just remind the gentleman we still are, have to go back to the hearing. Well, I understand. It's going to last for several more hours. I understand. I'm just trying to seek an okay. answer to a question. Just trying to be accommodating to the Thank members. You. I thank the gentleman. I don't think we're going to get much more of an answer. Mr. Uh, McGinnis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, when Mr. Gibbons first spoke, uh, he got my attention, first of all, by saying that the information that he has is explosive. Then he proceeds to say that uh, never in his period of time or something that there's ever been a reason for this committee to hold a bill to protect this uh, committee and to protect the integrity of the House. We need to look at this situation. Then they go on, in my opinion, to implicate the integrity of Mr. Archer, or certainly the staff of Mr. Archer. Then they go from that point, Mr. Matsui pulls out data that now we discover is erroneous, in fact, supplied by staff. But, but unintentional, I'm sure. I'm, I'm well, and, and, I do apologize. And, and, and I'm getting to that point. Mr. Chair, I understand that. That's now unintentional. But the implications that came from that appalled me. I mean, I'm sitting here thinking, Mr. Archer, what has occurred? What, what, what did you do? And then at the end, Mr. Matsui, uh, as he should have, apologized to the committee. Although I think that apology should be extended to Mr. Archer and his staff. But I would say this, that if it, if it would have been us in reverse, we would have, would have got really baptized for using erroneous information and making those kind of implications. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mrs. Waldholz. Mr. Chairman. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see you come in, Martin. Mr. Frost of Texas. Uh, Mr. Archie, you may have already uh, testified uh, to this. But what was the, why did the Senate put this in in the first place? What was the impetus? Was there a, uh, was there a, a newspaper story about this? Did someone complain? This didn't just drop in out of the blue. I, I have no idea. It didn't drop in out of the blue. It was in the President's budget. It was in the President's budget proposal. But I, I must say that um, the Treasury, when we had hearings finally this week in the subcommittee of the Ways and Means Committee, uh, was unable to respond to innumerable questions. It obviously was not well thought out. Yeah. Uh, they did not have answers to incisive questions as to the implementation of it. And it gave very good reason to our subcommittee chairman to feel that it was particularly inappropriate to move forward with it with such haste uh, at this time. So this originated with the administration, yes. this particular proposal. Um, and I can't answer as to why the Senate put it in there. I, I really don't know. Mm -hmm. Well, if in fact it would yield $3.6 billion over five years. No, uh, it's not that much. It's like $1.4 billion over five years. So that information is, is not accurate. That's correct. Mm -hmm. um, if it yields over a billion dollars, though, that's a substantial amount of money, which yes, would be useful for deficit reduction or for tax reduction or for whatever purposes uh, we could put it to. If it's an appropriate policy, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, let me just ask, uh, how soon will this study be conducted? Any idea? They've got a report back in June. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Assuming that they do report back and meet that deadline, uh, would you anticipate uh, action shortly thereafter by your committee one way or the other? I think we'd have to look at the report and the study before I can answer that. Mm -hmm. so, so you don't know what the timetable would be? No. Okay. Thank you. 
Um, well, I think that, uh, yeah, that ends the, uh, the hearing. We appreciate you gentlemen coming before. We still hold you all in high regard. Believe me. <laughs> Thank, Thank you for you, coming. Mr. Chairman. Some higher than others. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the chair will be in receipt of a motion. Chairman, I do have a motion. Chairman, I move the committee grant a rule waiving all points of order against the Congress report to the Congress of Bill H.R. 831. Excuse me, Jim, turn on your mic and start over again. Chairman, I do have a motion. Chairman, I move the committee grant a rule waiving all points of order against the conference report to the accompanying the bill, H.R. 831, permanently extending the health insurance deductibility for self-employed and against its consideration. The rule also provides for dispensing with the reading of the conference report. You heard the uh, motion by the gentleman from Tennessee. Is there any uh, discussion? If there is no discussion, uh, all those in favor of the uh, uh, reporting this rule will say aye. 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 All opposed will say nay. <coughs> that the records show that there were no nays and the uh, rule is reported. And Mr. Quillen will carry for the majority and Mr. Uh, uh, Mokley will carry for the minority. And now we will uh, resolve ourselves back into the hearing on the, um, what were we having the hearing on, gentlemen? <laughs> I can't remember anymore. The, uh, uh, the tax bill. <laughs> and uh, we'll apologize to the next uh, witness, Mr. Allard. Uh, you've been very patient to put up with that, uh, that recess. Make sure your microphone is on and uh, feel free to summarize and uh, your entire statement will be submitted for the record without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Allard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. It's been a most interesting afternoon while I've sat here. But uh, I just want to thank you for giving me an opportunity to present a case uh, to you involving uh, the capital gains tax. Uh, admittedly, uh, this is more of a technical concern than anything, but could have some uh, implications as far as the way we treat agriculture when we get to capital gains. Uh, in 19. 86, the Congress enacted a provision that said that if we had any uh, land that was um, considered uh, highly erodible lands, which in some parts of the West is a, a large number, a large amount of property, uh, or we have uh, lands classified as wetlands, and then they plant a crop on it, that they have to take ordinary income. Now that hasn't been a problem in the past because the level of ordinary income and the level of capital gains has been. Uh, nearly the same. Uh, if we pass a provision that reduces the capital gains tax, I predict that this will be a, a more serious issue. And that's the reason for my uh, amendment that I'm bringing forward. And um, I just uh, think that with our serious uh, review of the farm programs, and we know we're not going to have enough dollars, it doesn't appear like we're going to have enough, enough dollars for the Conservation Reserve Program, where we've got a lot of highly erodible land we're not growing crops now and we've got some wetlands that are in the same program, this could create a problem. So I did want to have an opportunity to bring this to the committee. I understand that, that there may not be a willingness to, uh, to, to bring these kind of amendments to the floor, but if there's any opportunity at all for me. One of the very valuable members of this, uh, this body, and we appreciate that you're bringing this to our attention. Has this been uh, dealt with in the past uh, in committee, do you know? Uh, when it was brought to my attention, the members' uh, opportunity to testify before Ways and Committee had passed, uh, our staff had talked with the staff on Ways and Means. We were hoping that perhaps maybe it might come out in the final version, uh, but it didn't. I have contacted members of the Senate side, and perhaps maybe some action can be taken over there. Uh, so that's where it stands at this particular point. There's one point, there's one little change. Do you have a briefing paper? that was handed out to you on this particular amendment by any chance. Uh, if you will look to the last line uh, on that little briefing paper, uh, there's, uh, they put before March 1, 1986, and it should be after March 1, 1986, and that's a very after, important. After March 1? Yeah, it should be after March 1. That's a very important change. Right. And uh, I, uh, it was an error that had been, that I picked up on the way over here. Yeah. Wanted to but call your amendment is attention. in correct form, though. Yes, I have it here before me. Right. And, and we have uh, it, it, the, the amendment's okay. It's just the explanation. And so I wanted to make sure that there was uh, no misunderstanding. Well, Wayne, thank you again. Uh, any questions of the witness? Turn off that microphone. Uh, any questions of the witness? Where'd, all, where'd they all go here? 
Okay. Uh, Wayne, we, we appreciate you coming for us. And thank you very thank much. Thank you for your attention. Okay. Thank you. The uh, committee will stand in brief recess, and if the members uh, aren't here, we'll adjourn this hearing shortly. Excuse me? Bass, good. Well, we'll wait for it. C-SPAN's online guide to government is available on your personal computer through America Online. It includes photos and biographies of members of Congress, information about how the House and Senate work, and congressional schedules. America Online subscribers use the keyword C-SPAN. Joining us on our next Washington Journal, Senators Tad Cochran of Mississippi and David Pryor of Arkansas. They'll discuss events on Capitol Hill, including tax cuts, term limits,